Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of International E Conference on recent trends in drug discovery, diagnostics, and therapeutics. A special emphasis on COVID-19. The E International E Conference is organized by Vignans Foundation of Science and Technology Research Department of Biotechnology in association with LLB School, Kanna State University, and Alquits University, and in association with Andhra Pradesh Academy of Sciences. So. Uh, today we have a excellent lineup of speakers and topics which are very interesting so before we move on to the session so we have a few instructions which needs to be followed by the participants in webex as well as in youtube so for cisco webex participants kindly mute your microphone as well as your video in off uh, turn off your videos so that there won't be any disturbances for the speaker and the presenter and kindly post your questions in the chat box option your questions will be addressed at the end of the talk by the presenter for youtube viewers kindly post your comments or questions in the comment section for the presenter so now uh, i invite dr divya shri to introduce our first speaker dr girinath pillai um hello everyone i am dr divya shri nageshwaran uh, part of llb school I am here to introduce Dr. Uh, Girinath Pillai. Uh, Dr. Pillai is the director and founder of Zastra Innovations Bengaluru and a visiting scientist at Nairo Research India and formerly a, a Marie Curie Research Fellow at Malcode Limited, Estonia. He carried out his PhD at University of Florida with Professor Katritsky and Professor Carlson. Uni from the University of Tartu he holds 40 research papers in peer reviewed international journals one us patent and co-authored a book chapter on mosquito repellents his expertise is in the area of computational medicinal chemistry mechanistic driven drug discovery and molecular modeling currently he has a phd student working in the area of aging and antiviral studies Apart from scientific positions, he is also a mentor at IIT uh, Triple IIT Kottayam, Government of India's Niti Aayog's ATL schools, and research advisor to VIT Vellore. So here uh, we welcome Dr. Girinath Pillai to deliver his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Devishri. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Um, just a minute. Could you please confirm that you can see my first slide? Yes, sir. It's oh, starting great. to share. Great. Uh, so, good morning, all. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the uh, invitation, and uh, I'm happy uh, to share my thoughts here. And I also uh, 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 happy to see Dr. Kripanathi sir here. I'm uh, being associated with him since 2008 uh, when he was with uh, Satya Sai University. So happy to see him here. Um, so um, uh, today uh, I'll be just giving an overview mostly because uh, I, I'm sure that many of you have already gone through many papers, uh, which is preprints, non peer reviewed, peer reviewed, all those categories. So uh, here we are trying to look at uh, what are the key points that we have to consider on drug discovery and what are the possible targets. So uh, here we are trying to analyze the drug targets of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is just a snapshot that I've taken um, a bit, a few hours back. Uh, this is a situation of the world with COVID cases and the confirmed cases uh, as per WHO in India, it's around 604,000. Uh, confirmed cases and more than uh, close to 18,000 deaths. That's where we are reaching to. Uh, and there are bad situations still uh, prevailing in many other countries. Hopefully, we'll come out of it soon. Um, so uh, the terms and names, I have seen some of the uh, presentations yesterday already. A few speakers have already gone through it. Might be a repetition. Uh, please uh, excuse me for that. Um, so uh, the naming authority, I have given it on, uh, on the left hand side and you can see the virus species is MERS and SARS and the 
the virus names have been given as COV2 uh, for the new uh, coronavirus. And the disease is... Excuse me, sir. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, something, I think your slides are not changing. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we are still in the first slide, actually. You're still on the first slide? Okay, let me see yeah. what I have shared. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Hey, holy young madam. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know. Something happened. I hope now you are able okay. to see my screen, right? Yes, uh, we, uh, we are able to see your full screen, actually. Oh, okay. Great. 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 Okay. Uh, thank you so much for letting me know that. And uh, I, my sincere apologies to uh, all the participants. Anyway, uh, so what I was trying to say is uh, a few hours back, I took this snapshot from uh, WHO, and this is a current situation of uh, COVID-19 cases uh, throughout the uh, uh, globe. Um, Sorry for the interruption, sir. Uh, uh, we, I can see your uh, window actually it is showing you the, uh, the folders actually, not the uh, slide. Oh, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. For me, it is actually showing it is sharing. Okay. Um, let me check. How about now? Yes, sir. Uh, we can see the uh, folders. Uh, you were, I think, your desktop actually. So, it is showing on the folders everything, but uh, not the slide. Let me do it once again. I don't know what is happening. Yeah. Uh, 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 can you please try with uh, just sharing the application? Or, uh... I'm now sharing the whole screen. So, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, we can see the whole screen, but except the slide. Okay, L let me try to reconnect them. Maybe something. Okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now I can see the slide. Hello, sir. Yes, I'm here. Now, now I can see the slide, uh, the map, world map. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it changing now? No, it's not changing. You are you changing the slides? Yes, I'm. I'm changing. No, no. It's uh, it's in the uh, map actually, globally, as per uh, yesterday's time, the confirmed death cases. That slide is there. Correct. Uh, this Webex app is doing something. I think now you are able to see. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Now we can see the, uh, yeah, uh, I can see the Google Slides actually. Yeah, now it's changing. Okay. So I uh, think you, now, you can use the present mode. Let me try. Yeah. How about now? Yeah, now it's fine. Uh, can you change your next slide? Yeah. Yeah, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry that I don't know. <laughs> Being using it daily, something happened right now. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so uh, again, repeating it. Um, here goes. Um, so this is the current situation uh, taken from WHO uh, with the cases. Uh, so we are all uh, working towards it, uh, putting our brainstorming and uh, putting our minds to it in all possible ways. The outbreak of uh, this disease also probably started from a single or multi multiple sunitic uh, transmission events from the wet market in Wuhan, where meat and game animals were sold. And this was taken from the article Rio and as uh, during uh, 2020 he has published like early 2020 and uh, a variant caused severe acute respiratory syndrome and around 2003 later where uh, which is from camels that's where the MERS came uh, and then uh, December 2019 as a cluster of pneumonia cases were reported in Wuhan where uh, in China also reported where the SARS-CoV-2 came in. So uh, this is where we have to have a clear idea. The disease is COVID-19, the virus is COV-2, and the species is SARS. Now, the origin of all the different uh, related uh, respiratory syndrome uh, viruses or diseases are uh, starting from bats, then transferred to animals like uh, civet cat, camel, and pangolins. And then there is also some relationship and similarity with the receptors uh, when we are comparing with SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, they both have uh, started during winter and uh, with the small cases, they got evolved. And this is something it is being taken during Jan. I know the situation has completely changed as of today uh, with the number of countries and deaths and cases. So please bear with me, these numbers are shown on the screen. So the attachment receptor is AC2 for both of them, but and also they uh, expect uh, TMPRSS2. There are a lot of studies going on in that, and the neutralization efficiency uh, it's being looked at a high on CoV and CoV2 is moderate. But again, now we are still uh, trying to find out the right uh, uh, solution. So the single it is a single and a positive stranded RNA virus that belongs to the order. Uh, Nido virally and uh, uh, family coronaviridae. Uh, and in March 11, 2020, the outbreak was officially declared as a pandemic by WHO. Its genomic size is from 29 to 32 kilobases, and COV2 showed around 89.1 percentage of nucleotide identity with bat SARS like COV. So, this identity is actually helping us as well as concerning us because selectivity is a big criteria here. Then predicted replicates of uh, open reading frames, one AB uh, gene of WHCV is also in its length and it also contains 16 predicted non-structural proteins, which is followed by 13 downstream ORFs. So these are all uh, about the information about SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. And I am sure that yesterday you have already seen this picture or a similar representation several times. So we are looking at spike proteins at different stages, different levels of targets. Uh, M proteins, uh, hemoglobin esterase dimers, envelope protein, RNA and protein. Uh, so these are all uh, being looked at several days. Now, coronavirus into the spotlight. This is what we are trying to compare between uh, MERS CoV entry and SARS CoV entry. There are several studies being done on how about COV, uh, on COV2 on DPP4 as well as on ACE2. Both has been explored. Then only they came to a conclusion of ACE2 and uh, uh, TMPPRS. So here the entry mode, like it enters the target cell through an endosomal pathway and then TMPRS2, which is an enzyme, helps the viron enter and virion releases RNA. So let me go take you through some of the steps, which you already know, but just uh, to give a spotlight. So the uh, spike protein binds to AC2 receptor, then TMPRSS to the enzyme, which helps uh, to enter the virion, uh, and then virion releases RNA inside the cell. The RNA translates uh, uh, to a protein, right? And then replicates to make uh, more RNA, and protein and RNA assemble into new virion in Golgi apparatus, and then it releases. 
uh, that's how what we talk about um, virus release, then RNA replication and packaging, assembling and budding, all these stages are being uh, taken care of. Um, yep. So finally, moving forward, this is the real way of attacking human cell. So you can see the cell and uh, the virus that is getting affected on the uh, cell. This is the uh, real picture. Uh, it is taken from CDC. Now, uh, here it's where uh, I wanted to start more discussing about the targets. So here we're trying to compare between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. As you can see on the right hand side, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, uh, both the viral strains that is COV, uh, Urbani and COV-2 Wuhan uh, 1, they have checked the percentage of identity that is mean the uh, the particular uh, strain uh, on different ORF1, AB, spike, envelope, M and N. Uh, so they did a comparative analysis and found the similarity there. As you can see on the right, uh, this is taken from uh, Trends Microbiology, a very recent paper. And um, they also have found the respective uh, crystal structures. In early Jan, we don't have much uh, crystal structure, most is big modeled, I mean homology modeled, predicted models. We had only 6LU7 at that time. Later, uh, the group uh, Diamond, uh, they came into picture and uh, lots, hundreds of uh, uh, kind of, what to say, co-crystal ligand um, um, targets came in. I can see now it's about 82 uh, crystal structures available in the PDB uh, of uh, different resolution, uh, different confirmations, Many, many more data is available. Uh, so the what what we are trying to look at here is the main protease three CL pro or non-structural proteins that is NSP five with unliganded active site is there in the pink color. NSP nine on the RNA binding uh, protein which is in the cyan color. Uh, as just to tell you the represent the PDB IDs are also given here. NSP fifteen which is endoribonucleus which is in marine blue. NSP 16 and 10 is a complex in green and perfusion spike glycoprotein in gray. And that is which probably everybody knows that is 6 VSB. And uh, main, I think uh, a few others are also working on 6YB7 and 6VWW. Others, I know very specific groups look at it. Uh, nuclear capsid protein N terminal RNA binding domain, uh, which is like RBD. Uh, uh, is in the deep uh, turquoise. So RDRP, RBD, these are the common terms that you usually hear when you uh, hear about the targets of SARS-CoV-2. These are the predicted models from ITESA. Uh, so this is like a genome-wide structure and functional modeling of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, now, few of them are already available with the crystal structure, but still uh, uh, some of them uh, you have to for homology model structure only. So uh, this is a really good snapshot. Please go to the ITESA website. You will find this data and you can download all the PDB structures, uh, which is validated uh, with uh, safe servers and others being on these model structures on each stages. So the genomic organization is, uh, that's what is shown here. Each level. What are the corresponding uh, like PDB IDs, this is what I have shown here. Uh, just give me a moment. Yeah. So here, what we are trying to uh, see is that how, uh, um, like the RNA dependent uh, RNA polymerase or endoribonuclease at which region and how we need to think of uh, to be very selective. So when you're trying to do any drug discovery um, uh, part of analysis, you need to be very specific on understanding. Uh, the selectivity and sensitivity. It's not that uh, we are doing for a multi-targeted thing. That's why the even the pre, uh, what to say, drug repurposing also, it's taking a lot of time because of the uh, selectivity part. So we need to be uh, very sure that which is uh, what kind of confirmation we are looking at. And then uh, we also have to consider whether we are targeting on uh, which mechanism, whether the entry, whether uh, the replication or the release. So at each st stages, it is actually a different uh, uh, kind of activity. So these are the possible drug targets that we are looking at. 
so the target names are given on the second column. The full name is like, as I told you in the previous slide, the papain like PL Pro, 3CL Pro, RDRP, that is RNA dependent RNA polymerase, then viral spike glycoprotein, transmembrane protease serine 2, AC2, AT2, which is angiotensin receptor. That is, uh, and there are possible drug candidates also under clinical trials and uh, uh, also suspecting that this could work uh, or inhibit uh, properly. The role of each of these targets is when you're looking at 3CL Pro, the protease for the proteolysis of the viral uh, polyprotein uh, into the functional units. That is the role here. And protease for the proteolysis of viral protein into functional is also for the PL Pro. So PL Pro and 3CL Pro has a, a similar kind of uh, role. Here, RDRP also tries to replicate with the viral genome and uh, uh, also the viral surface of the protein where the spike protein is looking at. The MPRS, as it has produced the protease to primes, the spike protein to facilitate into binding to ACE2. And ACE2 helps on the host cell which binds to the viral spike protein. So for each uh, stage, we have different drug uh, uh, being uh, also looked at, the con candidates being looked at. So that's where uh, the targets here it is. And these are the uh, just a snapshot of about the PDB IDs and its resolution, which gives you clarity about which uh, uh, crystal structure that could be taken for your molecular modeling or uh, molecular dynamic studies that could be carried out. Mutations on the protein targets, nothing is being reported yet. But yes, on genomic variants, we found there are uh, uh, possible mutations um, um, studies, but yeah, nothing firm has been much reported. But as of today, if something has updated, I'm happy to uh, know about it. Now going to spike glycoprotein enclosed and open. So this is something that where modelers have to take care of. There are two different, uh, uh, there are two different, uh, um, uh, what to say, in uh, glycoprotein. So S1 is the host cell interaction. S2 uh, domain, as you see on the picture, is involved in the trimerization. So the spike proteins, which are free trimer, are not much virulent, but we have to be very domain specific. So the open conformation, it moves the one domain from spike towards a receptor and interacts and hijacks. Therefore, endocytosis takes place. So the, uh, that's where the domain specific, what I mentioned, including the uh, conformation. So let me uh, take you through a little bit more deeper into it. This shows the uh, structure, uh, the particular figure A shows the schematic architecture of the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein and also the degree of the protein surface conservation between the primary CoV-2 and the CoV. So here also we have done a comparison between CoV and CoV-2. The color range is shown in green and magenta represents uh, not conserved and highly conserved respectively. The atomic positions of the cleavage site is indicated by an arrow. This is the, the atomic, uh, the site side and coming to the uh, this particular picture uh, the b so here we are uh, looking at uh, more about other um, uh, corresponding overload of ac2 receptor so how ac2 is being interacting uh, with the rbd of cov2 as well as of cov cov is represented in gray color and cov2 on the blue color here you will see uh, there is a difference in the particular loop so the corresponding footprints are also colored. And uh, to illustrate the overlap between both the interaction sites, this is where you can see uh, this region. That's where uh, they have similarity there. Now coming to C and D, uh, here you will see the hidden RBD on the closed conformation. But on the open conformation, the RBD is being exposed. So this is uh, the both the conformations are available in the PDB. So you have to choose the right one when you're going for any molecular uh, drug discovery studies on the predictive side. Now, S1 to uh, open to signals to enter the cells, as I already told you. This is also a paper uh, uh, which they have mentioned about uh, the AC2 bound conformation at uh, the first, second, and third conformation, then unbound up and unbound down conformations of SARS-CoV cytoprotein after trypsin cleavage and low pH treatment. As I am not sure how many of you are aware, pH has a great role in this binding of the, um, the spike protein or the cell into entering into the cell, uh, the virus entering into the cell. 
So CTD1 is a colored as a pink color, as you can see here, and the bound AC2 in the green color. The angle between the long axis of the CTD1 and horizontal plane is also shown at the bottom of each of these conformations. So this actually tells you about the role of pH treatment and toxin cleavage. Even uh, the bioassays also they uh, try to study based upon the trypsin cleavage. Uh, there are some of the activity data available uh, on the web. They have done assays on trypsin uh, cleavage. Now, could DPP for it's not DDP, sorry, it is DPP uh, for inhibition could help or not. So, as I told you earlier, they tried a kind of a predictive models. It's not experimental. Uh, it's this particular paper refers to um, simul MD simulations and docking studies. I'm going a little more uh, faster because the time is coming closer uh, uh, for the next uh, speaker. So the glycoxylation is also an important factor. So when they try to compare, the blue is more of the blue colored uh, ones. It's more of a cove related and green ones are for cove two. Now, what is this glycoxylation to camouflage the virus? So it gets hidden from the some of the host antibodies. Uh, so these are the uh, uh, understanding of glycoxylation site. If you can see for CoV-1 and CoV-2, they're closely related, but there is a difference. So that's where the 89.1% of identity and the balance difference makes uh, uh, this virus much more uh, selective when compared to CoV-1. And this is a, a, again uh, an arrangement uh, which we are looking at uh, the uh, subunit level. So the mutations in the contact residues of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein as you can see, uh, these uh, blue colored uh, highlighted boxes, which is uh, telling about the difference, was aligned against the most closely related COVID like coronavirus and COVID itself. So the key residues of the spike protein that make contact to AC2 are marked with the blue boxes, as I already mentioned, and uh, in both COVID 2 and related viruses. Therefore, the acquisition of the polybasic cleavage site and O-linked glycans. Both the polybasic cleavage site and three adjacent predicted O-linked glycans are unique to COV2. So this is where uh, uh, kind of a little bit of bioinformatics analysis being carried out to understand uh, what are the possible mutations or what are the possible uh, difference when compared to the other related uh, respiratory uh, syndrome uh, diseases. Now the structure of RDRP is also important. I'm not going too much deep into it because of time limit. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 NSP12 is that what we're looking at uh, RDRP and then uh, NS5B and uh, uh, 3D pole for the comparison. So here you can see the NTP gets entered, which is a template entry. Uh, so there is a path where uh, there are different positions, uh, sorry, different uh, features that to be considered on RDRP. So whoever working on uh, a particular uh, structure on NSP 12, 7, and 8. Uh, please take care of your domain and uh, the interfaces and entry path. Then mechanism-driven uh, inhibitors, as I already told you, at, at each level of uh, stages or at, at each stages, you have to look at different inhibitors. So here, if you see, we are looking at virus receptor interaction, host protease inhibitors, fusion inhibitors, viral protease inhibitors, lipidomic uh, uh, reprogramming drug, uh, drugs that to be looked at, then replication or transcription. So therefore, we are looking at nucleoside analogs and how to neutralize the virus. So at different, different stages, we are looking at to uh, do drug discovery uh, studies on how to inhibit them. And the drug targets and the possible inhibitors I hope uh, you know this picture earlier, which I showed you in the previous slide about the genomic organization. And these are the corresponding possible or under the clinical trial, what are the inhibitors that is going on. Now, these are the uh, few of the data that I have taken uh, where uh, the repurposed drug, they are going for COVID-19 trial, and uh, uh, it's a possible route of entry. It's also, so remdesivir is a pro-drug which converts uh, to GS, 441524 uh, and inhibits the action of RNA polymerase. Uh, Galdesivir, it's a, 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 a viral RNA polymerase binder. And coming to Camostat, it's a transmembrane protease where uh, people are all looking at uh, TVMPRSS2, which is an inhibitor there. And Flabipiravir is a pro drug, a selective viral RNA polymerase inhibitor. And hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, we already 
have heard a lot about it, which inhibits the terminal glycoxylation of AC2 and chloroquine also uh, pretends to be uh, there, including action of heme polymerase. Now, coming to um, um, uh, Camostat, uh, it's more of a COVID-19 treatment strategies and uh, also Camostat is looking at TMP PRSS to inhibit and may inhibit the entry of SARS-CoV-2 into lung cancer. So this is also taken from Cell uh, Journal, uh, one of the article uh, recently published. Uh, so here also they looked at the uh, Camostat and uh, Nefamostat, uh, what is their uh, role and cell activity on different stages of uh, the viral activity. Then Remdesivir, uh, of course, it's a broad spectrum of antiviral drug in the nucleotide uh, analogs of adenosine. So here the mechanism by which uh, terminates RNA chain was analyzed in this paper by also again RDRP where they were trying to use Ebola virus that's where it came from and uh, it has also a similar mechanism of RNA chain termination in SARS-CoV-2 uh, that's the reason why Remdesivir it's also being tried uh, uh, for the testing. Now uh, just uh, enthusiasts who wanted to start with uh, uh, CoV-2 related uh, uh, molecular modeling studies uh, on a very heat identification not to design a lead molecule on a very initial phase. You could try with 6YB7, that is a PDBID. This is the motif region where we are looking at the specific amino acid histidine 163 and globin 166 uh, motif. And another catalytic site is a cysteine 145. So these two different amino acids have different role. I recommend you to please kindly read it and then understand where you wanted to dock and inhibit. It's not simply that the software is going to tell you this is the pocket and dock it. That doesn't make any sense. That's why I clearly mentioned what is a mechanistic driven drug discovery. You need to understand what is the role of that specific amino acid. How this amino acid is going to influence the mechanism or the pathway. If there is some sense, okay, then go and inhibit that particular um, uh, uh, amino acid. So non-covalent hits also over catalytic sites uh, like cysteine 145 is also explored in 6YB7. Now, how are these therapeutics discovered? Uh, organizers, I need two, two more minutes. I hope that's okay. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I'll be finishing it soon. So how the therapeutics are discovered? We have to identify the best biomolecular target, uh, which is tied to disease. And it should be very selective. And it is not that we are doing uh, molecular studies or uh, docking studies on a different uh, PDB protein, and we are doing uh, entirely different uh, bioassays. There should be some relation. So bioavailability, druggability, everything should be looked at the target. When you're looking at heat identification, we are just looking at a set of molecules which could interact with target. We are not finding an inhibitor. We are not finding a drug-like molecule. No, never. Uh, the, so just doing a, a screening or a docking analysis, we are just finding a heat molecule, right? Uh, just doing a docking, you cannot get a drug molecule tomorrow on the table, never, ever. So lead optimization is to be, that's where we look at uh, modifying the hit with a better selectivity, non-toxicity, or many other parameters that to be considered. Now, when you're doing some docking analysis, it's not about only uh, getting better score or energy. It's more about how about that particular geometry pose is, uh, can be crystallized on a biological complex. That is also Im Im important, right? So then later we go to pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic properties, how it reacts with the drug, how the organ um, uh, also reacts of the body. So then metabolism, toxicity, everything will be taken care of there. And animal testing, testing of efficacy in animals and the process optimization where design mechanism of manufacture and scale of uh, therapeutics. This is why I told the objectives of drug discovery is mainly to identify the compounds with an optimal balance of property. So by doing a docking or by doing a bioassay or uh, getting IC50, you're just looking at this particular site, whether it is a hit or a lead molecule and what is its potency, what is its binding affinity. That's all you're looking at. But by that, you cannot say that it is a drug-like molecule even because in order to say drug-like, it should be safe. That means toxicity to be analyzed. What is the absorption rate in your body for that compound? What is the metabolic stability? Because if it metabolizes, when it reaches your target, of course, it will be different compounds. So these are the metabolites, right? 
So we have to see whether we have to take a pro-drug strategy. What is the solubility? What is the permeability? What is the flexibility of the compound? All these parameters to be looked at after doing any kind of screening or heat identification. So that's where the objective of main drug discovery. Why I'm telling repeatedly, because many of us, including me, initial days, I thought molecular docking is just drug discovery. No, molecular docking is a screening part where we are doing only heat identification. Hit, lead, drug. In order to reach to drug-like, there are tremendous amount of iterations to be done. So ultimately, what we are looking at is, uh, if you are not able to get such balance, then fail fast, fails you. Drop the compound, work on the next one. And work only on the compounds or some modifications or derivatives only when you're confident. And avoid any missed opportunities so that you don't waste your time and money. So data overload is also a challenge that you have too many compounds. And you have also uh, eight experimental assays, which you have a lot of 1,600 data points with you. Or 10,000 compounds, you did several uh, in silico studies and you have a lot of data points. But let me make it very simple. You have one compound with you, you did one experiment, oh, sorry, 10 compounds with you, you did one experiment. It is easy for you to pick up the best three or two molecules. Now the same 10 compounds, I have 10 different experiments carried out. All 10 are important to me, independent, so I cannot take an average there. I have to consider all the 10 experiments data in order to choose the best three molecules among the 10. Now this is a bit challenging. Our usual way is we filter it from one by one. First experiment, then filter, second experiment, filter. But in drug discovery, we cannot do that. Because sometimes it might be tightly binding, but it might be toxic. If you try to modify some regions of the compound, the toxicity goes off, still the activity will remain there. So that is called optimization, right? So because of this challenge, you have a lot of data from in silico, in vitro, and in vivo. Now we have to prioritize them. Which property is more important and which property is less important? For me, everything is important. And for us, it is always but not like that for oral driven or uh, intravenous uh, driven uh, you you have different priority of pkpd prop, or pk properties uh, or pharmacokinetic properties that to be considered so based on that you have to prioritize them so what is the importance and what is the uncertainty and then you have to make a selection based on diversity and quality means it is the selection of the best heat molecule is not based only on the score are not based only on the energy. Never it is possible. There should be diversity. That's where we have to think about. We always do one time docking and we say we got the result. No, it is an iterative process. First, we have to consider more of diversity and then score. So let's say 75% of diversity, 25% based on the score, you select the top 10 or top 10%. And then on the next iterations of whatever you're doing, you give more priority to your score. That means 75% importance on score, 25% on diversity. That, that's a difference that we have to understand. That's how pharma works. So we have to, now we say we don't have money. Of course, drug discovery needs money. That is there. So that's why we have to understand on selection. That's, that's the only reason why many of them blame that when you're docking and you're getting some data, when I do bio, I say I don't get, I don't get the matching result. This is because your target might itself not whatever taken for docking studies is not druggable or bioavailable. They have difference in the bioassay and also do not consider diversity and quality in this. Now, what is the impact of computer-aided drug discovery on pharma? If you see, there are many compounds already in clinical trial or in phase two or phase three as listed here. I have taken from these reviews which are being shown at the bottom. Now, also let me tell you, using just one tool or one software, nobody is going to bring down a drug into the market. There is a combination of multiple tools to be used. Don't think that using a single tool, you can get something on your hand. No, there should be combinations of multiple tools used. So that many tools are now freely available. Some are proprietary and paid and available. It all depends upon what is your priority. So when you're choosing some of the tools, it is very important that you test, evaluate all of them, and choose the best one for your problem. So for problem A, software A is good, but for the same software might not be good for problem B. So that you are the master to evaluate and understand that. For me, A might be good. Um, and if I recommend you, but for your problem statement, that is not good. So we need to have a better understanding on what the kind of algorithms helps you to solve 
uh, drug discovery uh, on the computational aspects. Now, why no vaccines yet? Of course, uh, currently many progress have been made, but I don't want to comment on that. That's why I didn't make uh, any claim on uh, COVID-19 vaccines here. So they're scaling up and manufacturing is hard. That's why it is very difficult and it takes time. And short term is for repurposing the existing commons. Let's see, there are some news going on. So let's see if something comes up. Now, the other resources or modelers on SARS-CoV-2 uh, are these. Uh, I'm not uh, spending too much time here, but uh, whoever working on molecular dynamics, I don't want you to repeat again because you will say there is no hardware resources. So Disha is a company who has uh, uh, done on microseconds who are knowing about molecular dynamics, microseconds range, where most of the targets of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, and uh, you just download and analyze them. And the software uh, for analyzing is called Desmond, uh, works on Linux. It's completely free for academics, so you don't pay a penny for molecular dynamics analysis there. Anyway, uh, on PDB also, you have a lot of resources available, uh, so please go through them before doing any kind of molecular modeling studies. Uh, just two marketing slides. Uh, so being I am a coordinator here for this particular national initiative uh, from uh, the government of India and MHRD as well as uh, organized by ASCT and CSCR. So there will, uh, it is yesterday being officially launched, uh, uh, which is called uh, Drug Discovery Hackathon. Anybody can uh, take part, students, faculties, researchers, even international participants also can take part. So please go to the website for more eligibility criteria and more requirements. The track one is completely looking at the virtual screen, pharmacophore, molecular modeling on COVID-19 related targets. Or track two is completely on tool development. If you know programming uh, Python, or if you have an enthusiastic computer science efforts, so you can do programming. And moon, uh, track three is completely moon shot track, which considers completely disruptive approaches. So I thought being we are talking about COVID-19, why not we talk about this initiative also? Of course, there will be prices and the prices all depends upon how good is your result. Uh, keep in mind, diversity should be kept in mind and quality also should be kept in mind. That's why I emphasized on that point. So many things will be, con so it is uh, good that, uh, and, I, and I also request uh, everybody, the, especially students, because it's a learning process. You learn many things through training. And some of our offerings from uh, Shastra Innovations, uh, uh, so I don't put in any much things here. I don't want to do it as a marketing thing. So, but we take care of most of the solutions for machine learning based uh, QSR, uh, human toxicity endpoint predictions, ADME, and the bioisosteroid replacement, who is a medicinal chemist, it will be useful. And if you're designing some new molecule, if you want to do some retrosynthesis pathway. So not in, make, taking much more time. So I'm thanking all our superheroes in front of, uh, in the front for this fighting against COVID and also the organizers of this conference. And I also thank Mahesh uh, who gave me an opportunity and invited to this particular platform. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mahesh uh, from LLB. And uh, uh, also my student, Ms. Ambli and my other collaborators, Vijay and uh, Sachita and group of researchers. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation on COVID drug discovery process and what are the targets available, how we can proceed with that. So there are a few questions I'd like to ask you on the YouTube as well as from the WebEx platform. Please. So what is your view on uh, pH effect in the entry of spike protein in human? Uh, I don't want to comment much there okay. because uh, higher the level, lower the level, it has its own difference. So the, there were few studies being already carried out, but uh, to be honest with you, I really don't know uh, on a, a molecular modeling level, how we can define mm -hmm. this pH. Now, uh, the pH uh, as a molecule, of course, we can think about, it, but on a molecular modeling prediction level, sorry, I'm not an expert to comment that. Okay. So uh, is this uh, uh, spike protein? Uh, binding to human receptor. So the receptor is present only in human or is there any other organism which also has the similar proteins? Any we, idea on that? Some article, but not a research article. So I cannot mm -hmm. confirm that. They confirm that AC2 is present in some other animal. I don't remember. 
but i don't see uh, I, I i didn't read from a research article so i don't say um, yes to it but uh, i saw an article which says there are other um, uh, which is having some ac2 uh, receptor okay so there is an interesting question uh, there are some uh, sometimes uh, in silico results are so good it works in in vitro and in vivo studies but in the other case uh, it is not working so what did your suggestion how to proceed with that that's exactly i said in silico mm -hmm. studies uh, how what how extensive yes. you did that is a question now here mm -hmm. everybody does molecular docking but the biggest question have you done molecular dynamics after that have you done more protein ligand interaction studies in order to understand how far your interaction is stable on a longer time frame let's say uh, 100 nanoseconds or 200 nanoseconds whether your interaction between the ligand and the protein is stable if it is not stable your docking results are not good so we we always stick on to docking we never went beyond that and did molecular mm -hmm. i know many of them are doing now because there are computers available now earlier days we didn't have that much hardware resources to do that so i can understand that so uh, that is where we are so we need to have a detailed analysis of in silico so after molecular docking have you done molecular dynamics if everything is good have you gone through ligand based uh, studies like pk studies by, um, then uh, sar studies uh, whether it's matching with so that's what i was showing you in the one of the slide a balance of all these required as you see on the screen but always it is not possible if it is not possible we mm -hmm. have to leave it that's why you are getting this issue that uh, what are your suggestions on giving preference to in silico or in in vitro so when you wanted to scale it to in vitro ensure that what or reverse ensure that what kind of target you're choosing for them for example i get some projects saying that sir we did animal studies now we want to do in silico studies now I have to understand clearly what kind of assay they have used, what is the target they are targeting. Sometimes they don't have an answer for the target. Now we have to check the papers if someone has done imaging analysis to understand what is the target or many others. Based on that, we try to select the right PDB. But when we are simply selecting PDB randomly, based on many people publish, so I will also take it. That's where we have to be very careful. So in order to have a good synergetics between in vitro in silico or in vivo, we need to have a better understanding and there should be some relationship with uh, each others on target that we are choosing and the requirements. Thank you, sir. And uh, you, you showed the range of targets available in COVID. So yeah. uh, from your point of view, what do you think is the key target? Uh, because people are working in several uh, compounds like natural compounds and other things. So which can be a, a very good target in your point of view? See, natural products, uh, uh, natural products are the phytochemicals. Target. Yeah, phytochemicals or any other, um, um, based on my understanding, it's my personal mm -hmm. view, no contradictory yes. or no conflict. <laughs> Mostly it will be on the, uh, to protect the entry of virus. That's all, right? Mm -hmm. uh, apart from that, getting inside the cell, I really have no expertise to comment on natural compounds on penetrating or inside the cell action. Um, otherwise, um, most of the time people always look at uh, the entry point. That's where people are looking. But now what about the others who are already getting affected? So then we look into other targets also. So uh, it is about a question about how far you want to explore. For example, mm -hmm. do you have, uh, it is only that you're in, uh, thinking of in silico or you, are, you have a collaboration with a three, uh, BCL2 or BCL3 facility, uh, lab facility, and you can go ahead doing testing. So then uh, that's where the target that you have to choose. So based on your resource availability, you decide. I cannot simply comment on something because now resource availability is very, very important when you're doing research. Uh, research. Yes. My pick will be for uh, all the natural products or uh, all the others will be the entry point. So spike mm -hmm. proteins, AC2 uh, binding, uh, then transmembrane protease into these ones will be my interest. Okay. So one last question, sir. Uh, so in in silico uh, research, so what is your comment on uh, considering the stability of interaction between uh, good ligand and a protein? our target here. Yeah. 
so that that's exactly i mentioned mm-hmm. already uh, mm-hmm. so uh, don't simply depend upon an algorithm yes. predicting you the pocket uh, it is good no problem uh, it is it is with a sense geometrically identified pocket is being mentioned by the software but the you as a human we have to also have expertise and mm-hmm. understanding whether those amino acids on that geometric pocket is reliable or has some relation with the mechanism of uh, the particular um, inhibition or objective that we are looking at for example we need to know what is the role of copper uh, in a particular uh, protein if you are looking on cancer anti cancer drug so you need to know that uh, on a mechanistic way so what what, what is the uh, role of that amino acid if we in them unless you understand that you cannot rely on any in silico or docking studies that is very very important so uh, if you ask me sir should i start using the software first or should i learn about all the biochemical uh, mechanistic of the particular protein uh, pocket and its inhibition studies and then move forward i would recommend the first thing is to understand the mm-hmm. science behind it understand what that protein is for which amino acid which we have to target and then you learn the software then you will be a uh, good synergetics between computational and human expertise comes together for a better result otherwise those interaction studies are just interactions on a geometry base so okay sir thank you looking at tutorials we should be very clear that if see i have also made lot of tutorials but uh, we yes. need to understand we cannot put everything on tutorials so we expect yeah. that the people who are going to use that also have some scientific understanding on how to use this so that's what i want to tell all the young uh, students who are uh, about to get into this particular area yes uh, currently people are many are them are working in in silico approach and then exactly. then they proceed to the wet lab studies and then the results vary in much difference Absolutely, like because you have to have a better uh, understanding uh, how you are scaling up yes yes so thank you sir for your wonderful presentation and patiently answering to all our questions So no now problem. I request Dr. Kripaniti to thank the speaker. Hello, hello Professor. Hello, Kripanithi. hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Girinar. Wonderful talk in a lucid way, given much information to all the participants. And again, you, you have given a good uh, display of uh, predicted models through ITASER, iterative threading assembly refinement. and again you have exposed you have explained at length the closed and open conformation of s protein where the exposed rbd and the interaction with the what is it called ac2 all all, the, all that was shown to shown in that slide slide and particularly the drug targets for rdrp and uh, tmp rss2 and all those things you have shown apart from that the attributes of a drug like compounds that is the balance between solubility absorption safety potency and metabolic stability are very well elucidated for all the beginners to learn that just if you go to the computer and give an inhibitor and see that a drug has inhibit as uh, interacted the active site that is not sufficient we have to we have to do the balancing of all these five parameters what you are mentioning apart from that you indicated uh, two good reviews and that is uh, natural review drug discovery 2016 current topics of medicinal chemistry 2010 it is nice for the students to follow follow and again the last one that you have uh, given to our uh, participants is uh, away, that is inviting every one of them to get enrolled in national uh, drug discovery hackathon okay so it is uh, i request all the participants to get enrolled and let us continue our interaction with dr girina thank you dr girina Thank you so much sir I'm so blessed to have you having uh, thanking me uh, yeah. good to see you again after many years <laughs> Yeah we'll continue through email okay sure sir sure sir thank you so much thank 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 you thank you all uh, including all the organizers and uh, Dave bye thank you sir bye. thank you so now i request the next speaker to be introduced by rohini okay. 
डॉक्टर होल इन हेलो सर हेलो 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 या या गुड मॉर्निंग और डॉक्टर हो लियांग एन जी एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोकेमिस्ट्री एंड मॉलिकुलर बायोफिजिक्स कंजास स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी कंजास यूएसए डॉक्टर एन जी इज एन एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर ऑफ बायोकेमिस्ट्री एंड मॉलिकुलर बायोफिजिक्स एट कंजास स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी डॉक्टर एन जी ट्रेनिंग इज इन कंपिटेशनल स्ट्रक्चरल बायोलॉजी एंड क्रिस्टोलोग्राफी He was studied structure-based drug design since he was an undergraduate at Harvard University, studying under future Nobel laureate Martin Karplus. Dr. N. G. completed his PhD at UCLA, the University of California at Los Angeles, under the joint supervision of David Eisenberg and Richard Dickerson on crystallography and computational biology. He also completed two years in medical school as part of N. D. or phd program which provided him a background in pharmacology after ucla he worked as a post doctoral fellow and staff researcher at uc berkeley with tom albert he then worked as a senior scientist at confirm rx and reported directly to founder future nobel laureate priyan kobilka on g protein coupled receptor crystallography In 2011, Dr. N. G. moved to the University of Hawaii as an assistant professor of chemistry. In 2017, Dr. N. G. moved to Kansas State University. Dr. N. G. is the recipient of the U.S. National Science Foundation Career Award for Early Career Scientist. Dr. N. G. has placed in the top five in several global computational structure-based drug research competitions. Dr. N. G. is the founder of Open Source COVID-19, a non-profit group dedicated to drug discovery and open science. On a final note, he is also a fascinating individual, and we are grateful for his presence among us today. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ho Leong, sir. Please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, great. Can you see my slide? Yes. Oh, great. Well, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. This is always very exciting to give a talk, especially in front of an audience that's halfway around the world. So my name is Ho Leung Ng. I'm at Kansas State University in the U.S. I'm a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. I welcome you to contact me by email if you have any questions later uh, about my research or my talk. So where am I located? So we are in the state of Kansas. This is in a agricultural area in the heart of, in the middle of the United States. Our university is uh, most well known as a agricultural university, although my research is primarily not in agriculture. We are the site for the U.S. National Bioagro Defense Facility. So this is uh, one of the focuses of this research facility is to study zoonotic uh, di diseases that can be spread that are relevant to agriculture. Uh, this would include diseases like COVID-19. However, this facility is still being built, and unfortunately. Uh, we could really use it right now, but we are not quite ready. My research background. So thank you for the very nice introduction. Most of my research background is actually not related to COVID-19. I do work in structure-based drug design, primarily in cancer, immunology, and malaria. I started work on COVID-19 in earlier this year when I was contacted by Chinese collaborators who sought some assistance. And I felt that there was a, this was a place where I hopefully could make a difference. Hello, uh, Dr. Hu? Yes. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, we oh, are my not able to see the slide change. Yeah, yeah. 
I see. Okay, I did not realize that. Okay, so let me. Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah, it's changing. Okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, okay. So we're talking about uh, my research background. So uh, my background is primarily in structure-based drug design. Uh, this is both from a computational and experimental perspective using uh, in silico tools, developing our own methods, as well as uh, uh, wet lab biochemistry, biophysics, crystallography. And in the last about two years, we've been uh, working very hard in developing and applying machine learning to drug design. So one of the uh, initiatives I'm most excited about is OSC-19, Open Source COVID-19. So this was a group that I started earlier this year. We now have over 20 members across the world. This is a group dedicated to nonprofit open source drug discovery, meaning that we do not, uh, we will not have patents and we will share research data openly to uh, promote drug discovery, and especially to promote affordable drug discovery that can be accessible to a global population. Our group is inclusive. We're open to all scientists that have a background that is relevant to this kind of research. If you're interested, please contact me. Our capabilities run from computational drug design all the way to chemical synthesis, biochemical assays, crystallography, and we are one of the few collab uh, consortiums that have access to actual COVID virus, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral testing in a BSL-3 level facility. So uh, the current targets in our AI drug discovery program are the MPRO, protease, and NSP-16 RNA methyltransferase. So you've already been introduced to these two targets uh, by uh, other lecturers, so I will not go too much into detail on them. We will focus primarily on MPRO protease today because that is considered the uh, most important uh, and heavily studied COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 drug target. So the main strategies that we are pursuing, one is a virtual screening of drug bank for purposes of repurposing. So repurposing is very important to us because this is probably the fastest way to get a drug to humans to actually help patients. As we all un know, unfortunately, every day, thousands upon thousands of people are, being, are getting sick and people are dying. So every day counts. So what we're doing is we're screening drug bank, a database of characterized drugs, drug candidates, et cetera, uh, doing uh, not only, uh, many people are doing something similar to that. So the way that our approach differs from other groups is that we're not just screening drug bank, but we're screening the adjacent chemical space of drug bank, meaning that if we find promising hits from drug bank, we'll also screen molecules that are highly, uh, that have high similarity to those hits because those molecules, although they may not be characterized experimentally and are not drugs themselves, are more likely to share the desirable chemical properties of drugs. The other thing that we are doing that is different is that we are doing virtual screening for covalent inhibitors. So most people have focused on screening of non-covalent inhibitors. That is rather easy, but the uh, methods for screening covalent inhibitors is not so well developed and generally requires quite a lot of uh, human expertise. So it can't be done in an automated manner. So we have done that and we are uh, 
we have completing the virtual screen. Uh, one thing that is important following on the lecture, uh, our previous speaker, is that our results are being validated experimentally. So we are in the process of validating our in silico results using uh, enzyme assays and crystallography. And the, res uh, the best results from those will go on to be tested against live virus. But, uh, but th uh, this is something that you probably by now have learned quite a bit about. So what I want to do is talk about something that's a little different, which is that using artificial intelligence methods to generate novel inhibitors. So this is something that we're doing. This is different from repurposing. Uh, unlike repurposing, this is probably not the most efficient way of, uh, of pushing towards real drugs. However, this is important because this is a way of developing the latest technologies for uh, future drug design. So let me give you a very brief uh, introduction to how AI is used for uh, at least the chemistry of drug design. I don't want to make this too technical. So uh, nowadays, the, pri the method that has excited the most people is called deep learning. So deep learning can be considered a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of AI. Machine learning uses primarily tools that are based on statistics. And deep learning uses a very specific kind of tool, which are uh, deep neural networks. A deep neural network is a neural network that contains multiple layers for calculation. So what is a neural network? So again, this can get quite technical. So I just want to give you a very brief introduction so you can understand what this is about. Uh, they are difficult they look difficult, but actually the way they work is rather simple. You have these circles, and we call them nodes, and each circle corresponds to a function that is applied, that is calculated from inputs. So an input here can be, is shown as x1, x2, and x sub n. And each of these inputs can be weighted by, uh, and so here's W1, W2, Wn, etc. Your node calculates some kind of function, and then the output from this function, which here is Y sub J, is then fed to the next level of, uh, of, of nodes. And so you do this, and in different, and each vertical alignment we call a layer. So you see these multiple layers and eventually you, you calculate them to the output layer and then that gives you your final result. And so neural networks have been used for computing for decades, but it is only very relatively recently that we have developed uh, deep learning neural networks and have learned how to use them in a way that is useful. And the power of deep learning neural networks comes from their ability to, to act as something called a universal approximator. Basically, a deep neural network can represent any function. So a function here mean in the broad sense means that from in from a set of inputs one can calculate some kind of output so basically for example uh you could think of all the inputs that you would feed into a neural network that would predict whether a given molecule would be a useful drug or not and then uh you can train your network, meaning you, tr you parameterize it based on ex experimental or simulated data. And then once that network is trained, you can apply it to new data and hopefully uh, it will have some kind of predictive power. So 
We talked a bit about that. So the, there are two main AI applications to drug discovery. So one is predicting drug activity from chemical structure. So this turns out to be a very hard problem that people have been working on for decades. Me, uh, so it is a problem that is rather simply stated that here's a chemical structure. Can you tell me whether it would be effective as a, an inhibitor against m -pro protease, for example. And it turns out that this is quite hard, especially if you want to get quantitative results, such as to actually predict the inhibition constant or the free energy of binding. The second application, which I'm going to focus on today, is something that's a little bit uh, that's actually even harder, but it's something that is closer to the heart of the leading edge of drug uh, AI driven uh, the drug design, where not only are we making predictions, but we're asking this computer to use those predictions to actually design new molecules that hopefully will have better properties that make it more drug like. So I will talk to you, I'll talk to, about that a bit more, as that is something that is not as familiar to a, a general audience. Okay, but let's talk a little bit about the first application, because to be able to do AI-driven design uh, effectively, we need to be able to make useful predictions about drug activity. So how do we calculate protein-drug interactions? So we start with extracting the chemical features. So this uh, word features is actually a technical concept in machine learning. And all it means is that we just want to pull out data, any kind of data that might be useful input that can be fed into a neural network. These features could include, uh, uh, would include relatively simple chemical properties, such as molecular weight, or calculated hydrophobicity, uh, electrostatic charges, et cetera. And one can use, uh, the nice thing about machine learning is that you can calculate and use as many chemical features as you want and feed them into the neural network. And part of what the network does is that it tries to, uh, it tries to calculate the weights and the sig relative significance of these different features. So you have your neural network architecture, you give it, you feed it the features, and now you train your network on different data sets of correct and incorrect uh, docking orientations. Uh, meaning that where you have a given molecule and then you have to take into account both the confirmation of the molecule, the confirmation of the target, and how well the drug molecule fits the drug target. We identify those significant features that are correlated with the correct docking, as well as the inhibition constant or the free energies of binding. And then we use the neural network to help us create functions that are predictive. So we call these functions scoring functions. So there are different kinds of scoring functions that are broadly used. And uh, to introduce them to you, so we have some that are called force field based. Another term for this is physics based models, meaning that they calculate uh, they try to calculate a uh, binding affinity based on uh, traditional physical chemistry types of parameters, such as Coulomb electrostatics and uh, Van der Waals interactions, etc. Now, this turns out to be quite difficult. And in most, uh, uh, this turns out to be quite difficult. Another way to do this is Instead of using physics-based parameterization, we use empirical parameterization. We use a model that's somewhat physics-based, but we parameterize certain constants uh, against data sets from 
experimental binding affinities. And in general, this is currently uh, the uh, tends to be the most effective way, especially combining it with the force field based models. Another way to uh, determine scoring functions is to use knowledge based potentials. What is a knowledge based potential is that instead of, for example, using experimental binding affinities, we can use uh, actual observed distributions of physical chemical parameters, such as interatomic distances. We can get those from crystal structures. And this is, uh, this is nice because this provides an orthogonal method of, uh, of scoring compared to the first two. And so what generally works the best is to combine the best features of these three. And you can do that very nicely by using neural networks. And so as a relatively simple but very effective example of how this works is that uh, we were able to do this uh, in the D3R, the Drug Design Data Resource Competition that was held two years ago to, for predicting drug activity. And by using a relatively simple neural network architecture where we combine structure-based features and these would be features that are based on three-dimensional uh, interatomic distances and properties with ligand-based features. So these would include ver uh, the simple parameters such as ligand molecular weight and hydrophobicity. We we're able to calculate uh, experimental binding affinities quite accurately with an R uh, correlation coefficient of 0.67 for uh, for uh, base, uh, which is a important drug target for Alzheimer's disease. So what we want to do is apply these kinds of methods to uh, the current challenge of COVID-19 drug discovery. So uh, now we will move to the second application of AI to drug discovery, which is using generative AI uh, modeling. So this ties in to the big question, uh, the bigger topic of inverse design. So inverse design means that we're first thinking about functional space. There are certain chemical and physical properties that are of interest to us. Uh, for example, solubility, toxicity, drug activity. Now, how can we map from functional space to chemical space? So we have the desired properties, but to actually get a drug, we need to be able to get a real molecule that can be synthesized and put into a vial and given to patients. So there are different ways one can do this. One can do this traditionally through doing uh, enormous amounts of experiments, we can apply this data. Uh, we can do uh, in silico modeling, as we discussed earlier. And another way of doing this is by using simulations and by using what we call generative modeling. So gen or generative AI or generative machine learning. Using uh, the machine learning algorithms to learn what, uh, how chemical space and functional space map together, what properties are correlated with each other, and using that to directly move into uh, molecules. So this is a problem that is general to chemistry and goes beyond just drug design. So here's one way to think about it. You might be more familiar with some of the work in machine learning on images. So big companies like Google and Facebook have a lot of interest in analyzing faces. And so here are a set of human faces. And these, what's interesting about these faces is that these faces are not, do not correspond to real people. 
these are faces that are computer generated. So the computer algorithm has looked at a enormous data set of human faces. And the algorithm is able to learn what a human face looks like without a human saying, well, a human face has usually has two eyes and a nose down the middle, et cetera, et cetera. The, the machine learning algorithm can learn this. And this is actually quite old. So you can, if you look carefully, you can find artifacts in these that make them, that, uh, that, you, that make that you can give away that these are not real human faces. Uh, the most current algorithms can come up with human faces that at least to me look completely real, which is quite scary. Now we take this same approach and instead of using thinking about faces, we ask the computer to think about molecules. We give a computer a set of training molecules and we can say, hey, these molecules, first of all, the computer does not know what is chemistry. It does not know the rules of chemistry. So the computer has to learn that, okay, we are just starting with the balls and sticks and they have to connect in certain ways. And they connect in certain ways, and that gives you a molecule. And this molecule, we feed the computer, we label these molecules with certain uh, properties. And we tell the computer, from these molecules, we can calculate certain properties. So computer, learn chemistry, and then also learn what are properties associated with molecules that would make for good drugs. This is very hard, as you might imagine, but there are lots of advantages for this kind of strategy. One, first of all, you must realize that chemical space is enormous. What do I mean by chemical space? I mean the number of different molecules one could make that occupies a certain molecular weight range. So for example, let's say the number of mo molecules that one could make that, uh, that are below 600 in molecular weight, uh, which, is, uh, which characterizes most small molecule drugs. The number of molecules that could make are almost infinite. So how can we if they're infinite, so that means we can't screen them directly, even in silico. So how can we explore the chemical space in a way that helps us find drugs? So based on our knowledge and experience with medicinal chemistry, we could say, ah, well, the space is infinite, but we know from our research that we think this region of space is the most promising for making drugs uh, or this region of space and especially for a drug targeting let's say m -pro protease now of course if it was that easy then would be making new drugs all the time so it turns out it's not that easy at all we can make some educated guesses so that it's not random but as anyone who has experience in drug design research knows that there is an enormous amount of trial and error involved and this trial and error takes a long time and is extremely expensive so what this kind of a generative ai can do is that it can help us explore chemical space it can help us move away from a human expert's a priori guess at what might be the most promising space to less biased at regions of chemical space. Now, just like our previous speaker said, this is not a tool that will move us automatically to a drug. What we're trying to do is we're trying to improve chemical diversity especially in a way that is that uh, is 
not biased and often unexpected from the perspective uh, from the perspective of a human expert. So we think that's an advantage that a computer can have. The computer is not smarter than us, but perhaps it can avoid some common human biases. So now we're moving to the current state of the art. So one of the things that our collaborators have found is that in addition, to the actual machine learning itself, that the data representation is extremely important. So here is a molecule, and the traditional way that chemoinformatics scientists have represented these molecules is by using something called a SMILES string. And here's an example of a SMILES string. The SMILES string, unfortunately, has a lot of drawbacks and our collaborators developed a method similar to and it, which extended the concepts of a smile string that they called selfies what a great uh, what a great word huh they and what the advantage of selfies does is that the selfies contain the complete topological connectedness of the molecule and it also includes some rules about what kind of atoms can and cannot be connected. And what that does is that instead of having the, the neural network have uh, learn what is the rules of chemistry, uh, the grammar, the data representation, the selfies themselves contain the simple rules and that helps the neural network cons uh, allow it frees the neural network to work on the harder and more interesting task of helping us find interesting drug like molecules. <laughs> so the actual architecture, uh, which we won't focus too much on that uh, uses a genetic algorithm. And what this does is that it introduces new molecules and it mutates them modifies them and crosses over their good features. It uses a neural network, which is trained on a data set and continues to be trained on molecules that are generated to try to discriminate between molecules that are good or bad. It also uses properties that we tell that we tell the algorithm that we want. For example, we don't want molecules that are too small or too large. We don't want molecules that are too polar or too hydrophobic, et cetera. And so and this, can, this is great because this can include anything that can be quantified. So the, the properties and the output from the discriminator are fed together into a fitness function, and then that gets fed back into the generator to create the next generation of molecules for evaluation. And what we can see here is that over multiple generations, this hybrid architecture is able to improve, uh, to, to, uh, improve by lowering the, f the fitness function, so it's a, uh, which means the, uh, the error in the fitness function, uh, as well to improve, for example, the, rank, the likelihood that they would rank high for some kind of desired chemical property. So back to MPRO. So this is all work that has been done just very recently within the past week. And what we're starting with is uh, almost nothing. We're starting with a methane molecule that is uh, put into the act that is evaluated uh, at the active site of the MPRO protease. After 10 generations, the algorithm is able to expand the methane to uh, various molecules. So there are actually hundreds of molecules in this in each generation. So these are just some randomly chosen examples. And after 
even more generations, what we see here is that the molecules continue to grow in size and complexity. So from our limited testing so far, uh, these are examples for MPRO of molecules that scored quite high in this, uh, by this algorithm. Uh, meaning that these molecules fit a certain desired properties that we told it to fit, as well as they tend to dock uh, quite not, uh, relatively well into the MPRO binding site. And if you, uh, for those of you who are chemists, you'll find that these molecules, uh, most of them look okay, but they do have some parts that look quite strange. So. And, and that is something that we're still working on. Part, uh, also, some, uh, many of the molecules that are generated are not what we call synthetically accessible. So these are molecules that uh, might work, might exist on paper, but are not easily uh, uh, synthesized by a chemist. So that's not of practical use. But we can still use these because uh, we can feed these as ideas to a human expert, and the human expert can say, ah, you know, I never thought about using something like this, and, uh, but of course this is not feasible. So the human expert can modify this into something that is usable. Another way to do this that's more simple is there are various different kinds of simplifications that we can apply. So we take this molecule, and we look for a analog for an existing molecule in PubChem, which is a large database of chemical structures. And we found that this analog of that pre previous molecule actually scores quite well and docks uh, very, relatively nicely into the MPRO protease binding site. Okay, so as I said before, this is something that we're working on uh, this very minute, and there's still a lot of room for improvement. But this is something that is close to the state of the art. So, of course, like I said earlier, we want to make molecules that are more uh, drug lead like, meaning that they show more properties that are characteristic of well of drugs. We want to improve synthetic accessibility because this is not just a computational exercise. We want to have molecules that can be put into a vial. Instead of uh, we, as a proof of concept, we started from the most difficult case. We started with a methane molecule. Let's make it easier. What if we start with known drugs or known active compounds or fragments and ask the algorithm to see if we can use those and as a seed and build better molecules? And more generally, can this kind of algorithm be used as a test of the druggability of a given target site? Because this is done in an automated relatively unbiased manner, if the computer algorithms cannot come up with a molecule that can give good binding, uh, at least in silico binding to a site, can we conclude that this is not a promising site for testing and vice versa? So I want to acknowledge the work, uh, the people who have worked on this. So the, comp the computational lab at our university uh, these are the graduate students and postdocs in my lab who have worked on this pro uh, project over the years. The, a lot of the experimental work in OSC 19 is being led by Troy Messick's uh, group at the Star Institute in Philadelphia in the US. Our collaborator in machine learning is Professor Alain Aspruguzic at the University of Toronto, and these are his students and postdocs who have led the generative machine learning work. We are, our research is currently sponsored by the United States National Science Foundation and Intel Corporation. Thank you very much for your attention. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for a very interesting talk on drug discovery using artificial intelligence. So there are a few questions. 
uh, the first question i would ask is like uh, uh, like we see nowadays like there are various application of ai in fields so what is your view on uh, ai in predicting drug discovery or does it has any limitation or disadvantage from your point of view we are still in the early stages of this work yeah. Uh, so it, uh, we're very excited about it, and we think that, uh, let's say, in a few years' time, this will become a very useful tool that will be used by all computational scientists. There is one very important fundamental limitation to, uh, to, uh, to the AI work in drug discovery, which is that AI and deep learning relies on data training. So what that means is that we need to train the, the, the neural networks on data sets. The, but typically, for those of you who have lab experience, it's hard to get a lot of data. So you might work hard for a few years, and maybe you'll get a data set of 50 points. A big drug company might have a data set of a few thousand points. But this isn't like Google or Facebook, where they can train on millions of images. So it's unlikely we will ever be able to scale up to that level where we have data sets composed of millions of data points. So the challenge is, can we develop new kinds of machine learning that will work on smaller data, data sets? OK. So uh, in one of your slides, uh, you told about the generation of molecules evolution. So yes. So how do we see that like uh, it's more of a like a genetic algorithm where the fittest molecule gets to the next next stage? That's right. Yes, yes. So the molecules are evaluated and the molecules that score poorly are discarded. The molecules that score well are retained and the molecules that score well, their chemical features between them get uh, mixed and get swapped. So that's why we call it a genetic algorithm. And also mm -hmm. there is a bit of mutation so that there's random, small random changes that are made to the molecules for the next generation for evaluation. So uh, you started with methane or some simple molecule. So then you are making the molecule to evolve to a, a different variation. So how right. diverse the output will be? Like you are, oh, you have any kind of question. That's yeah. a great question. So because it's unbiased, so it, mm -hmm. it's not biased towards certain kinds of chemical groups. Uh, uh, we could bias it. And basically mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to. It's a parameter that you can set. You could make it more conservative or you could make it uh, uh, less biased. Uh, uh, more what we can call creative. The problem with that is that if we tweak this parameter to allow it to be more creative, at least at this point, it tends to come up with crazy molecules that don't make any chemical sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, another question is like uh, you told about the infinite uh, solution set of generated molecules. So mm -hmm. how can we address, uh, can we use linear programming or any of these to find the solution space? Uh, yes, I mean, we can of mm -hmm. course use any mathematical approach and they are being mm -hmm. used. Uh, part of, a big part of the problem is that uh, uh, this is very computationally intensive. So does, right yes. now for us to do this for, uh, uh, for uh, one run of doing this for a molecule takes about uh, takes several days and so and we are still in the process of developing this algorithm further and of course we need to test a lot of different parameters and uh, it all takes a lot of time and a lot of computing power and of course we are if someone has ideas for making this process more efficient we would love to hear from you yeah sure so uh, when we are generating the molecules so uh, it's like uh, we are generating uh, based on the known molecules and also we get the molecules which has been never seen or synthesized. So if you get a novel molecule, how do you proceed with that? Or you consult a chemist to do uh, any suggestions on this molecule? 
Right, right. So, of uh, at least from the, uh, I mean, right now we're at the in silico phase. Uh, mm -hmm. We talked about our work with the M Pro. Uh, uh, both the, yes. uh, we're also doing this with NSP sixteen for both targets. We have teams of synthetic chemists who give us feedback and will say, "Oh, this molecule makes no sense. Oh, this molecule is not stable. Uh, this molecule is, cannot be synthesized." So that's not part of the algorithm. But the, mm -hmm. what we do is that we will come up with a few hundred molecules and we ask our synthetic chemists to evaluate them and see which ones are useful. At a later stage of research, perhaps we can find some way to incorporate the chemist's expertise into the algorithm itself. Okay, thank you. I think there are no more questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ho, for an online session on AI in drug discovery and answering thank you very much. patiently. Thank you. So now I request Dr. Divyashri to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Rajalakshmi. Uh, hello. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Rajalakshmi uh, Gaddipati, the lecturer from the School of Computation and uh, Mathematics at Stuart University, Australia. Uh, Dr. Rajalakshmi has more than 17 years of overseas and international tertiary teaching experience. Uh, Rajalakshmi did her MSc and MPhil in biochemistry from India and worked as a lecturer in biochemistry for, in the years 2003 uh, until in the year 2003 until 2006. From 2007 to 9, she worked as an IT corporate trainer for CC++. Uh, SQL Server with Microsoft .NET certification. She did graduate diploma in biotechnology from Swinburne University in the year 2010 from Melbourne. Uh, she did PhD in bioinformatics from Victoria University in the year 2015. As a part of her PhD, she has conducted research in Melbourne University and Monash Universities on various pharmaceutical drug interactions which are used in the treatment of cancer, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. She has developed a web-based simulation tool to study the lipid protein uh, interactions, which plays uh, a role in cancer, diabetes, and atherosclerosis drugs. She won a three-minute thesis, thesis People's Choice Award for her PhD thesis from Victoria University. From 2016 till date, she has been working as an IT lecturer, uh, I mean bioinformatics lecturer at Federation University and Charles Sturt University. She teaches cloud computing, big data analytics, master's pro uh, she supervises master's project, uh, subchain management, and internet of things and database systems. So far, she has supervised nearly 250 master's projects. She's a member of Federal University of Information Systems Research Panel. Her research interests are in applied sciences like Internet of Things, Big Data Analytics, Cloud Computing, and Blockchain Technology in Hospitals, uh, Healthcare Systems, Agriculture, and Food Processing. So, uh, so it's 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 a great pleasure and uh, honor to welcome uh, Dr. Rajalakshmi, uh, and uh, ma'am, please uh, proceed with the talk. Thank you, Divya. I hope you all can hear me. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, I'll be sharing my presentation shortly. Thank you for okay. giving me this opportunity. I hope we can you see all your slide. Yes. Yeah. Thank. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, so from last one and a half day, I believe all of you have been overloaded with uh, biomedical sciences. Um, so my presentation uh, kind of overlaps with the previous presentation with Dr. Hu Lang. Um, 
so just to make it little bit different from whatever you have heard i'm trying to give you a um, bit of information technology basics and the application of information technology along with artificial intelligence uh, in healthcare and life sciences so much is happening in the research and development of um, covid-19 we could see, see that uh, so what i want to update you with is the recent trends and um, promotional offers available from cloud computing and the recent advancements happened uh, with artificial intelligence role playing in the drug discovery of covid-19 here is the agenda on which i'm going to talk today application of artificial intelligence and i'll introduce you with a bit of technical jargon and we'll talk about the role of cloud computing in healthcare and life sciences and i'll introduce you with cod19 search architecture and also with bit of machine learning and artificial intelligence and we'll see few of their applications in uh, the pandemic coronavirus sorry for the interruption ma'am uh, can you make it uh, full screen presentation mode i thought it's full screen it is okay. it okay let me just try is it full screen now yes ma'am yes okay great thank you no worries all right so artificial intelligence as how it has been covered just now in the previous presentation it has its role in multiple projects and the application is also there in um, almost all of the industries right from agriculture food processing transportation healthcare drug discovery business and retail i have listed only few of them but the application of technology we can notice today in most of the industries we heard a lot about artificial intelligence but what brings artificial intelligence into the market today at the back end we have cloud computing internet of things data science machine learning big data and data analytics and artificial intelligence can be applied uh, in the context of a context of pandemic if we have to know the role of ai it's useful in the virus research development of drugs and vaccines and it is also helping the healthcare providers to manage their resources and especially the decision making of the government to introduce new public policies into the country and to manage the entire crisis caused by covid-19 by the end of my presentation i believe you will get an idea on how we could manage this crisis and what's happening around us so here i would like to um introduce all this technical jargon expecting uh, some of you might be from non it background let me start with cloud computing before i start with cloud computing i'll give you a small story or a history with what happened in the case of electricity if we look 200 years back into the history we don't have power electricity generated that was when um, industries were maintaining their own power grid to generate power and manufacture the product in this whole scenario for the business generating electricity is not their product they were just doing it for the sake of running their factory design and manufacture their product after many years there were many power grids and factories could even offer the private connections commercial connections to the industries where the business industries factories have slowly stopped supplying this power or maintaining their own power grid on their premises because the power grids could supply the commercial connections to factories factories could relax because they could get the power now from the outside external third party they don't have to maintain on their own anymore they can focus on their business same thing has been repeated recently in last 10 to 15 years computing has become commercial so the provider which brings computing as a commercial connection is uh, what we call him as cloud computing provider 
So cloud computing offers uh, commercial connections right from uh, the big large scale to the small scale private individual purpose. Students who are uh, who wants to know more about it are most welcome to practice exercises, learn this. And uh, the business who wants to outsource their computing facilities can also use cloud computing. So the interesting thing here is the use of this cloud computing is there right from the small scale to the large scale. And I would like to talk something about Y2K. Uh, most of you might have heard year 2000 problem. In the year 1999, if you could re recollect from the past, database designers, the computational specialists have worried a lot thinking the uses of computer might go out of the industry. That's because there were only six digits given to enter the date, DD, MM, YY. The reason for giving six digits is um, the first database design took place in 1960 in where the data storage, electronic digital data storage is very expensive. So that has been continued until 1999. There was no problem. But when the year 2000 comes, the 00, zero might take the databases to back to 1800 and there might be a data collapse. It has shaken the entire computational industry. However, this problem has been solved and introduced the globalization third era, where most of the scientists across the world have gathered in America, United States, and they could solve this problem. Later on, we all know that we have now eight digits to store the date, DD, MM, Y, 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 Y. So that has solved the digital data storage problem. That was the case when we look back to the year 2000. However, if we now look with the help of cloud computing, the data storage has become much more cheaper. For example, Gmail would give you 15 GB just free storage for free. After that, if you want, you can uh, upgrade. So the data storage has become completely uh, less expensive, available for everyone with the help of cloud computing. If I have to give you a few examples with where and how we are using cloud computing, there are different uh, applications like iCloud, Gmail, and most of the applications we are using today are the causes of cloud computing. So what makes us interesting is even if the technology has been advanced, we have so many technology um, technologies available today. Still, COVID-19 crisis is shaking everyone. So in my presentation, I would like to tell you how cloud computing is useful for COVID-19 research and development. Another thing I would like to tell you is about data mining. And you would have heard about big data analytics as well. Mine the data. We, every single business industry likes to collect the data because they're making money out of it. If I have to tell you how business is making money out of the data, I'll tell you one real time story. This happened in 2009, uh, US. There is a business named Target. They don't know that products are uh, pregnancy women needs along with new baby, newborn baby needs. And also they have many other products, clothes, uh, kids toys, and all of them. Before the business wants to manufacture their products, they wanted to get the idea of how much product manufacturing they should do so that business won't get lost. So what Target did in developed countries like US and Australia, the pregnant women have to register themselves with a healthcare agency so that the healthcare uh, agency will look after the pregnancy women with repeated checks. So Target has signed up with the healthcare agency. They get all the data of how many women are pregnant in the city. 
so that they can plan their plan design their product manufacturing accordingly see the magic how business is making use of the science while this is happening target gets the data of all the pregnant women including the number of women in the city their address and they keep sending the vouchers to attract the sales into their stores so in one home father received uh, the voucher and he has claimed a case on target saying my daughter 16 year old daughter is not pregnant but target is uh, promoting false vouchers to encourage pregnancy in the teenage women this case was going on after few months father realized the girl is actually pregnant father doesn't know but target knows this is how business is using that intelligent factor and has become business intelligence just to gain their profits of course later on target has to say sorry to the father and pay them money whatever it is what did they do basically they have collected the data and they mined it they analyzed it just to make money this is the case in any industry not only in business and retail once there is enough data collected it can be analyzed for future predictions that's what is happening in data mining data analytics and artificial intelligence is making use of it so iot internet of things uh, you, the examples are smart city smart home and the pacemaker the device which is installed into the person's heart and the fitbit all of them are examples uh, for iot devices we have so many iot devices around us today uh, these devices are connected with each other through network and they keep generating the data and this data can be saved in cloud because we know cloud is the place for data storage with less price so iot is also playing role there into in collecting the data cloud is hosting that data data analytics is analyzing that data to make money this is the connection between cloud iot devices and data analytics and in the upcoming slide i'm going to show you a figure where how iot and cloud computing together could be used in healthcare so this is a wireless body area network uh, which is connected with the help of iot the person's body can be installed with the sensor nodes and that nodes communicate with the application in mobile phone once the mobile phone bluetooth is on it is ready to connect and communicate to the nearby devices the data whichever is generating is now available online live for the families to check and for the patient to have a look for the healthcare professionals where iot cloud acts as a central data repository so it's easy it's like a common locker for everyone to make use of with their own passcode so iot and cloud computing are playing a major role in healthcare platforms today so after iot now i'm uh, will be going to look at aws aws is amazon web services what is he offering today for the healthcare and life sciences research aws is one of the major global cloud provider apart from him we also have microsoft azure so aws has already collaborated with the healthcare providers public health organizations and many other government agencies around the globe to study the effect of covid-19 as you have seen in the previous picture the main use of cloud computing is to offer a centralized data repository so they offer hpc consortium high performance computing where researchers and scientists can make use of the unlimited virtual infrastructure capacity most of you might be using hpc 
uh, for molecular dynamic simulations, which may not be supported, but if it is combined with AWS, they have high capacity computer consortium and they offer unlimited infrastructure capacity. Further, for the diagnostic development, they also uh, offer some promotional credits to support the diagnostic research. If anyone is interested, the links here would help you to apply as an institute or as a company for further diagnosis and development on COVID-19. And they also offer the free genomic analysis uh, NVIDIA genome sequence analysis of COVID-19 is available uh, in where scientists and researchers would receive a free 90-day license to access the genome sequencing and they can analyze it further. And they have a machine learning enabled search data set. Um, they offer a public data lake which can be accessed with the help of COD-19 search. This COD-19 search is very similar to Google search or Google Scholar, PubMed, Scopus, whatever database we take there, they all work with the help of machine learning at the back end, the programming, which can match the keyword, user's keyword with the search keyword, and it matches with all the document repositories available in the database, whichever are closely related, those would be given as the search results. The very similar way, AWS, in order to offer a collaborative centralized repository with up-to-date information, they are collecting, they have already collected and they are collecting right now the research articles published in relation to the spread of COVID-19. And they created a central repository which Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Sure. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear us? Take it, thank you. I'm waiting for you. Get it. Ida, it's just a problem. Was it free? Yes, ma'am, you can continue. That, and that data repository we call as public data lake. That public data lake, uh, in order to access that public data lake, AWS has created something as Amazon Comprehensive Vehicle, which is a natural language processor. For those of you who don't know what is a natural language processor, it's nothing but a medium between the human language and the machine language. We all know computers won't understand English. That is why we have this natural language processor works in conjunction with machine learning algorithm to make the search keyword understood by the computer. So for that purpose, in order to access this public data lake of COVID-19 search related articles, this Amazon Comprehend Medical is a natural language processor developed by AWS which uh, provides the information on the treatment, disease, and the timeline, even for the common general public, not only for the researchers and scientists. Most, mostly, um, the data when it is collected would be in its unstructured format. But they, the data can be useful and make money only when it is structured. So the use of machine learning, natural language process analytics comes into the place where this data has to be structured. Now, after they collect the data with the help of uh, public data lake and using Amazon Comprehend Medical Machine Learning process, then they would apply something as multi-label classification model. All the topics associated with COVID-19 would be classified based on the keywords such as virology, immunology, and laboratory clinical trials. So based on that, they classify all the articles and they are saved in Amazon Kendra. Amazon Kendra is a highly accurate search service, machine learning, robust natural language algorithm, which can provide the proper search. 
So if we check the same thing in the with the help of a diagram, we have a public data lake here, which is made up of the articles published across the world. And we have this processed data set here. This would become enrichment. This would be enriched once it's supplied with natural language processor and machine learning algorithm. And the indexed articles would be saved in Amazon Kendra, where it provides all the articles classified based on a model keyword like virology, immunology. And this is our NLP here, natural language processor, Amazon Comprehend Medical which will help uh, people to give whatever article they are looking for. So this is an advancement um, with COD-19. So this is COVID research and development 19 search architecture, exclusively designed and developed by Amazon for COVID-19 research and development. If you have published article related to COVID-19, please go and search after the presentation if your article is lying there or not. And why did AWS has done that? What is their long-term vision in doing that? Hello, ma'am. Can you hear us? Hello, ma'am. This code nineteen. Is there any disturbance? Yeah, uh, like uh, your voice was not audible actually. Okay. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, yeah, it's now fine. It may Thank be you. because of the unstable internet connection. Yeah, could be possible. Sorry That's that. yeah. I'm sorry for that. You can uh, continue. No problem. Okay. So by accessing COD19 research and by doing the literature review, there is a hope that the patient uh, data can be collected, aggregated, and uh, there would be a good progression in the drug discovery as well. And this uh, COD-19 search also, it, it provides the evidence-based topics on incubation, transmission, therapeutics, whatnot. They are not just the articles or people's opinion, they were evidence-based. So it's easy for scientists or the general public to quickly query on uh, or to validate their research, advance the world's uh, the remaining global investigations. That's all about COD-19 offered by AWS. Now, the next topic I want to talk on few of the mobile applications used for COVID-19 tracking and treatment. There are different applications available across the world. Um, every world names them differently. Uh, COVID Safe in Australia, ROG Setu in India, COVID Watch in US, and there are many more. I have listed only few of them. The fundamental idea behind all these applications, what is it doing is as how I have discussed in the past with you about data mining and data analytics. These mobile applications are trying to collect the data from the patients and they will help uh, patients to self diagnose themselves. We all know that the biggest problem today is we don't have enough kits available and the disease is spreading very fast. Apart from technology, nothing else can save us in this fast spreading virus time. Recently, I have come across with one of the mobile apps developed by Apollo Hospital in Chennai. So the app was asking different questions. And after keep on answering the questions based on the answer, the mobile application would divert me to the next question. At the end, the mobile app would suggest whether or not the patient has to see the healthcare provider and how closely uh, the patient is to uh, get the corona infection. So this is possible when the applications are designed to collect the data and at the back end, the application is analyzing it and suggesting the patients 
otherwise with the current world's population it is really hard to track the infection and uh, diagnose or uh, diagnose and make the number of general physicians available to treat this so technology has really helped us and it is helping us users uh, also can share their device Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I think your audio is lost. Oh, my idea was lost. Yeah, okay. yeah, from the last slide, actually. Okay. Um, is is it okay now? Yeah, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Clear. Okay. Okay. So what I said in here, uh, in this slide, is half these mobile applications with the help of data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence have helped us track the patient's location. so that new people will not get affected with the same virus again if i take the example of covid safe in australia we all have um, downloaded this app into our mobile phones if i go for a walk um if any other corona affected patient comes close to me my mobile application will buzz and give me an alarm saying you might have to maintain the social distance that way i can keep myself isolated and still maintain social distance and protect myself even if not all the applications work the same way most of the applications are aiming at tracking the patient location collecting the data analyzing the data through which government can make the public policies due to privacy reasons western countries are collecting anonymous data they don't want to be identified whereas in eastern countries they are collecting the personal identifiable data but the aim of all the applications is the same is to track and warn the patients close by with the help of artificial intelligence patients could even be tracked after the cure of the disease so in here i would like to introduce you with a website health map this is the first website hosted by boston's children hospital they have used ai to scan the whole in social media news reports information technology reports information systems reports and all the keywords search words used by the people and they kind of came up with this prediction before the onset of the disease we all know that uh, the disease started in uh, wuhan china december uh, november 2019 so in december 2020 itself this health map website has been designed with a prediction of how this disease is going to spread so when it comes to this predictions yes ai is going to do uh, help us a lot they have kind of created an early alarm uh, with the potential of happening this disease along with the help of machine learning and ai researchers have also teamed up with many other tech companies to track the disease and because of this we now have uh, the global spread of disease with the accurate number of Uh, patients affected and how many of them have been cured things like that so these red color things are uh, explaining how uh, many countries and the onset of disease in all of them you could also recollect how google maps work with near me app the same technology same logic at the back end of google maps as well so the very same way in the very beginning a uh, health map website has uh, sent an alarm uh, to the entire globe to be careful so even after this we could see how the virus is spreading across and how else 
machine learning and artificial intelligence are helping us to diagnose and uh, customize the medical care to get the better results. The biggest use of artificial intelligence is that it is very fast and it can quickly analyze the irregular symptoms. The dangerous feature of COVID-19 is that the symptoms are not stable and not unique across all the patients. The recovery rate is not again common across the patients and the places. So if we have to gather that much information with irregular symptoms, definitely AI can help and alarm the patients. And it is helping the healthcare authorities also to develop a new diagnosis management. AI can also be used uh, with the combination of computer tomography, CT, and the MRI scan um, for the human body parts. Now, what is the use? When we club AI with one of these medical techniques, the results are more accurate, robust, and fast. And AI is used across the world today, especially mostly in Europe for the drug research to analyze the COVID-19 uh, behavior. And the main purpose of AI is to analyze the level of infection uh, and it can create the clusters and the hotspots, whatever we are hearing around us today. This is a red zone. Please don't go there. And there is a hotspot that is a lockdown suburb. All these are happening because of AI's red flag study uh, through which it has analyzed. In this area, there are many patients in this location. So the possibility of spreading the disease is more. So this kind of studies um, are possible with AI and it can track the track and forecast the nature of virus infection uh, based on the data it has already collected. And it is used in speeding up the drug designing in real time as well. So for the real time is what I have given you the example of Google Maps. You are in a specific location. You want to see the near me. Uh, if you want to check who is the near patient to you, again, um, AI can be used to collect and warn you. And yeah, um, the significance of AI comes where it's much more faster than human intelligence. Uh, accelerate the process significantly is possible with AI. The speed is not equal to human. It's much more uh, quicker. And this company in Europe, uh, Benevolent AI, it's a comp AI company in UK, uh, which has used and analyzed the drugs using AI. They used it to make high order corrections as well, uh, which human body wouldn't be capable of making. They have used AI to screen billions of molecules for the coronavirus treatment. And it's, it's also been noticed in Italy. We all know that Italy is the country uh, which has got a lot of damage because of COVID-19. So during the treatment of many patients, what they have noticed is uh, they try to administer the daily dose of the rheumatoid arthritis drug, baricitinib, along with an anti-HIV drug with the combination of lopinavir and Ritonavir. Surprisingly, the patients who received baricitinib had mostly recovered. Out of 12 patients, seven who were given with lopinavir and ritonavir were also discharged from the hospital. One patient uh, again recovered with the combination of these two drugs alone. Sorry. Seven out of 12 were administered with baricitinib and they all have been discharged. One patient from uh, the administration of lopinavir and ritonavir also recovered. However, the patients who ever lacked the treatment of baricitinib did not recover. This study has been done using AI where they have screened billions of molecules against the coronavirus. And they also come up with this approach a uh, knowledge graph uh, suggesting baricitinib as a potential drug. So 
Benevolent AI is the company name where they have noticed after evaluating 1 billion small molecules for their ability to bind SARS-CoV-2, the protein, um, it will usually take long time, but using AI, it has generated results quickly. So the interesting thing from this graph here, you could see the other drugs are directly acting on this kinase, whereas baricitinib is binding directly to the cyclin G associated kinase and acting also inhibiting the action of uh, JK, which mediates the cytokine signaling by stopping inflammation of the lungs. So AI almost uh, close to accuracy, but I wouldn't say we can just rely on AI. We further have to test it uh, either using uh, the in, in silico analysis or um, the biological experiments to confirm and to conclude that this AI screening is working well. But what the use of AI here is to fasten the process. This is another study in where they have performed a comparative analysis between in vitro and AI based experiments. And they came out with eight drugs in which two of them are approved to treat COVID-19. So in this study, um, artificial intelligence has been used with uh, COVID-19 repurposing drugs. They have selected two independent data sets uh, to, as the learning inputs to generate two AI prediction models. Model one was generated from the known drugs with antiviral activities whereas model two was generated from the 3C-like protease inhibitors. So in here, AI system screens for potential drug with antiviral activities by a cell-based FIP assay. So they have conducted an FIP virus replication assay. This is actually a cat uh, virus. And this AI system, um, this assay results uh, served as feedback for AI. Um, to evaluate the process further. And the modified AI model was established further to screen and to study the results, verify by FIP virus replication assay. As I have said to you, we cannot rely alone on AI. So to prove that they have conducted this FIP virus assay. So with the combination of AI as a step one, screening has been done and then they can uh, study further using an in vitro assay. This is another study which tells us um, how the patient can be monitored with the help of AI and without the help of AI. So this is a comparison study between AI and a non-AI based application. So if we look, uh, the steps are similar. Patient with symptoms would be first monitored by a physician uh, to check the possible match of COVID-19. Samples would be taken, blood test is quicker, whereas the swab test takes two to three days, we all know that. And patient, if it is, uh, if he is close to be affected, then he has to be quarantined, admitted. Now, what's the difference here is the patient can be treated and monitored using an AI-based approach. As how I have explained to you with the help of IOT, healthcare, patient, health can be checked much more in close connection. The very same way, now the patient's recovery phase can be studied with the help of AI. If after recovering the patient again tests positive, he has to be isolated. If he tests negative, he can be cured. If there is no use of AI, then the patient would be um, would not be monitored and treated and the further uh, future predictions with respect to this patient health life may not have a track that's the difference so this study has been made uh, from by reading many articles from pubmed scopus and google scholar using the keyword of covid-19 or coronavirus and artificial intelligence and they have identified seven significant applications of AI uh, for COVID-19 pandemic. And the significant applications are also applied to track the data, confirmed and recovered death cases as well. 
this has been happening across the world around us today uh, for us to get the complete information no doubt ai has helped and to conclude one of the most immediate and impactful applications of artificial intelligence is to collaborate the global scientists across the world academics to guide further and to move the literature faster so that the drug or vaccine discovery is faster than expected there is this ln institute for ai which is also working um, on with this scholar team to bring come up with covid-19 vaccine let's hope for the best if ai machine learning and the technology the combination of this technology with healthcare and life sciences would keep the world at a peaceful place and that's all thank you all for listening to me any questions i'm happy to take now thank you ma'am for your wonderful talk on ai and ml based approach uh, towards uh, the, uh, instructions against covid-19 measures so i would like to ask you a few questions mm -hmm. so you spoke about the technology of uh, implants iot's so what is your view on the privacy and ethics ethics yes we can follow ethics as we mm -hmm. all know uh, there are global ethics set up even for information technology uh there are many organizations worldwide as how we have nih for health we have mm -hmm. uh, associations organizations available for global ethics as well so privacy yes in this generation it is hard to convince the patient to get his data accurately mm -hmm. so that is one of the biggest risks through which ai could not be advanced okay even if there is so much of technology available around us always the problem is the human being mm -hmm. and the cause yeah and um, when it comes to privacy uh, what usually happens is uh, they have to sign on a paper that their privacy has to be set but there are proper cyber security standards standards and privacy measures are already in place to protect the patient's privacy for example in countries like australia and us the patient's records won't even be discussed with the family mm -hmm. unfortunately if a patient has cancer he will be the first person to know okay that's how much they look after the privacy mm -hmm. and Thank you. asymptomatic persons are the most dangerous ones mm -hmm. yeah um, as i said to you covid 19 safe would um, would not so in western countries this privacy is addressed very well where they don't have to tell their name but location is important uh they don't have to give their photo so the privacy is still secured in western countries in eastern countries also it can be implemented through the mobile applications which are private okay yeah so uh, what are the uh, currently uh, you said about the apps tracking apps uh usage in all over the world so mm -hmm. in australia what are the techniques now they are following to control or uh, take measures against covid using ai yeah, yeah. so again uh, the covid 19 safe is the mobile application mm -hmm. that is a standard application which we all are uh, asked by the government to use it if at mm -hmm. all um earlier we don't have much covid 19 test kits available but now the swab test kits are available everywhere and in all the shopping centers some shops uh, without checking the temperature they are not even letting the patients go in and okay. if at all the patient has uh, symptoms uh, he has to be isolated uh, he or she has to be isolated and um the data has to be entered into the mobile application it is kind of mandatory here the health authorities will advise the patient to enter the details into the covid 19 safe mobile application okay so yeah. one last question ma'am uh, yeah so how do you see the future of cloud computing in all areas of uh, the world like uh, even healthcare and other things because uh, yeah. now cloud computing has become an essential part in everything like from iot to devices storage 
so exactly. how do you see the future yeah further how uh, the future is all in cloud <laughs> that's because again yeah that's correct uh, that's because i'll go back to my electricity example i gave you earlier mm -hmm. uh, factories used to maintain their own power grid just to produce the power they're not doing it anymore now if we look mm -hmm. around today, we don't have a single factory which is generating their own power they don't have to because lesser the price they get it from the commercial connection it's more hassle to maintain their own power grid same yes. is the case with cloud computing no business mm -hmm. or no agriculture industry or any other retail industry they don't want to maintain computing on their own end they just wanted mm -hmm. to get it from the cloud it's for two reasons stress free less expensive okay so yeah. it would be like a service based solution exactly it is it is a service based solution with mm -hmm. tutorials and uh, mm -hmm. less expensive easy to use so, already 70% so of the global business is running from the yes. cloud yes. sorry already 70% uh, of the global business is running from the cloud yes yes uh, yeah. so uh, what do you th see as a challenge for us uh, to move towards cloud now like it's like partly we are working locally and mm. few of them are only into cloud so what do you think will be the challenges for others to join the cloud technology definitely, definitely mm -hmm. the security mm -hmm. security and privacy okay if me being a business have to use mm -hmm. cloud i have mm -hmm. to put my data somewhere yes yeah so i'm giving my data to uh, to someone Other. I'm relying on my end. So there are cyber security issues with cloud computing, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if at all, there is a balance comes between security versus money. Okay. Budget versus privacy. Mm -hmm. It depends on the user. What do you choose? So the service also uh, uh, cost based on the service they require, right? Exactly. Okay. With cloud, the biggest advantage mm -hmm. is pay as you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. The business don't have to establish their own servers. Let's say, for example, Vignan University wants to maintain HPC for their research. Now, because for COVID-19, they wanted to do this. They established the entire setup. It will take them mm -hmm. $50 million. Mm -hmm. At the same time, cloud computing is coming into the market saying, forget about your maintenance cost. $50 million establishment fees, you just give us with how much ever you are using. For example, yeah. with HPC consortium, they might charge us $500 per month. Mm -hmm. So where is $15 million? Where is $500? So like it drastically reduces the cost exactly. based on yeah. and one more needs. Thing. Yeah, and one more thing, uh, even if Vignan University has established this server at their end with the cost mm -hmm. of $50 million, they may not use it in the future. Yeah, true. But with cloud computing, they can stop using it the moment they don't want to. <laughs> yeah. So with budgeting, maintenance, uh, cloud is doing really good job. This is where business is not bothered too much about security. Uh, and even for security, cloud computing has come up with certain measures where they can address the customer's concern. Mm -hmm. And doing well, yeah. This is why I said the future is in cloud computing only. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the wonderful session and answering to our questions. So now I'd like to, I would like to request uh, Professor Kripaniti to thank Dr. Rajalakshmi and Dr. Hu. Okay. 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 I am here. I am here. So, my sincere uh, appreciations to Dr. Raglesh Vigaru and also Dr. Ho Ling Nag for uh, taking us to a new field. We are all basically under biology, but we are now jumped into artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the talks by Ho Long and also the Rajalashmi, both of them, though they handle artificial intelligence, they are quite apart. So Dr. Ho Long has taken the chemical aspects 
and uh, ball and sticks and all those things and emphasize it on scoring functions force field based empirical based knowledge based thing and again uh, emphasize it on artificial learning but whether, whereas Radhlishmi madam has done much on the IT based IT based applications particularly in the drug and vaccine design cloud computing she spoke much about the cloud computing and healthcare providers and in both the cases they are uh, providing good opportunity for the participants particularly from whole long uh, this uh, OSC 19 open source covid 19.org our participants can get uh, acquainted with this for their future work similarly uh, Dr. Rajleshmi is also is having another program, Card 19, Card 19 Architecture. So with this, I am quite happy to express me, what is it called, the, 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 particularly we are so comfortable with COVID, but we are not uh, that much familiar with AI. Now we came to know the AI applications are very much essential to, to unfold biological events. Thank you both uh, to Rajleshmi Madam and Dr. Ho Long. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you Professor Kripanati. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Divya Sri to introduce the next speaker, Roger Sherat. Uh, he will be talking on recent advances in evaluation and management of COVID-19. Uh, th uh, thank you, Pranav. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Roger who is an associate clinical professor from the University of California. Uh, so he's current. So, uh, so California, it's a University of California Riverside School of Medicine. And he's also an assistant clinical professor at the School of Medicine and Allied Health at the university. So in addition to being a preceptor for PA and uh, medical students, uh, Dr. Roger was the medical director for the Physician Assistant Sciences program at Loma Linda University. Uh, the medical and he's also the medical director for a sleep lab and the medical director for the Crafton Hills College Respiratory Care program. His teaching experience goes back to his college days at the University of California, Riverside, where he was a tutor in physics and chemistry and graduated the magna cum laude with majors in chemistry and biology. So he later uh, honed his skills uh, teaching the MCAT, DAT, and the USMLE for Kaplan test prep. Uh, this is for all the medical entrance exams. Uh, so after graduating from the Loma Linda University School of Medicine in 2000, he completed a residency in internal medicine, a chief residency at the Riverside County, Regional Medical Center and a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Loma Linda University. So his current practice is in Banning, California, where he is a pulmonologist and sleep physician at Beaver Medical Group. He was formerly the director for intensive care services at San Gorgonia, uh, Gorgonia Me Memorial Hospital. Uh, he lectures routinely across the country at conferences and for medical and PA and RT societies. Uh, Roger is certified in internal medicine, pulmonary diseases, critical care medicine, and sleep medicine uh, through the American Board of Internal Medicine. So his passion is demystifying medical concepts to students. And that's very interesting. And, uh, and here uh, I welcome Dr. Uh, Roger. As a associate clinical professor from the University of Cal California. Uh, professor, you can take over the session. Okay, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So I, t I titled this Recent Advances in the Evaluation and Management of COVID-19. And so let's go ahead and get started. Let's first talk about the pathophysiology and the epidemiology, epidemiology very quickly. This is a screenshot very, very uh, shortly here. This was uh, just taken tonight of the Johns Hopkins um, uh, count dashboard showing that worldwide we are over 10 million officially in terms of infected and globally over, well over half of a million deaths. 
And you can see that map is, is very lit up. I remember six months ago seeing this as little tiny dots in China. And so we have definitely reached pandemic phase. Um, in terms of where we are in the United States, we certainly had uh, flattened the curve a number of months ago. But as you can see here, as we look at the rolling seven day average, the daily new cases, at least in the United States, is picking up. I took the liberty of also looking at daily new cases here in India. And uh, we can see that they have also taken off as well and reaching about 20,000 new cases every single day. Um, if we look at the course of the disease, this came out very early on in published in the Lancet about the clinical features in, of patients infected with the 2019 novel coronavirus. And what we found was a number of different phases. Phase one was this phase before someone becomes infected. And this is the phase where social distancing, physical distancing is very important in terms of preventing infection. But once the patient is infected, there's about a five day period of no symptoms. This is the incubation period. And then phase two takes us up until about the admission to the hospital. That's where the patient develops shortness of breath, usually from hypoxemia, from lung pathology. The third phase is after admission, where rapidly after about a day or two, we have worsening shortness of breath going into ARDS, that is a, a, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then perhaps even intensive care unit and ventilation. So you can see here the, the, tar the terms of how long each of these phases last. When we look at the course of the disease in a little different way, we see there's a population of people, uh, given country, there's an infection that occurs here in phase one, and then in phase two, again, what we see here is about 80% or probably even more than that, because there's, as we're finding out more asymptomatic carriers, but 80% or more are, have, very, have very, very small symptoms. About 20% or less go on to need hospitalization, intensive care services, or be on the ventilator. And that's phase three. And uh, we have focused, at least in the United States and around the world, I can imagine is the same, on focusing on trying to treat people in phase three of this disease. We have many, many more people in phase two and even more people in phase one. And what we focused on is phase three. This is at the end portion of the disease, at the end portion of when patients need medical attention. And we've coming up with medications that we can use to try to turn around a ship that has already sailed for quite a few miles by the time they end up at the hospital. Uh, and then finally, uh, death in hopefully the minority of cases. But the thing I want you to focus on here is the 80%. It's the 80% that never end up going to the hospital. And the question is, well, why is that? And is there something we can do to reproduce the 80% in those 20%? Well, the answer to that question really lies in the cells of the immune system. It is the body's immune system that takes care of that. And we found out very early on that there may be something going on with how the coronavirus affects the immune system. There are two parts of your immune system. There is the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system Hello, does not require formal knowledge of the antigen. It can Hello. go through and detect non-self from self. These are cells, for instance, like the monocytes and the natural killer cells. Hello, Professor Roger. Yes. Yeah. You Can me? you make your slides a uh, 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 slideshow or a full screen mode? It's a little smaller, actually. Okay, okay. Let's see what I can do here. Yeah. How's that? So, uh, no, it looks the same. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank okay. You. So, uh, let's see if I can make it even bigger. There we go. Um, so the monocytes and the natural killer cells are part of the innate immune system. They go around and they eat up foreign substances and then present it to the adaptive immune system. It's in the adaptive immune system where memory cells are made, where cytotoxic T cells are made. This is what we see in terms of memory cells. Um, it seems as though, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, that coronavirus or COVID-19 is inhibiting the innate immune system. Now, generally speaking, young adults, children have very robust innate immune systems, but very poor adaptive immune systems. And the reason is clear. They haven't seen as many antigens as an adult has seen. In the adult, it's the flip. 
you see the adaptive immune system in adults being very robust, but their innate immune system as being weaker. And we believe this may be part of the reason why we see higher mortality as the age increases. So here was a article or a clip from an article from the Asian Pacific Journal of Allergy and Immunology that talked about these two parts of the immune system. And they, they, they say here that based on the accumulated data for previous coronavirus infection, it's the innate response that plays a crucial role in protective or destructive responses. Um, they go on to say that active viral replication later results in hyperproduction type 1 interferon and influx of neutrophils and macrophages, which are the major sources of pro-inflammatory cytokines, with similar changes in total neutrophils and lymphocytes during COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 probably induces a delayed type 1 interferon. Now, this is important because this might explain why it takes a week or so for these patients to have such damaging symptoms. They say here, in addition, no severe cases were reported in young children when innate immune response is highly effective. These facts strongly indicate that the innate immune response is a critical factor for disease outcome. Okay, so what else is involved? We found out very early on that oxidative stress is also very important in terms of COVID-19. Now, oxidative stress is caused from reactive oxygen species, which we'll talk about. For those of you who remember your biochemistry, there's calcium dysregulation, myoapatosis, mitochondrial alteration, abnormal muscle adaption, impaired muscle regeneration. All of these things are associated with oxidative stress. And what we're going to see is that the patients that are the most at risk for ending up in the hospital with COVID-19 are patients with hypertension, renal disease, type 2 diabetes, elevated BMI. These are the very patients that have high levels of oxidative stress. When I was first starting out with patients six months ago, I was telling my lung patients that you are the ones that have to watch out, the patients with COPD, the patients with asthma. The, these were the ones that we thought were going to be the ones that were most would be most impacted because we thought this virus was going to act like the influenza virus, taking out lung disease. That has not been the case. Patients with asthma and COPD have not noticed a disproportionate increase in hospitalizations. Rather, it's the ones that we didn't think were going to have a problem, those with hypertension, those with elevated BMIs, overweight, things of that nature. And this is what, where it boils down to is, as you may know, in the matrix of the mitochondria, we have sugars, fats, and proteins entering the citric acid cycle and NADH coming out in terms of reduced electrons. It's those reduced electrons going to the electron transport chain that allow it to come down that electron transport chain, pumping protons into the inner membrane space and allowing for the production of ATP. However, when this cycle gets overwhelmed by excessive amount of carbohydrates, for instance, then you get this last electron acceptor, which is oxygen, which is supposed to be transferred into water by the exception of four electrons. When that doesn't occur, and, and when there's one, two, or three electrons that come on instead of four, you form something called hydroxy radicals, hydrogen peroxide, or superoxide. And, and here's the problem with that is this species known as superoxide is, is a very deadly um, a molecule because when it accumulates, it can damage mitochondrial DNA. It causes reactive oxygen species. And so in, imagine we have a patient with hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes, where oxidative stress is already occurring in an in unmitigated amount and the patient's scale is out of balance. Now put on top of that, the whole idea here of oxidative stress from COVID-19. And how does that happen? Let's, let me show you. Uh, ACE2 is the receptor for the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus. ACE2, however, is more than just a receptor on a cell. It, it is coated throughout the endothelium. It is coated throughout the lung uh, tissue. It's also seen in other uh, tissues of the body. It's more than just a receptor and a way for the virus to get into the cell. For you see, ACE2 is an enzyme, and that enzyme converts angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1-7. And that angiotensin 1-7 
is very important as well as angiotensin 2 because angiotensin 2 promotes superoxide and angiotensin 1-7 helps break down superoxide. And, and in addition to all of that, when COVID-19 attaches to the ACE2, the ACE2 enzyme, that ACE2 enzyme gets deactivated. You have a reduction in angiotensin 1-7, an elevation in angiotensin 2, and that causes a burst of superoxide to occur. Now, imagine in somebody who doesn't have a problem with oxidative stress. They're able to absorb this hit, and they're able to, with the systems in the body like catalase, glutathione peroxidase, as we'll talk about, and, and other systems, to take care of this oxidative stress. But in a patient who has excessive oxidative stress and is leaning on the edge of the cliff, this infection is enough to knock them over. And you can see that that oxidative stress is going to cause excessive inflammation, and that excessive inflammation will go on to cause thrombosis, as we'll show. In addition to this, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 attracts PMNs, which are neutrophils. And these neutrophils also release superoxide as well. So you can see here is a perfect storm, if you will, of superoxide reactive oxygen species. Now, what we have to quell this or to get rid of this, as you can see here, we have oxygen and we add four electrons, we will eventually get to water over here on this side. If there's only addition of one electron, we get the very dangerous superoxide molecule. Two, we get hydrogen peroxide. Three, we get hydroxy radicals. All three of these mid-species here are dangerous to the body, and the body has a way of getting rid of it through its antioxidant system. As you can see here, catalase, which requires iron, will convert hydro uh, hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Um, superoxide dismutase, which requires copper, zinc, and manganese, convert superoxide into hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. And then the very important glutathione peroxidase enzyme, which requires selenium, will convert hydrogen peroxide into water. And so these systems are there, but if they become overwhelmed in a highly oxidized system, uh, which, we, which we see very commonly, um, this can cause a lot of problems. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the uh, pathophysiology about what we think is going on. So the hypothesis is, is that SARS-CoV-2 causes a reduction in ACE2, as we talked about, increasing the amount of angiotensin 2, reducing the amount of angiotensin 1-7, increasing the amount of superoxide. It's this increased superoxide that causes endothelial cell dysfunction. Now, this, these endothelial cells coat the entire vasculature of the human body. And so you can imagine there is a lot of endothelial cells. These endothelial cells are coating the collagen underneath and the von Willebrand's factors underneath. These procoagulant factors, once, the, once they become uncovered, promote thrombosis. And so it's very, very, very important that the endothelial cell remain intact and prevent those factors from causing thrombosis. But if there is too much oxidative stress, the endothelial cells will become inflamed, will start to be oxidized, and that will release prothrombotic factors, for instance, von Willebrand's factor. And uh, this was just published two days ago in the Lancet Hematology that showed that this very hypothesis has been proven correct in that they noticed in patients with COVID-19 on the regular floor versus in the intensive care unit that there is an increase in von Willebrand factor. There is an increase in procoagulant thromboses that we see. And this was recently shown in a New England Journal of Medicine article about a month and a half ago, which compared autopsies in patients with COVID-19 to controls. And it showed that there was nine times the amount of microthrombi in the patients with COVID-19. So in fact, here is the article, pulmonary vascular endotheliolitis, thrombosis and angiogenesis in COVID-19. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, they say here that in patients who died from COVID-19 associated or influenza associated respiratory failure, they see diffuse alveolar damage. But notice what they say here, that alveolar capillary microthrombi were nine times as prevalent in patients with COVID-19 than in patients with influenza. So clearly, a, 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 an attack on this thrombotic process is going to be key to quelling and reducing the morbidity and mortality 
of COVID-19. Here's a photomicrograph of a histological slide. You can see here very clearly the white area is where the alveoli and the air exchange is. And you can see that this is the infrastructure and superskeleton of the lung. And these are capillaries. And instead of being open and allowing red blood cells to pass, you can see here clearly that they are thrombosed. So no blood can travel through here. And if no blood can travel, oxygen exchange cannot occur. The patient becomes hypoxemic. And this is what the CT scan looks like. We see ground glass opacification. Even though the lungs themselves have beautiful compliance, even though the lungs can expand clearly, you have significant hypoxemia. And this, this is the reason why it would explain perfectly why we're seeing patients coming into the hospital, able to talk on their cell phone, order their next meal in the hospital, yet be severely hypoxemic. Uh, so what is the management of this? So the only medications, at least in the United States, that have been FDA approved and have been shown using randomized controlled trials of any sort is uh, one of them is remdesivir, of course. This is out of the ACT trial. Initially, they planned to enroll over 1,000 subjects, but they had a quick peek at the data to make sure that there wasn't an endpoint that was met because it would be unethical con to continue that study uh, and give placebo out if there was an endpoint. Well, there was an endpoint that was met. It was a modest endpoint. It showed that there was an improvement in time to recovery, 11 versus 15 days. Um, there was a mortality endpoint that was not met because it was just above statistical significance at just greater than 0 0.05. Um, not a game changer. Have to treat 28 patients to save one life, although one life is always valuable. We would love to have this number needed to treat number much less than that. One area where you cannot give remdesivir is in renal patients, GFRs less than 30. Um, out of the UK, the recovery trial showed that dexamethasone at six milligrams intravenously daily for 10 days was helpful. Actually, much better results here. Those that were just on oxygen never needed to treat again, 29, not a game changer. But on the ventilator, these are the severest patients, there was an improvement in mortality from 40.7 down to 29%. That's an absolute risk reduction of about 12 to 13 points translating into a number needed to treat of nine. That is significant, especially considering since dexamethasone is pretty dirt cheap, as we would say in the United States. Um, and therefore you could save literally one life with just a few dollars. Uh, what about antibiotics? Well, these patients rarely have super infections, I would say about 10% or less. So uh, if, if it fits, go ahead and start antibiotics, but there's no antibiotic that's gonna cure COVID-19, you could consider getting a gram stain culture and sensitivity. Uh, I would use the guidelines. If this is a patient that has been in the hospital for more than three days, you might want to cover uh, uh, bacteria like Pseudomonas or MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, what about NSAIDs and acetaminophen? Well, again, if we're trying to inhibit the body's response to the virus, that may give us untoward um, uh, situations there. So we may not want to do that. I think blood clots are the central issue. Uh, the question is, is what do we do with it? We know that blood clots are the issue. We don't know how to deal with it. Some people are, are saying that if the D-dimer level is greater than one microgram per liter, that that indicates an 18-fold increase in the odds of dying, and the patient should be not on just prophylactic uh, doses of anticoagulation, but full doses of anticoagulation, such as a heparin drip or full dose anoxaparin or low molecular weight heparin. And these are coming out of uh, journals like The Lancet. Um, there's also some evidence that would seem to indicate that patients should be discharged from the hospital on full dose anticoagulation. We've all heard these very unsettling stories early coming out of China where patients would be recovering and be discharged from the hospital only to go home and be rushed back to the hospital a number of days later and die because they thought they were recovering, but in fact they didn't. This seems to fit with the idea that even though the lung problem may be done, the vasculitis issue is not done, and patients may be developing thrombosis, again, because of this oxidative stress that we're seeing. Uh, convalescent plasma is the addition of plasma from patients that have recovered and presumably have antibodies against the virus, and infusing that as a passive immunity tool in patients that are battling the virus currently. Uh, we don't have any evidence that this works. It is currently available, at least here in the United States, only through a 
a trial. And so you have to sign up to be a member in that trial to be, to be able to give that. Um, there's a number of trials that are ongoing and we usually can get that through our local blood bank. I'm sure that, that is, there's other ways of getting that as well outside. Uh, again, no randomized controlled trial uh, data that I have seen at least on convalescent plasma. So let's go back to our, our graph here. Again, phase one is preventing infection. Phase two is taking these patients that have that have tested positive for COVID-19, okay? But yet they're not sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. Here, I believe, is a missed window of opportunity. The patient is positive. We know that they have the disease, yet they're not sick enough to be in the hospital. And there are potentially millions of these people. What can we do with these people to lessen their progression to phase three? We know a lot of work is being done in phase three. I fear not much work is being done in phase two. So what are the things being looked at? I think vitamin D is really high up there on the list. Look, there's a lot of evidence that patients who do poorly have a lack of vitamin D. And those patients that do well have, have no deficiency in vitamin D. Is that a associative relationship or a causative relationship? I don't believe we know the answer to that yet, but vitamin D keeps coming up over and over and over again. We also see, for instance, people of dark skin moving to high latitudes. These are the very people that are at highest risk for getting vitamin D deficiencies. We know that it takes more time in direct sunlight in dark skin people to have enough vitamin D made. And so these are the people that are at risk when they move to high latitudes. Um, these are the very, very people that we are seeing that are having a higher risk of mortality in COVID-19. There was a study that was recently done in England so it's not a healthcare access issue like it is in the United States necessarily, because in England they have free access to anybody. Uh, yet, despite that, we're still seeing disparagement um, um, mortality in, in, in people of dark skin versus light skin. Uh, we can look at the example in Finland. At the early aspect of this disease, the Finnish people had, had great mortality. Uh, uh, data compared to their uh, Nordic partners like Sweden and Norway. And then it seemed as though it was getting into uh, uh, patients of African descent and it spread very rapidly. And, um, and there was a problem there, especially in Helsinki in the early part of the outbreak. So the question is, is what would explain these sorts of things? Vitamin D is something that seems to be coming up over and over again. And so the question is, is what's the risk of putting people on vitamin D? It's a fat soluble vitamin again, but I've rarely seen somebody overdose from vitamin D. So I think there is an argument that's being made in that, in that uh, arena. What about vitamin C? Vitamin C is an antioxidant, and that would make sense based on what we've just talked about with the oxidative stress. But vitamin C has also been looked at at Paul Merrick's group out of Eastern Virginia Medical School in its possible role in sepsis, number one, and also in ARDS. These are things that are not foreign diagnoses in patients that are admitted with COVID-19. And so there may be a, an added benefit to high doses of vitamin C and what the optimal dose is, we're not sure. Uh, quercetin is a um, supplement that is seen in a lot of vegetables, like for instance, onions, that has been looked at in Ebola. There's a study that is ongoing be, uh, with, with a researcher from Canada and also from China that's looking at quercetin in uh, COVID-19 in China. Why would we mention quercetin though? Quercetin is something known as a zinc ionophore. What is a zinc ionophore? It's a something that allows zinc to come into the cells. That is important because we have some good data that shows that high levels of intracellular zinc in vitro can inhibit coronavirus RNA dependent RNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that reproduces itself in the cells. If you can shut down RNA dependent RNA polymerase, you can essentially shut down viral replication in the host cells. So that's important again. And then and the next thing we have there listed is zinc. What about the BCG vaccine? Well, there is an associative uh, benefit with in countries that use the BCG vaccine, such as India, that have a, a, a tenfold less um, mortality than, than in countries that do not use the BCG vaccine. Notably, what are some countries that do not use the BCG vaccine? Uh, Italy which we all know had a very bad uh, run of coronavirus earlier this year. And of course the United States, which is having its time right now. 
So I think that more is looking into that. The theory is, is that the BCG vaccine, which is designed to boost the adaptive arm of the immune system may have bleed over into the innate. And the WHO has looked at this and has found that even in populations where the BCG vaccine is given, not only do they see a reduction in tuberculosis related diseases, but they also see a reduction in other diseases as well, like yellow fever, like um, uh, Ebola, things of that nature. Other things that are being looked at is proning. So this is where we simply have the patient sleep on their belly, uh, lie on their belly. I've been doing this personally. I take care of COVID patients personally, and uh, this is what we've been doing. And I can tell you that the difference in oxygenation is astounding. I've had patients go from a PaO2 of 60 on 100% oxygen all the way up to 260 simply by turning on their belly. Uh, this is something obviously that we've been doing for many years in patients who are ventilated. It seems to have a benefit in those patients that are not ventilated. Uh, a, a vaccine, of course, is is being looked at. Uh, there's there's many different types of vaccine, and each country is is doing their own program. Um, N-acetylcysteine is something I wanted to mention for two reasons. Number one, because N-acetylcysteine is a compound that can recharge glutathione peroxidase, which we talked about earlier as being one of the mechanisms that the body has of getting rid of oxidative stress. So N-acetylcysteine is good there. But there's another reason why we talk about N-acetylcysteine. You see, when the endothelial layers become oxidized and damaged, they will release von Willebrand's factor. Von Willebrand's factor is a monomer which polymerizes and then traps platelets, and this is what forms the clots. These clots, when they analyze them, are very platelet-rich, and they have many von Willebrand's factors. So the way that von Willebrand's factors connect with each other is through something called a disulfide bond, and these SS bonds can be broken with thiol groups, SH bonds, if you will. Well, an acetylcysteine is rich in these SH bonds, and so it's well known actually that intravenous infusion of an acetylcysteine can act as a thrombolytic. And in fact, right now at the prestigious Sloan Kettering Institute in the United States, they're looking at a trial in COVID-19 where they're infusing intravenous N acetylcysteine at six grams per day, continuous infusion to see whether or not this improves the outcomes. Because we believe that these microthrombi that we just showed you in the New England Journal of Medicine is key in the etiology of the hypoxia in these patients. And that's really what's killing them. Famotidine is of course a uh, H2 blocker and they are looking very similar to what we've just heard about here in the last couple of talks about using computers to look at the structures of drugs to see how they might interact with the virus and prevent its binding. Well, famotidine is one of those drugs that came up in that, uh, in that uh, analysis and they are currently using famotidine in a trial, not at the, at the typical dose that we would normally use, but at nine times that typical dose to really overwhelm and see whether or not it, it prevents uh, viral infection. Let's take a look about a couple of other things here real quickly. What about immunity enhancing intervention? So I wanna to talk to you real, real briefly about hydrothermal therapy. Um, as we said, not much is being done to help patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19 before they get to the hospital. Um, this takes me back to 1918. In the United States, during the 1918 pandemic, um, obviously this was before the discovery of penicillin. This was discovery before the, F the FDA did not exist. There were not randomized controlled trials looking at drugs. And the hospital system in the United States was more of a patchwork. There was um, the military hospitals, as you, as you may remember in 1918, many of the troops were coming back from World War I and were bringing back the, uh, the pandemic with them. And so a lot of them were treated in the army hospitals. The army hospitals were using the aspirin, which had just been discovered in 1899. They felt that the fever was what was causing a lot of the mortality. And so they felt that if they could treat the fever, they could help the patient. So they were getting high doses of aspirin trying to treat the fever, which we now know, of course, is the immune system's cry for help to try to fight the virus. Uh, there was about a 6% mortality in the army hospitals. Uh, so that was not very good. There was a certain subsect, however, of hospitals on the East Coast predominantly called sanitariums. These sanitariums were run by the Adventist church and they had a strong belief in natural remedies. And so one of the things that they did, and this was not completely um, in a vacuum, 
Uh, it was it was uh, just a few years later that a Austrian doctor by the name of Dr. Joreg was using malaria. So he was intentionally infecting his neurosyphilis patients with malaria because he found that the that the fever itself that was induced by the malaria was actually killing the the spirochete, the the neurosyphilis. And since they had the treatment for malaria, they would simply treat the patient's malaria after the neurosyphilis have been eliminated. And that year, uh, in 1927, Dr. Yorick won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discovery. It was the very next year, 1928, that we had the discovery of penicillin. And of course, the medical world has never been the same since. But if you look back at how we used to treat this, and if you look at these sanitariums on the eastern coast of the United States at that time, they used very similar heat therapy to heat the body up and then to cool the body down using something called hydrotherapy. They took patients outside into the sun to get sunlight, vitamin D, they were breathing fresh air. And so this, these types of techniques that were being used in these patients, had they had an overall mortality during this epidemic of one to 2%, which was a fraction of the 6% that was being seen in the army hospitals. And so that made me think of what is it that we could do now for these patients that are diagnosed, but not yet sick enough to be in the hospital. And I think that another look needs to be done on hydrothermal therapy, because I think, number one, this very well could be helpful. There's very good data that shows that hot and cold therapies can enhance the immune system. And it seems as though, as we talked about at the beginning, that this virus tends to reduce the innate immunity of the host. Um, so that's number one. Number two, this is something that could be scaled up very, very rapidly. We don't need a factory. There's no, uh, there's, there's, there's no patent. There's no factory that needs to make the medications. All you need is hot and cold water, and you immediately have a treatment that you can export to any country of the world. Um, anyway, that's hydrothermal therapy. In terms of placental mesenchymal cells, they're looking at natural killer cells. Uh, one of the things that I would be remiss to mention if it wasn't is sleep. I'm a sleep physician, so sleep seven plus hours per night has been shown to dramatically reduce the amount of infections that patients can have. And then, of course, nutrition and oxidative stress. And our final slide here is about oxidative stress. So here we have the gentleman on the left. This is the type of gentleman that we see very commonly now in the intensive care unit whereas the gentleman on the right, we're not seeing in the intensive care unit. And why is that? Because of oxidative stress, obesity, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease. So how do you go from the left, to, from the right to the left? It is by a high carbohydrate glucose fructose diet. It is from a diet that is high in red meat. It is from a diet that is high in saturated fat. How do we go to the gentleman on the right? It is using whole grains, fiber, nuts, um, un unsaturated fatty acids, fruits and vegetables, vitamin C and E, beta carotene, flavonoids, legumes, protein, starch, phytochemicals. These are the things that are going to put us in a better stance when the coronavirus comes around to our neighborhood. And with that, I will uh, take any questions. I, I hope I did not go over time. Thank you, Dr. Roger, for the excellent talk on the fundamental mechanisms of COVID, as well as explaining the therapies available to treat COVID-19. So there are a few questions. So can we take uh, vitamin C or D supplements uh, like a common uh, usage as daily basis? Yeah, so I take vitamin D on a daily basis. I take about 5,000 units, though that is not for everybody because everybody has a little different uh, situation. Some people work outside more than I do. Mm -hmm. Some people mm -hmm. um, have more sun exposure per year than I do. Somebody might have a, a lighter skin or darker skin than I do. So what I would recommend is taking a supplement. It's probably uh, not unsafe to take at least a thousand international units a day. But the key is, is to get tested at some point if you feel that you're at risk for vitamin D deficiency and have it checked. You would be surprised how many people are going to be deficient. And then if it's checked, make sure that you're in the right range. And if not, adjust the amount of supplementation. In terms of vitamin C, you know, I think you can safely take a thousand milligrams a day. 
uh, orally. Uh, the type of vitamin C that we're talking about when you get to the hospital, though, is intravenous, and it's obviously more difficult to do that. I would not recommend intravenous vitamin C as an outpatient. Thank you. Uh, so how do you see uh, we can we standardize the treatment for COVID? So in uh, like every part of the globe, we are treating them differently. So how do you see the treatment option can be standardized? I think the best way to standardize treatment is to look at the actions of these medications. Now, politically, it's going to be different. Like I can give you an example right now that remdesivir, uh, for instance, which is made by uh, Gilead, has been bought up by the federal government. And uh, unless Gilead or the federal government allows non-exclusive licensing of that medication to be produced in other countries, it's not going to be possible to standardize uh, remdesivir. On the other hand, you may have um, vavipavir uh, in, in your country or different, a different medication that does the same action as remdesivir. So I think what we're going to have to say is we need like we would say in antibiotics, we need a third generation cephalosporin, but leave it up to the availability of which third generation cephalosporin. So we need a antiviral medication to stop the replication, but we'd also need, I believe we're going to need to have a, a, a steroid, whether it's dexamethasone, solubedrol, solucortef. Um, and so I think that's probably the way we're going to have to do it. There's going to be so many different types of medications, though, in those classes that I don't think that's going to be standardizable. Thank you. So the patients who are recovering, so so what kind of uh, things can be taken care by them to recover? Like uh, if a patient is infected by coronavirus and then he goes to treatment and then he's recovering. So what are the chances to get reinfection or how can we manage that? We don't know exactly yeah. how many of these patients are becoming reinfected. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't seem likely that they should be reinfected, but there are a couple of caveats. For instance, if there is a significant mutation in the virus, it's possible that the antibodies formed at the first infection would not be sufficient to prevent a second infection. Number two, is it possible that we are calling somebody with a recurrent infection as somebody who was positive, then they turn negative, and then they turn positive again? The problem with that is, is that we don't know if those, that negative test was a false negative because we are seeing substantial false negative tests in our uh, nasal swab, uh, um, reverse transcriptase PCR tests. These are tests that um, can be falsely negative especially when they're only coming with a sensitivity of 60 or 70 percent. So we don't know enough yet to know, for instance, if someone can become reinfected. Um, I can tell you that from personal experience with other patients, not myself, but uh, I've, I've known of at least somebody who was known to be positive and we checked antibody titers and the antibody titers went from, and I'm making these numbers up, but it was like a titer of let's say uh, nine, a magnitude of nine. And after a few weeks to a month or so, it dropped down to about three to four. So we're seeing a decline in the number of, or the titer of antibodies. Whether that translates into less immunity, we don't know that clinically yet. But remember now, above all else, COVID-19 is a coronavirus and coronaviruses cause colds. So you and I both know that we've caught colds more than once in our life. And uh, if there were multiple different types of coronavirus, well, we could always get them again and again. And so it's possible that just based on that, number one, we've never made a vaccine for the common cold. That's number one. And number two, we've caught multiple colds multiple times. So it's certainly possible that this is something that we could catch multiple times. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what is your view on uh, traditional medicine uh, in treating COVID, any comments on that? Yeah, so the, so I, I, love, I love that question because people will say, well, you, do you have any evidence? Do you, there's no evidence that that traditional medicine works. And yes. I'll say yes, but then I will turn around and say, well, you have no evidence that it doesn't work. Uh, and so mm -hmm. what it boils down to is what's the risks? That's what it boils down to is what are the risks in doing this? And for hydrotherapy, for the things that I'm seeing that may work, we've seen it work in the, um, in, in the 1918, 1919 pandemic, at least in those sanitariums. If it, 
if it, if it potentially has a role of working and we've got some good data from a uh, in vitro and also in surrogate markers, for instance, monocytes and, and T cells, that it enhances the immune system. It's going to be a long time before we have prospective studies to be able to say definitively, yes, it works. Yes, no, it doesn't. So what do you do between now and that period of time when people are dying in front of you? Uh, and, and the risk of doing this is pretty low. I say, try it. And um, I'm willing to try anything, even if it's labeled traditional medicine. You know, sometimes um, the reason why we did things 100 years ago was for a good reason. Yes. Right. So how do you see uh, treatment of interferons to treat COVID? Any comments yeah, so on that? It's all about timing because at the beginning mm -hmm. of the infection, you want a strong immune system to mm -hmm. get rid of the virus. Mm -hmm. But it's that's the exact opposite of what you want down the line when the patient comes in with hypoxia and is admitted to the intensive care. You want immune suppressants. And, and, so, and this was made clear in the recovery trial. If you noticed when they gave the six milligrams of dexamethasone in the three types of patients, there was the patients that did not require oxygen, in which case the dexamethasone had no benefit at all. And then the patients who were on oxygen, which had a slight benefit, and then the patients that were on the ventilator, it had a huge benefit. And so it's not just a matter of getting the drug into the patient, it's getting the right drug in the right patient at the right time. And it has to do with understanding about where the evolution of that virus is in that particular patient. So interferon, which is part of the immune system, I think makes sense early in the, in the disease, but might not mm -hmm. make sense later on when you're trying to quell and quiet the cytokine storm. Thank you for the clear explanation, Dr. Roger. So, so COVID is infecting lungs and other tissues. So when a patient is infected, so what are the other parts of the human body which also gets infected by COVID? Yeah, so they did uh, a study on this about three months ago where they looked at monkeys. And uh, since then, they've actually looked at, at human autopsies. And generally speaking, this, there's no place that this virus really doesn't go. This virus goes okay. everywhere. It's in the lungs, it's in the heart, it's in the GI tract, it's in the liver, it's in the kidneys. It's even in the reproductive organs. It gets into the brain, the spinal cord. It's, there's really no place that this virus doesn't go. And, and that makes sense when you think about the fact that once it hitches a ride in, in the cardiovascular system, basically there is no place that it doesn't go. So the virus sounds so scary. Yes, and but, uh, but our immune system is, uh, is successful most of the time. And what mm -hmm. we can do is try to find a way to make our immune system successful all of the time. And that's when we're okay. going to start to reduce uh, mortality. So you have any final uh, thoughts how uh, everybody should maintain their immunity to take? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of what I had to say was on that last slide is look at, look, mm -hmm. at what we're, look at what we're eating. Look at the people that are affected. So let's learn from that and see that the people that are being affected are the people with, who are overweight, have diabetes, hypertension. And if you are already in that category, then make changes to reduce your risk there. You can't change your age, you can't change your, your gender, but you can certainly decide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stack the deck in my favor and lose a couple of pounds, maybe um, change my diet. You know, one of the things that, that we can talk about very, very quickly is, um, is soda. Um, I don't know what you call mm -hmm. it in your country, but Coca-Cola, right? Yeah, so yeah. high amounts of, 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 of fructose, high amounts of high fructose corn syrup. And we, we know from the research that high fructose corn syrup uh, inhibits the body's ability to make vitamin D. Uh, we know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, high fructose corn syrup also charges in with a huge amount of carbohydrates into that electron transport chain and can cause oxidative stress. So if there's one thing that you want to do to reduce your oxidative stress and to um, improve your ability there and, and improve your vitamin D levels is to cut down on high fructose corn syrup, which is, I'll tell you, the number one country in the world that consumes more high fructose corn syrup than any other country in the world is the United States. And right now we lead the world in terms of mortality. Okay. So there are... Uh... 
couple of questions to end our talk. So, uh, how did the researchers come up with uh, vulnerabilities with patients like uh, who has a pre-existing condition like diabetes or cardiovascular disease? So, how did they come up with that? Like they are having high risk to get infected okay, so by COVID. We, so there was a great article that was published in JAMA in New York City. And what they did was they looked at the population of people in New York City and compared it to the people that were being hospitalized. And this is mm -hmm. very important. The, 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 popul the proportion of people with lung disease in New York City was about the same numerically as those being admitted with COVID-19, which means that lung disease was not a predisposition which blew our minds mm -hmm. because we all thought that people with lung disease was going to be the people who are getting admitted. No, that wasn't the case. What we saw was maybe in, in New York City, 10% uh, of the people had hypertension, but the people among people being admitted, it was 40%. I'm making up those numbers, but that's kind of mm -hmm. the range of where it was. So we compare the people that are being admitted to the people in the population. And this, we saw that the people being overrepresented in the people being admitted was diabetes, hypertension, um, and, and kidney disease. So those are the ones that we saw were being overrepresented. Okay. So the final question. So how do you see the susceptibility of the virus? Uh, there was an article saying uh, certain type of blood group gets less infected. So how do we take that based on the statistics? Can we consider or should we go beyond that? Very good question. So there's a type A, type B, type AB, and type O. And, and it, it actually dovetails very nicely into what we just talked about because, and by the way, that was not a peer reviewed paper, but I believe that what they found was real. Um, what we know is this, this is really interesting, is that type O blood, which had the best survival um, versus type A blood, which had one of the worst, Type A people actually have more von Willebrand factor. Type O has less von Willebrand factor. And so it would seem as though that that would fit into the hypothesis that SARS-CoV-2 causes more oxidative stress. Oxidative stress causes inflammation of the endothelium. And then the endothelium, once it becomes damaged, releases the von Willebrand's factor and thrombomodulin and all these things that are underneath the cell. If you have less von Willebrand's factor to release, i.e. type O blood, then you're not gonna get as much thrombosis, which might lead to a better prognosis. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Rogers, for a detailed explanation to all our queries, as well as taking a presentation in a wonderful manner. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, sir, for giving a wonderful presentation. It was very useful to many of the viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let's move to the next speaker. Dr. Prachwal. Hello. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Speaker. Yes. I'm here to introduce Prachwan Nandekar, senior scientist, Krodinger. Dr. Prachwan Nandekar received his master's and PhD from the Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research, Naipur, in 2010 and 2015, respectively. He is a recipient of the prestigious DAAD fellowship to perform research at Hyderabad University. He has four years of postdoctoral research experience in using various types of molecular modeling techniques to understand biological processes. His research interests are computer-aided drug design, quantum chemistry, and multi-scale molecular dynamic simulations. He has been associated with many eminent scientists and has experience in a diverse range of research projects implying protein DNA as drug targets. He holds 29 publications to his credit. On a final note, he is also a positive and enchanting individual, and we are grateful for his presence among us today. 
Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Prajwal. Sir, please. Hello. Uh, thanks, madam. Uh, am I audible or are you able to see the screen? Yes, sir. We can see the screen as well as we can hear you clearly. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for the information. So, uh, again, uh, just uh, after Dr. Rogers' talk, I think it was really, really informative and uh, we got a really great perspective in doctor's point of view. Uh, and uh, he also mentioned a lot of uh, information which were missing in our day-to-day -day, uh, discussions on COVID-19. So, so I will be talking in the presentation mostly about uh, uh, computational modeling or computer-aided drug designing. But before proceeding to my talk, I would like to thanks to the organizers who gave me opportunity to present uh, uh, information about uh, molecular modeling or computer-aided drug designing in Schrodinger's perspective. So thank you very much, as well as uh, for all those participants who are there to listen to the talk. Uh, so, so let's start uh, discussing something about uh, computational modeling. So my talk will be most, more focusing on molecular modeling perspective. So I will, uh, I will not present any case study on the COVID, specifically COVID drug designing, but uh, I will give the overview of computer-aided drug designing techniques and how one can use those techniques in their virtual screening protocol to get the most optimized results. Uh, I'm sorry. So is there something going on? No, sir, you can continue. OK, thank you. So uh, here you can uh, have my information, which uh, Madam already uh, gave a, a short introduction. Uh, thanks for it. So I am working as a scientist in Schrodinger, Bangalore office. So here is my email ID, which is uh, the name at the rate Schrodinger.com, like Prajwal at the rate Schrodinger.com. And my mobile number is also given here. So in future, if you have any uh, doubts related to the presentation, as well as uh, computer aided drug designing protocols or whatever you have, so you can always feel free, feel free to contact me in future. So with this, I'll proceed for the presentation, which uh, mostly I'll just uh, briefly cover uh, what is a background and why do you need uh, these techniques and what is the thing called molecular modeling. So as I expect, like most of the people uh, who listen presentations from yesterday, they are already pretty well familiar with the technique called molecular modeling. But uh, I mean, the question comes at very basic level, why do we need it and what is it? So it is nothing but just uh, kind of the way of looking at molecules in 3D view. And so, you know, in, uh, in the world, everything is present in 3D. So before we used to draw the structure of molecules in 2D, which is on with the help of paper and pen, but uh, that is also kind of a model of any uh, system. For example, the benzene ring, one can draw uh, six carbons joined together by alternate single bond and double bond. So that's ca called as representation. But whenever if you want to study its properties, like how it looks, so what is a bond distance, or how what is the uh, angles and all those things, we need to have full information about it. So that the way of representation is 3D representation. And with the help of molecular modeling uh, visualizers or editors, we can basically draw those molecules and study their 3D properties. For example, you can see here the molecule which is rotating here is a molecule called paracetamol. So it's a very well known drug molecule to all of us. But if you see it has uh, topologically also it has various characteristics like benzene ring you have which is more planar in nature. Then there are some functional groups which are uh, not exactly present in the plane like this oxidal carbonyl group or methyl group. So these are the various type of uh, aspects we can look into the structure of molecule in 3D view so that to get a better idea about it. So this is what molecular modeling starts with. And then once you get this 3D idea, you can, uh, it will help you to get the better information about this particular molecule or whatever um, structure. 
so uh, that's the reason because you can see everything in 3d at the atomic level so that is what why most of the molecular modeling softwares are also called as molecular microscope means you can look actually at the atomic level so with this uh, like i would like to show what is the power of this technique like you can see here there are two videos basically this is nothing but uh, showing the molecular dynamic simulation trajectory of a uh, water so here uh, you have a representation of water molecule at center red is oxygen and white colors are for hydrogen so this is a water molecule and we have simulated this water molecule using uh, computational algorithms at the temperature at room temperature which is 298 kelvin and you can see this uh, yellow color dotted lines are nothing but the hydrogen bonding which is present with surrounding water molecule so a rest of the all this uh, um, atoms are basically other water molecules which are present in the surrounding and you can see at room temperature why water is present in a liquid form because it makes around three to four hydrogen bondings with surrounding water molecules continuously basically that makes the water in liquid form but when you simulate the same thing at boiling temperature let's say 94 degrees celsius which is uh, 368 kelvin and you can see here suddenly this particular water molecule is not forming four hydrogen bonds so now it is forming three or two hydrogen bonding so it itself explains like because of this hydrogen bonding capacity at particular temperature water can have different state like uh, uh, liquid state or gaseous state so in gaseous state the, this hydrogen bonding will further reduce if we increase the temperature so the take home message from this is this is the power of molecular modeling methodologies or software basically the molecular dynamic simulation methodology so one can explore it up to that much level means you can explain such properties also for any matter or so how to in, in include all those things into the our field uh, which uh, is mostly a drug discovery so this is what uh, i mean the molecular modeling is and uh, historically if you see from where it started so it has been, it has started long time back uh, by the scientist called martin karplus in late 60s 1960s so he gave the concept of this molecular modeling and force fields so afterwards uh, it took around 30 years to develop this field and various research laboratories were uh, started implementing the concept of force field and molecular modeling molecular mechanics into their research project with the help of again this is with the help of computers so uh, uh, the first successful example which was report, reported based on this computer aided drug designing was by Abbott Laboratories and they have developed uh, uh, specifically HIV protease inhibitor uh, against this HIV protease pro uh, protein basically. So uh, it was the exam classical example of structure based uh, drug designing in which uh, they looked into 3D structure of protein first time and then they started uh, developing a molecule against uh, this particular protein. So that was the classical example uh, which you find everywhere uh, if you try to search for the history of computer aided drug designing. But so it was in 19 uh, basically 80s uh, sorry 1990s it was uh, but then afterwards uh, once they got the successful example as output it, all almost all bigger pharma companies they picked up this methodology and then they started working on computer aided drug designing and everybody wanted to incorporate this methodology cad methodology or use of computers in their uh, drug discovery protocol. So, and then there are many such molecules which are out in the market now, or many are in the process, which uh, uh, which are uh, which has gone through the process of drug uh, computer aided drug designing. Again, one of the classical example of it is Tamiflu. So, this is also an antiviral molecule uh, against influenza, and it is called. It is basically a neuraminidase inhibitor developed by Roche Pharma so and i mean this list continues uh, and nowadays like every molecule which is, which comes to you or comes to the clinical phases has uh, has been passed through this methodology means every pharma company is working on such things like computer aided drug designing 
so mostly uh, i mean in in the computer aided drug designing the idea is to know the more about structure of biological target and in our case it can be protein it can be dna rna or any other thing like even polymers or other thing so uh, with the help of basically my molecular microscope we will have a chance to look into the inside of this protein uh, protein or biological target and we can see how active site looks like and it is more or less resemble to the lock and key model of uh, which we have like we have lock and we have a key but if you want to design a new key you must know what is uh, inside the lock and how it looks like from the inside and here molecular modeling uh, visualizer helps us to see everything in the 3d what is inside and what is at atomic level so if you come to know about basically the lock what is inside the lock we can efficiently design a key and this is what the whole concept is for example here you can see uh, you have uh, let's say protein structure and binding pocket and based on the properties like where are the hydrophobic regions where are the hydrogen bond acceptors where are donors whether there is a charge moiety present inside the lock or inside the protein we can efficiently design a key or any uh, drug molecule against that particular protein so this is what the whole concept is so mostly this concept is applied in the methodology called molecular docking which is faster enough in which we can basically take a protein structure we can see where the binding pocket is and how it looks like what are the different properties of the binding pocket and how it looks like basically so that uh, the key can fit inside it and then we perform molecular docking of billions of compound inside the protein structure and out of those billions of compound we try to see how those all interact with the protein target and based on the optimum interactions or binding uh, docking score we can select a few molecules as a heat molecule against this particular target which can have many interactions with the uh, protein and then we further optimize that molecule by performing several substitutions and keeping those interaction points constant the idea is to increase the binding of any molecule to the protein and once we get the final molecule from our all virtual screening protocols we go for the synthesis of this particular molecule so now you you have a powerful tool to basically see how a molecule binds to the protein target and you can choose a particular heat molecule based on docking score or binding energy so once you get such information one can proceed for synthesis for limited number of compounds and not thousands of compound so this is what is the history and uh, to uh, keep this thing in the mind and to use that methodology uh, i mean heavily in the industry or in academics two scientists basically richard frischner and william goddard they came together with the vision of developing new medicines and materials using this advanced computational techniques and how can we basically use the uh, uh, computational power whatever we have at most level for designing of this better compound and of course it all we do all those things to betterment of mankind means our health or quality of our life so they started developing the software and they gave name of uh, another scientist called erwin schrodinger so erwin schrodinger is a guy who gave the concept of quantum mechanics basically and he uh, because richard frischner was a is a computational chemist so he gave the name of software by the name of scientist called schrodinger so this is what the history of schrodinger is they started uh, developing with the one module uh, in the software and then uh, eventually it was in 1990s they started developing this software module by module and now after 30 years it's almost a big molecular modeling suit which has all type of uh, options to study molecular properties or uh, it will help you in designing drugs as well as materials or as well as data analysis so everything is covered now inside the suit for example it is divided into various small sub suits like for example pymol if you have heard of it's a very powerful visualizer which uh, which is uh, recently acquired by schrodinger then there is a suit called biologics for example if you are working on vaccine development or antigen antibodies or you are working with pro proteins or dnas 
or rna so it's a biomolecule so that those biological molecules if you want to study we have a special suit called biologics then if you are exclusively working on small molecular drug discoveries then we have all modules kind of present in the small molecule drug discovery suit then if you want to study materials also the option is present in material science suit so materials means everything like uh, whatever is present here has a mass is called as material so i was surprised to know even isro or boeing are also a uh, customer of material science suit which um, basically is showing there then uh, in our chemo informatics or in our day to day life we create lot of data and that to analyze that data we need powerful tools uh, for data analysis that is mostly chemo informatics data for that we have discovery informatics discovery informatics suit so i'll just give a brief overview of which type of module so basically there are many such modules which are present in the suit and one can just think of okay i want to do this thing and i'm pretty sure like you have a module present to do whatever you think of so in the field of molecular modeling you just think of doing something and for that tool should be present in the schrodinger suit so next question like there is no question of okay whether i can do it in schrodinger suit or not so definitely answer will be yes the only thing you need to know which module that's it so there are many such modules present in it with the with their uh, little bit familiar name i must say so for example there is a module called macro model if you are dealing with big structures or molecules you can perform energy minimization or modeling of those uh, molecules with macro model means macro and modeling so uh, then there is if you are dealing with ligand molecules ligand molecules are generally a small molecules small organic compounds or natural products so you can uh, deal with such molecules in ligand preparation called lig prep then if you are dealing with specifically protein we have protein preparation wizard then uh, if you are interested in calculating ADME properties or pharmacokinetic properties of molecule we have option called quick prop then glide is one of the well known uh, module available with schrodinger it's uh, a very well known uh, for molecular docking then for homology modeling or model building we have prime model then for pharmacophore mapping it's a phase pharmacophore mapping then there is um, another module called energetically optimized pharmacophore it's very much a unique product available with schrodinger this is called e pharmacophore and there is another methodology called uh, incorporating flexibility into the receptor without going to md simulations the module is called induce fit so basically it induces uh, the structural changes in the protein because of presence of ligand then you can also incorporate quantum mechanics in the docking the module is called qm polar raised flag and docking then for pk calculation well known module is epic then if you want to analyze the binding site of protein there is a module called site map so i'll just not take much time but it's like there are many such modules including shape screening confirmation generation then qm mm if you have heard of quantum mechanics molecular mechanics hybrid then 3d qsr core hopping to find out new cores if you are dealing with microcyclic compounds natural product compounds so there is another separate module if you want to study more detail about ligand binding site and water hydration free energy so we have water map so there are many such tool like even uh, if uh, you want to perform bioisoster replacement or if you want to perform uh, enumeration of a library based on synthetic feasibilities and all so we have basically everything like including even fragment based drug design so every module is present the only thing one need to decide what i want to do that's it and for that you will find the modules so the obvious question comes like because uh, as far as my experience this is very much particular with schrodinger like it has almost all type of modules present in it but uh, if you compare with the other software suits but question comes like why do we need that many modules so the answer is like answer lies in the complexity of drug discovery so drug discovery is uh, as such everybody knows like uh, drug discovery is very very complicated process it's more or less like finding uh, this star molecule is kind of uh, this is a star molecule which is basically a drug molecule which ha which should have good efficacy good safety profiling it should have stable stability and it should have lot of good pharmacokinetic parameters also it should so 
satisfy so here you can see the matrix like not all molecule possesses this property you never ever get um, ideal kind of drug molecule which is uh, not toxic or it should have high efficacy so it's all about compromising little bit about you need to look for thousands of properties and out of thousands of properties you need to decide which properties i should focus more on for example you can get a efficacy for any molecule but safety profile can be can in some cases safety profile is not very well so you need to compromise little bit okay for example i want to go with the molecule which is less toxic in nature but it should give a good uh, biological activity for example even your paracetamol molecule which we are we have been using it from 100 years but still it has a, though it, it it efficiently reduces the fever but still it has many uh, toxicities like hepatotoxicity if you consume it in a high quantity so means it's all about finding such a uh, molecule which uh, should pass all those things which should have some less toxicity or we have many properties which one could one need to compromise for it and we need to find that molecule and it is very 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 difficult in this uh, scenario so to make this process easy at least with the help of computers with the help of various software we can at least get the idea of this molecule beforehand before going to for synthesis or biological activities so that is the reason why we need that many tools so the overall idea of using computers is to make the process faster so in the current state of art in pharma industries or in any drug discovery uh, industries like you can see uh, they used to believe initially on less number of heats that uh, uh, which are generated by mostly medicinal chemists so medicinal chemists uh, they, they just uh, based on their intuitions uh, they used to design molecules let's say uh, these numbers are uh, kind of hypothetical numbers but it just give you idea about what could be the rate so initially they could uh, design let's say 2000 molecules and they go for synthesis and the chances because the, again the because the 3d information is not involved here or they did not even see where is the protein structure how it binds and all those things which is possible only through computers or computer aided drug designing methods the chances of those molecule to pass through all those filter all those complex filter is very very less and even they were able to put the molecule into clinical trial the chances of failure is again more because you never know at which stage it is going to be fail but with the emergence of cad methodologies we uh, we increase the size of funnel basically size of funnel from few thousand compounds to few billions of compound so with the help of computer again it is possible to screen that many com compounds uh, by using this rapid algorithms and various prop by applying property filters and various predictions so with this predictions basically we can uh, reduce those false false negatives or false positive compound from our screening and we could only focus on true positives or uh, something called true negative so uh, again our idea is to reduce as much as garbage from the our data set and get the only reasonable molecules out with the help of computers and with the help of molecular modeling methods so so recently this few billions is uh, showing there has successfully screened 100 billions of compound using this uh, computer aided drug designing methods so if you incorporate this rationality into the screening protocol we will end up with the molecules reasonable molecules in the clinical trials though the number will be less but still those were promising so still in the clinical trials there is a 30% chance of any molecule to get passed through it so for example any three molecule you put into clinical trials which uh, the only one molecule could pass to the final up to the final stage and rest two molecules will be failed so that's the overall chance of clinical trial so we don't want to take that risk so whatever money is involved on those two molecules which were failed basically that is the loss for company so that's that's the reason why we don't want to uh, take a risk and put any molecule in the clinical trials we want to put only reasonable uh, which should pass all those tests at the end so if you see overall drug discovery phases this is very well known uh, slide i must say like uh, the overall tenure of drug discovery which is around 12 to 13 years of time period and 
around 2.5 billions of usd it is required it's basically huge money in indian uh, uh, currency if you see it's 18000 crore of money which is involved in in general drug disco uh, discovering new drug molecule so here the point which i want to emphasize on is uh, the drug discovery pathway we have like two different phases so phases means initial phase of drug discovery uh, and development phase which is highlighted in blue color and another one is the orange color which is basically clinical phase so clinical phase is the must do thing in which one could not skip anything or one could not uh, do with the structure of molecule but the initial phase of drug discovery which also requires around 40% of overall budget as well as the lot of time like 5 to 6 years of time on an average so but in this phase the beauty is as a researcher we can play with the structure of molecule we can design as many as possible compounds we can test them we can screen them we can optimize them the message is we can do all possible things with the structure of molecule in the initial phase of drug discovery only but once we put molecule into clinical phase we basically can't do anything in further modifications of this molecule we just need to analyze how drug molecule behaves inside the body or whether it shows the activity that's the uh, i mean that's the matter of clinical phase so we cannot skip that one but at least we can work uh combinedly on the initial phase of drug discovery now, and uh, if we are somehow able to reduce this 6 years to let's say 1 year or 2 year that will be the huge huge gain or huge saving of money uh, in in case of drug discovery cycle so this is the idea like in only in initial phase of drug discovery we can use all possible techniques like bioinformatics techniques then target identification techniques you can use all type of methods like docking pharmacophore qsars or whatever is you can use in the by you can use with the help of computers one can use all those things in initial phase of drug discovery and later if you are sure about okay now this molecule passes through all those screens one can put it into clinical trials so that's the idea of it so this is what is the theoretical background of drug discovery phases and how one can uh, use uh, various techniques uh, to try to reduce uh, this time period or the money involved in it so to show the world or to the pharma industries like yes this computer aided drug designing methodologies work so schrodinger uh, has also entered into the drug discovery uh, research before it was just a um, software company who provide software solution to drug discovery researchers but uh, afterwards uh, many scientists uh, from pharma industries were claiming that uh, this method doesn't work or like that so uh, taking this as a challenge schrodinger itself started the drug discovery unit and started working on the various drug discovery projects out of that many projects i am going to present one of the project which gave the successful example out of it so they picked the target called acetyl coenzyme a carboxylase so i hope everybody has heard of at least this in the name of this enzyme in our plus 2s mostly uh, so this is basically the enzyme which is involved in uh, fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid metabolism and it has very prominent role in uh, liver fatty liver syndrome which is called as nash disease nash so this was very hot target in that time uh, in the pharma industries and many pharma industries were working on this target but nobody could get the success uh, uh, because of certain reasons uh, maybe because of uh, the not full proof protocol or at some times the molecule got failed in the pharmacokinetic uh, process or in the clinical phases so this was very tough target at that time when uh, schrodinger thought to work on this and they thought okay this is the type of opportunity for us if we prove that uh, if we get the good molecule uh, for this acetyl coenzyme carboxylase uh, protein target then we can prove that yes care methodologies works and how it works so they can establish a protocol for designing the studies so basically they took this as a challenge and they started working on it so because they have um, they have a facility of looking at uh, molecules or proteins in 3d so they started exploring this uh, particular structure of uh, protein 
uh, called acetyl coenzyme carboxylase which is abbreviated as acc so they looked into the protein structure and they found like the protein structure has basically two domains one is ct domain which is carboxyl transferase domain and another one is biotin carboxylase domain which is bc domain and surprisingly they came to know about uh, that all of the efforts were done based on the ct domain before so and uh, people uh, ignored basically this bc domain but uh, after analyzing all those things uh, basically schrodinger scientists came to know that okay bc domain also has a potential to be a druggable target though uh, it's a part of this complete protein and it can have a allosteric type of modulations on the ct domain so that's why they thought okay because everybody else is working on ct domain and we also work on the same domain the chances of getting failure is more this is what we learned from the history so uh, but if you see like bc domain on which nobody works so nobody explored the potentiality of bc domain whether it gives you good results or not so let's try doing it and let's see whether it works or not so this is what uh, they thought and they started exploring this bc domain and they found yes it has really good role in the uh, allosteric modulation of the acetyl coenzyme carboxylase in which in this particular project they have used all type of methodologies which are available with the schrodinger so they have analyzed the binding pocket various possible binding pockets of the bc domain using site map tool so site map is the tool to analyze binding site so basically it maps the site uh, binding site of the protein so using this they analyze where are the hydrogen bond acceptor groups where are the hydrogen bond donor groups and all other types of uh, properties in the binding pocket which helps them to basically uh, design a molecule against this particular target so um, that's one of the tool but they have also analyzed uh, various type of water hydration states which which are present in the binding pocket for example this is the sorafen molecule which is binding to the bc domain of protein and this uh, red color or yellow color or orange color uh, spheres which you are seeing are the water molecules and red color means something which is danger so those water molecules are not favorable or not uh, happy inside the binding pocket so using water map as a tool they could analyze which are the high energy water molecules that can be replaced for the further drug designing so just little bit in detail about this water map tool so let me uh, tell you that water map is one of the very premium tool of schrodinger suit and this is very very much popular in the pharma industries for their drug designing projects so you can simply do a google search uh, using uh, google scholar and you will find there are number of citations for the water map and many people are working on it uh, for the efficient drug designing so what is basically water map is water map is nothing but the mapping of water molecules inside the binding pocket so mapping means uh, means one need to see where are the water molecules that can be placed inside the binding pocket and whether those molecules are stable or whether those molecules are unstable so here for example you can see wherever you find this green color spheres are the nothing but a happy water molecule means stable water molecules so stable means they have sufficient number of interactions with the surrounding for example they are present in hydrophilic environment to make various hydrogen bonding interaction with surrounding residues so because of those hydrogen bonding interaction it makes water stable there means happy there so if there is another water molecule which is shown in red color so basically that's the unhappy water molecule so unhappy means it doesn't have any uh, interacting residues present at this position so doesn't have any hydrophilic environment means that there can be a hydrophobic environment so because of that hydrophobic environment uh, water molecule doesn't form any type of uh, contacts just like a uh, oil droplet in the water it doesn't form any contact with the water that is why it gets aggregate so the same thing happens with the this red color water molecule which is not able to make contact so it makes this water molecule unstable 
so the whole idea is identifying happy and unhappy water molecules so wherever the idea of designing further molecule is wherever we find happy water molecules we don't touch them we don't want to change their positions we don't want to replace them but wherever we find unhappy water molecule we can design a molecule our uh, drug molecule in such a way that it can be replaced with any other hydrophilic uh, or uh, any other hydrophobic group so this is what you can see here on the uh, from left to right and top images like uh, once you identified those water molecules we need to develop a molecule in such a way that it should replace this orange color red color water molecule so you can see as the molecule started growing means started designing you will get the biological activity so initially it's 10 let's say 10 micromolar then as you grow towards the red water molecule uh, biological activity increases and as you go further like bottom images from left to right you can see as it grows molecule grows uh, to the full displacement of this red color water molecule by some other hydrophobic group which can be mostly hal halide or halogen so you can see you get a better biological activity now it is in a single digit nanomolar and this is the activity what we were uh, we always expect from any good type of molecule to show the better binding and better biological activity so this is what is the basics of uh, water map and how it can be used so other than that uh, they have also used uh, large scale virtual screening of millions of compound using molecular docking which is glide mole based molecular docking and generating various pharmacophores for this particular molecule uh, against bc domain of the protein so they have used the phase module for it to develop this 5 point pharmacophore which looks like this and so uh, the idea is using all those poss uh, possible techniques they have screened many of such uh, millions of such compounds and they at the end they got um, final molecules as a heat molecule in micromolar range of activity but uh, as you know the micromolar range of activity is not really sufficient for any molecule to be a drug molecule or to put it into clinical trials so but at least it was the first time they got something new against the bc domain on, on which nobody has worked before so they were pretty much happy about it that at least they got some uh, initial molecule which they can take it further for the further optimization with some micromolar range of activity so they were tremendously happy about their project and they were because and afterwards they proceeded further for the further optimization of this molecule using all those uh, possible tools including water map and binding free energy calculations then uh, pharmacokinetic prep property calculations like using quick prop and with this all exercise they end up with the molecule in nanomolar range which i have showed so you can see the structure of this molecule and their interactions which are almost all interactions were maintained with more number of uh, additional interactions and finally they got a molecule with a nanomolar range of activity which is single digit nanomolar like 2.1 nanomolar so they were so now they got a really good molecule against this particular target for bc domain and then they basically uh, tested that molecule for various type of uh, target potency studies then cell line studies then pharmacokinetic uh, studies these all are experimental studies not now not predictions but experimental so before it was all predictions using computers and finally they got all parameters for these all in vitro studies within the range acceptable range and when they basically form the co-crystallized structure of it they solved the crystal structure for this particular molecule and they were very very much happy to know about it like they got the same exact resemblance with whatever was predicted using computational methods so it means the experimentally somehow it was proven that those methods predicted the correct structure which was again kind of validation so afterwards basically um, this is what uh, they got this molecule and overall if you see the complete protocol so basically they started their uh, project with around 1.3 millions of ideas ideas means nothing but the design structures so it is not at all really possible to synthesize that many structures 
at any high throughput method so uh, the rational thing is use of computers or computer aided drug designing method so using all those method they end up with the molecule in micromolar range so 8000 nanomolar is 8 micromolar so they were ha happy happy about it and they they pick this as a heat molecule and further optimize means further design that molecule and again use uh, the uh, computer aided drug designing methods using schrodinger suit to screen those molecules and around 100 compounds were synthesized and tested and out of which they found a molecule in some three digit nanomolar which was again kind of good they considered it as a lead molecule and further optimized this molecule means further redesigned that molecule using the same scaffold and uh, again by the use with the use of cad methods and experimental techniques they got a final molecule with single digit nanomolar activity and finally uh, they applied for ind approval and they got it means they could put this molecule into the clinical trials now so this is what the complete story in which schrodinger was involved with the collaborating partner as uh, nimbus discovery uh, for experimental studies and the sur most surprising thing is they could able to finish all those pre clinical studies including computer aided techniques as well as experimental techniques in just 16 months of time period so you can see here how uh, the timeline proceeded so just in 16 months of time period they got a ind molecule approved which they can put into, into clinical trials so initially means in traditional way of drug discovery we 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 have seen like it requires five to six years of time and now it got shrink to just 16 months which is not even 1.5 years so you can see how much time it saves and uh, ultimately time is the money so the money involved in the project is also getting saved tremendously so uh, means this is what the uh, mm, this is what the power of basically collaborative effect uh, of all those uh, experts from various fields they came together and use computational methods very efficiently to get the good molecule out of their drug discovery protocol so that's what is the power of this technique if we if we use it rationally then we will definitely get a good molecule as output so then uh, at the end because schrodinger and nimbus was a small companies like schrodinger is software companies and company and uh, nimbus was the cro contract research organization and they did not have facility for clinical trials so they sold the complete project this acc project to guy lead pharma so basically guy lead is the huge pharma giant in usa so they uh, basically they acquired this complete project for clinical trials for around 1.2 billion uh, us dollars so 1.2 billion as such is a huge money they invested on this particular uh, molecule because they saw the potential in it that uh, it will not fail afterwards so this is what is the power the money invested uh, by nimbus and schrodinger was just 1.2 millions and within a time period of 16 months they got thousand percent return from this particular project so that makes like uh, the business very much efficient in just one year of time you got that much return so this is what the business model of uh, schrodinger now so other than along with software we also get uh, got involved in the many projects with many pharma companies for their drug discovery projects so out of which uh, two molecules are already uh, fda approved with edgewas pharma and many of such molecules are present in uh, drug discovery or preclinical or clinical phases you can see here there are many such collaborations which are going on with sanofi takeda and all those companies uh, other than that uh, we also have our own uh, drug discovery research going on which is uh, solely owned by schrodinger so those molecules are also in the discovery phase um, so the currently molecule which i am talking about is uh, basically this molecule which is now in phase two clinical trial and i hope it will be passed through the phase three also and we will have this molecule as a drug molecule as output so other than that most uh, striking thing is uh, we have collaboration with spark spark is basically nothing but the r d unit of sun pharma which is a indian company so they are also they also have collaboration with us and we are working with them to get a good molecule as an output on neurodegenerative disease so basically if this project gets successful then we will have the first indian drug molecule in the market 
so so far we don't have such molecule any new molecule from india but uh, if you see if they get success it will be the first molecule so uh, other than that in covid perspective like there was a uh, news um, with how big pharma companies are working on covid uh, but quietly so in which like uh, there were many big names novartis takeda and gilead so other than that schrodinger is also there with them uh, for their drug discovery projects and providing all type of computational support to these pharma companies uh, for covid 19 drug discovery and uh, most happy news is uh, all companies are working on non ip basis means they will not claim any ip uh, ip on this molecule so that's one of the reason why schrodinger was involved in it uh, because schrodinger don't want to get money out of it it just uh, kind of social service uh, along with um, all of those pharma companies so uh, i hope they will get uh, success for this uh, particular uh, target i mean uh, this covid 19 pandemic situation so hopefully uh, i'll see a molecule how it gets out amongst all these collaborations so other than that how it all happens is uh, basically because of high throughput virtual screening thing like you know uh, the complete space chemical space which is estimated for small molecule is around 10 to the power 60 number of molecules so if uh, if you have come across this figure if uh, 10 to the power 60 is the huge chemical space but uh, i mean it is basically unimaginable for anybody to design and screen that many compound but that's just a chemical space but uh, the idea is we have that much chemical space means number of chemicals available to screen for the any drug discovery project so so far schrodinger has screened 100 billions of compound but again there is a far way to go ahead so uh, how to screen that many compounds so basically without efficient use of computer aided techniques it is not at all possible to perform such uh, high throughput uh, virtual screening at this scale uh, you need to use really really huge computer systems for it so in which schrodinger has basically those proprietary products like glide Docking in Glide, we will have different type of algorithms, which is mostly needed for such kind of high throughput virtual screening. So, for example, if you are dealing with billions of compound, and uh, if you wait for one compound to dock, uh, which requires, uh, let's say, five to ten minutes for each compound to dock, just molecular docking. So that is not at all feasible to screen billions of compound. So to screen those billions of compound, we need to have a efficient algorithm, computer algorithm to screen that many. So one of such algorithm is high throughput virtual screening, which is present in the glide. And it just take one second per molecule on one computer. So means uh, one second means basically it is very, very, very fast algorithm and there are various type of uh, uh, algorithms like high throughput virtual screening standard precision and extra precision virtual screening uh, which one can use to screen various type of uh, molecules against the any protein target so it is all possible through the rational drug designing as well as efficient use of computers and efficient algorithms so this is one of the example. The, another example is uh, just like, uh, for example, we do molecular docking. There are several softwares available to perform Dr. molecular Prichard. docking. So yeah, please. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, we are uh, running short of time. Uh, yeah, this is last slide. Wind up in, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. So, uh, for example, uh, simple molecular docking. One can use many other softwares also to do molecular docking. But the crux of research is every molecule requires different treatment for example uh, molecules small organic molecule like paracetamol needs different treatment big peptide molecules need different treatment microcyclic compounds natural product compounds covalent binder so the idea is every comp every molecule is different and it needs different treatment so this different treatment basically lacks in most of the software but at least schrodinger is uh, with schrodinger we are fortunate enough to have these various algorithms to treat different type of molecule so this is just one example but there are many such example present in the schrodinger suit uh, maybe we can discuss it some other time if you want to have with this I would like to acknowledge my team 
we are a team of eight member who are working um, around the clock to help our customers and users to provide all type of support scientific support technical support so other than that uh, again before concluding the topic uh, like uh, just if you feel like schrodinger software is really interesting and if you want to explore it so we also provide it uh, one month of free evaluation which normally cost few lakhs if you are if you are going to buy it but we provide it for uh, one month for free with all type of training support and all type of query solves uh, so but the only thing is uh, you should have compatible uh, computer for example at least i5 or i7 uh, with 4 gb of ram so and we also provide it for the departmental desktop only not for the personal use because our idea is to get software used by as many as people if you are interested in it so you just need to go to schrodinger website and create your account which is basically registered yourself or you can directly write an email to shelvia which is our business development officer so it's shelvia at the red schrodinger.com so please feel free to write her as well as me so my email id is also here with this, uh, uh, I just uh, conclude the sessions. And again, I, I want to say sincere thanks to the organizing committee and all participants who, who listen it uh, very calmly. So I'm happy to answer your questions if you have any. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Dr. Prachwal, for the wonderful session and an overview for drug discovery research. So there are uh, many questions, but due to time consent, We'll take a few questions. Mm -hmm. So there is a question like, uh, does Glidart Mastro provides uh, pharmacophore modeling tools? Yes. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there is a tool called Face Pharmacophore, and even there are different type of pharmacophores, like ligand-based pharmacophore, protein-based pharmacophore, protein ligand-based pharmacophore, active site-based pharmacophores, or e-pharmacophore. So everything is there. Again. Uh, I'm saying this thing that you think of something in molecular modeling and the option should be present in the software. Okay. So uh, there is one more question. How about uh, homology modeling and the efficiency of the models constrained uh, using softwares? Because uh, about 20% of the proteins have been solved structurally. So how mm -hmm. efficient if a model is predicted through software can be efficient? Yes, uh, this is kind of very general question, but uh, I would say different software has different accuracy algorithms. So uh, at least with Schrodinger, if you find a better template structure based on uh, sequence similarity or sequence identity, the chances of getting more reliable structure is always more. Means you will get uh, exact structure if you get the good template structure. So it all depends on the template structure. Okay, sir. So there is one more question, like if the ligand bound protein PDB is unavailable, can mm -hmm. water map predict that are uh, differentiate between the free and bound states? Yes, uh, because water map also includes MD simulation as a method in back, back end. So yes, it could predict uh, bound and unbound type of confirmations of the protein. Other than that, there is a methodology called induced fit docking method, which is also present. So in case if you have a um, uh, ligand free structure means EPO form of protein, we can forcefully dock the ligand inside the protein cavity, which you think of, and it will uh, try to accommodate this ligand and change the conformation of protein as per the size of ligand. So yes, that methodology is also available and reliably used. Thank you, sir. Thank you for answering. There are like a lot of questions, but due to time constraints, we are uh, posting the few questions to you. So thank you for answering all the questions and thank you for the wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Just an additional, if, you're, if your questions are not answered here, so no worries. You can write me an email and definitely within the uh, time period, I will try to answer all of your questions. So please thank feel you, free to write me. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request Dr. Divya Shri to introduce our next speaker. So I think. Uh... Uh, hello, Prasanna. 
Yes. I think we can ask uh, Rohini. Okay. Sure. To, inter to introduce uh, Dr. Ramana Kumari. Okay, I request Rohini to introduce uh, Dr. Ramana Kumari to the next speaker in the session. Hello, I'm here to introduce Dr. P. Ramana Kumari. Dr. P. Ramana Kumari, Associate Professor of Pathology, Government Siddhartha Medical College, Vijayawada. Dr. P. Ramana Kumari studied MBPS and MD in Pathology at Guntur Medical College, Guntur. She worked for three years at NRF Medical College, Shinakakani, as Assistant Professor of Pathology and joined Government Services in November 2006. Since then, she worked as Assistant Professor of Pathology at Guntur Medical College and was promoted as Associate Professor in 2017. Later in July 2019, she was transferred to Government Siddhartha Medical College, Vijayawada. She has been teaching MBBS students for 17 years and postgraduate students for 14 years. Dr. P. Ramanakumari is the ICMR guide of short-term studentship program for MBBS students. She is the dissertation guide for MD Pathology postgraduate students. She is trained in medical education technology under the auspices of Medical Council of India. She is also trained in NABL National Accreditation for Basic Lab Technology. Dr. Ramana Kumari has an experience of 17 years in diagnostic pathology. Her fields of interest are cancer diagnostics, especially breast cancer and cervical cancer. She has 12 plus publications of original articles in peer-reviewed journals of diagnostic pathology to her credit. On a final note, she is also an inspirational person and we are grateful for her presence among us today. Even she is busy with her contribution towards COVID-19, she happily accepted our invitation. Ma'am, we are grateful for that. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. P. Ramana Kumari. Ma'am, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, honored to be a part of this uh, e-conference uh, on COVID-19, the pandemic, and uh, it's causing a lot of disaster. And uh, it is very important that uh, the Department of uh, Biotechnology has organized this uh, conference, e-conference at this level. And uh, I'm very privileged to participate in this uh, conference. And I thank the organizing committee and the uh, head of the department, Dr. Venkatesh Garu, for inviting me as a guest speaker. The topic uh, of my talk here is peripheral blood characteristics in patients with COVID-19. This is an experience from the hospital which I am working for. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm a faculty of pathology, so we are mostly involved in diagnostic services. So, but for now, we are uh, even doing ward duties and uh, also OP duties for, because the load of COVID uh, patients is very high. Uh, in the present week and since the last 15 days, it uh, has increased a lot. So apart from the diagnostic uh, services to COVID patients, we are also involved in that patient care now. So we, we are experienced from uh, State COVID Hospital, Vijayawada, uh, I wanted to present. And uh, the government is spending a lot of money uh, just to test for whether it is uh, COVID positive or negative for each candidate. Then uh, uh, the patient care, their uh, expenses, the quarantine period, which is uh, actually the government is bearing their all the food, uh, every, uh, the medicines and all this. They're spending a lot on each and every patient. And at the time of uh, discharge, uh, they are being given rupees 2000. Uh, when a positive is becoming negative, they are... Uh, provided ambulance to the house and so many facilities the government is providing and uh, of course when uh, when there is uh, admission on covid suspect or covid positive patients 
um, all routine blood uh, investigations are done by default okay so those routine blood investigations we thought we will analyze and uh, uh, see that whether these routine blood uh, characteristics will help in assessing uh, which patient is going to become uh, severe okay so actually uh, i'll be covering my topic with this brief introduction and uh, we try to analyze the peripheral blood uh, parameters uh, of covid patients and all, uh, then uh, we try to study the morphology of the covid affected uh, leukocytes and platelets and all in the peripheral blood films and we try to interpret our results and finally summary coming to the introduction uh, as we all know it's an ongoing pandemic of coronavirus disease and uh, this was uh, as such on june 14th uh, 2020 we had on about uh, 3 lakh 20000 cases in india but today it is uh, double the figure and just 15 days it became double and even after 6 months of outbreak actually covid-19 lack specific drugs and vaccine uh, they are still working on to which drug actually works and with the, uh, the bringing out a nice vac good vaccine for this covid-19 so patients with uh, majority of the patients were with the milder symptoms and they recover and there's good prognosis but some very few people are becoming severe and very critical and uh, they are actually difficult to treat and they have high mortality and uh, therefore it is very important to predict the progress of the disease like which patient is going to become severe uh, was an important task so particular uh, we, uh, case is going to be serious and we have to take so many uh, precautionary measures everything has to be decided so previously uh there were many studies uh, with uh, which helped in clinical application of protein blood parameters in predicting the progress of various infectious diseases like uh, so we also did uh, one study late in 2018 uh, where we tried to uh, correlate the various platelet indices which are was generated by automated blood cell counters of patients with shock uh, and uh, we wanted to decide uh, we want to assess which particular patient is going to result in multiple uh, organ failure defect okay so uh, there, this gave us a very positive result we had a significant number a significant result where they, based on the platelet indices uh, which are done serially we can assess which uh, uh, patient with shock is actually going to end up with mots Okay, so with this background, we here also we wanted to analyze the role of routine blood parameters in predicting the disease course in COVID-19 patients. Okay, so be, because we 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 didn't want to do a, a very hi-fi uh, investigation, spending lot uh, because government was already spending so much on COVID uh, COVID patients. So we thought routine blood parameters uh, would really help in. Uh, predicting the disease course so for that we designed a study we uh, with the aims that uh, to analyze the routine peripheral blood parameters in patients with uh, covid-19 and then to study the morphological features of leukocytes in patients with uh, covid-19 then to compare the these parameters between mild moderate and severely ill uh, covid-19 patients and uh, to analyze the efficacy of these routine peripheral blood characteristics in predicting the progress of the disease in covid-19 patients so with, the, with these aims we proceeded and uh, it was a retrospective study we took the data from our laboratory uh, records the from 23rd march to 13th june a period of 90 days approximately and uh, we took the clearance from our institute ethics committee and the, all the routine peripheral blood characteristics of uh, the covid-19 patients who have uh, who were admitted in our hospital uh, were the data were recorded and uh, a total of 10087 uh, samples were processed during this uh, period of 90 days and uh, we uh, actually process all the covid suspects and also covid uh, positive patients 
and out of these 1087 we had only 155 samples of covid-19 positive and these covid-19 positive uh, patients were confirmed using uh, real time rt pcr as a, uh, according to icmr guidelines uh, and the remaining 932 were covid suspects uh, all the 155 patients uh, of uh, who were uh, positive by rt pcr we, the clinician grouped them into mild, moderate, and severe groups based on the clinical data. And in the in these cases, in the present study, the age of the patient ranged from 10 to 89 years. And the maximum age of the patients was in the sixth decade, as you can see in the graph, according, uh, accounting to 38.7%. Then the gender distribution, gender ratio was 1.2 to 1 is uh, 1 to 1. one. Groups based on the clinical symptoms, so this was done by the treating clinician and uh, majority of the cases were uh, with mild symptoms and accounting to 76.8% and uh, moderate illness uh, was based on uh, uh, just 15.15% and severe illness 7.8 percent. So our case, uh, we had uh, 12 cases actually to analyze uh, the changes. So coming to the analysis of the routine peripheral blood parameters. So we divided the, the parameters among the mild, moderate, severe. So first was the hem routine hemoglobin estimation, uh, less than 10 and more than uh, more than 10 and less than 10. Uh, almost uh, all the patients are were uh, within normal limits and severe cases at, at the time of admission itself uh, some 66 percent were uh, anemic then coming to the total leukocyte count when we take uh, mild to moderate cases the counts were almost within normal limits but severe cases they showed some changes which i'll be telling then coming to the platelet counts unlike other viral hemorrhagic fevers like dengue and all uh, COVID-19 cases, we did not find any uh, quantitative defects in platelets. The platelet counts were almost normal, except for a few cases which showed mild thrombocytopenias. That too not alarming, just like, uh, like in dengue cases. But we definitely found some uh, morphological changes. So coming to hemoglobin, the change which we studied in the present study, there is no significant change which we recorded in hemoglobin among different waves. However, severe Ill, Ill patients were anemic on admission itself. Maybe because of anemia, the, the immunity level was not uh, very good and they became severely ill. But that was uh, not because of COVID causing anemia, but anemia, because of anemia, they were more prone to COVID. Suyusun et al. recorded uh, on a, by another study where they recorded lower hemoglobin percentage in patients with COVID-19 on admission. So uh, what would be the reason that uh, hemoglobin percentage is low in severely ill patients they have described? That uh, increased inflammatory factors may decrease erythropoiesis, right? And also can increase the destruction of RBC. So that intense inflammatory storm uh, may cause a decrease in erythropoiesis. That could be a reason of anemia. But in our case, we, we, we didn't do a serial hemoglobin estimation, so uh, we are not sure whether hemoglobin went down or not. Then the total leukocyte count. The majority of the patients who were grouped as mild and moderate uh, categories, uh, the leukocyte counts were within normal limits. And in 21% of patients with moderate symptoms and 40% of severely ill patients, there were low leukocyte counts. Counts were low in significant number of cases. And uh, in 58% of severely ill patients, there was elevated WBC count. So when we took severely ill patients, uh, some uh, almost more than 50%, uh, half, half, that is more than half, uh, showed elevated WBC counts. Uh, the same uh, Suyu so Sun et al. studied uh, 116 COVID patients, including patients with mild, moderate, and severe symptoms. And in all the groups, they recorded total leukocyte counts lower. In, but in our case, uh, some severely patients showed elevated WBC counts. If this the reason could be that will be I'll be telling in my next slides. 
Then the platelet counts which we observed is in the present study, except for 20 cases of mild thrombocytopenias. Uh, majority cases did not show uh, any decrease uh, like other viral fevers, as I was telling. Then we recorded some morphological changes on peripheral blood film examination. Like we could find giant platelets among severely ill category, uh, which I'll be showing you. Then rarely the cause for uh, this uh, thrombocytopenia can be explained by the fact that uh, in some cases, as my previous speaker was also telling, uh, the thrombosis is uh, definitely a factor which is involving um, uh, fatal in, in, uh, fatality in uh, COVID patients. So this uh, particular event may lead to platelet consumption and uh, therefore cause thrombocytopenia. But this is happening in a very few number of cases. So uh, thrombocytopenia was not a major uh, observation in our uh, case, in our study. Then the other routine parameters uh, like absolute lymphocyte count, absolute neutrophil count, and absolute neutrophil count. Uh, absolute lymphocyte count uh, we did. Then coming to this absolute lymphocyte count, I'll be telling you, this was definitely low when we took the severe early ill cases. Uh, the absolute neutrophil count, we have seen uh, some cases which have uh, severely ill. There was increase in neutrophil counts. Even AMC was high in uh, severely ill cases. So this can be explained. We try to uh, um, correlate with the literature and we also try to find the reason why there is uh, the result, result like this. So in majority of patients, like 92% almost with the mild symptoms, uh, the absolute uh, lymphocyte count was within normal limits. We never knew that, that this could be uh, this. Then some of the cases with moderate cases and majority of cases with severe symptoms, they definitely showed lower absolute lymphocyte count. This finding was correlated with other studies in the literature also in COVID-19 cases. So COVID-19 infection, the reason is of uh, this uh, decreased lymphocyte uh, count. Uh, in COVID-19 infection, there is a severe inflammatory response uh, which causes a redistribution of lymphocytes, right? So these lymphocytes are taken away from the peripheral blood and redistributed somewhere else in the tissues where they are more required. Hence, there is peripheral blood lymphocytopenia. Okay, so this finding was correlated with our uh, other studies, and this finding we uh, significantly observed in some of the moderately ill uh, uh, categories of patients, and um, almost uh, more than half, 66 percent of severely ill cases. Then the absolute neutrophil count uh, in the present study among patients with severe symptoms. 50% of the cases showed uh, increased neutrophil counts, right? So uh, why there's increased neutrophil count in a viral infection? This, uh, the clinician said that increased neutrophil count among severely ill patients can be explained by superimposed to bacterial pneumonia. So when, the, uh, when there is a viral infection, superimposed bacterial infections do occur because of lowered immune status. So probably that is the reason where we could see increased neutrophil counts in some of the cases. Then, of course, uh, coming to the absolute, this is for, sorry, this AMC is absolute monocyte count, and 92% of severely ill patients showed increased uh, monocytes. Uh, then, uh, as the patient became severe, the monocyte counts were increasing. Then coming to absolute eosinophil count, consistently uh, almost uh, all the cases uh, we recorded decreased eosinophil counts among all the groups, the mild, moderate, severe, uh, we, we recorded uh, eosinophilia. This also is consistent with the literature. This is the same graphical representation of the same values of so ALC, ANC, MC. So those were our findings. Then we decided, then try to interpret our data. So there were 12 cases of severe illness in the present study. The total leukocyte and neutrophil counts in severely ill cases were higher than those of mild and moderate group. The lymphocyte count in severe illness group was uh, low uh, 
but it was normal within mild and moderate uh, cases then monocyte count showed uh, was high increasing in uh, especially in the severely ill cases and the hemoglobin concentration though we were not very sure whether it covid is actually causing decreased hemoglobin levels they were low in severely ill cases then the interesting part of uh, our finding was uh, when we were doing peripheral blood examination we could find some specific changes in the peripheral blood film the changes which we observed in the neutrophils were uh, a major the, the, these changes we could observe only in severely ill cases right Uh, and a very few moderately ill cases mild and mild cases all were within normal limits there were no leukocyte changes and all so uh, consistently the neutrophils uh, were hypolobated the nuclei of the neutrophils were hypolobated this was a consistent finding in all severely ill cases and there was a coarse granular cytoplasm and uh, uh, some cases we found ring nuclei and uh, in some uh, studies these ring nuclei were described as covid nuclei i mean they're showing it all they presented a case of severely ill covid 19 case uh, where they described these ring nuclei as uh, covid nuclei okay, this also we found in certain uh, cases then the morphological changes uh, addition uh, more in uh, neutrophils there was elongated nucleoplasm right so these are the new lobes of the new neutrophils so this finding of elongated nucleoplasm so you can see a thin string uh, between the lobes of the neutrophils uh, were seen uh, in some cases then uh, some cases showed cytoplasmic vacuolations here you can observe so these were the changes in neutrophils so in, totally neutrophils hypolobated nuclei ring nuclei elongated nucleoplasms toxic granulations vacuolations were observed in our final study then coming to the morphological changes which we observed in lymphocytes uh, we uh, there were large granular lymphocytes these are nothing but the natural killer cells actually these are the cells which uh, first react with the viruses Uh, any type of infection viral infection nk cells are the one which come the forefront warriors so uh, many cases we could find large granular lymphocytes like this then other changes which we found were uh, round to indented nuclei uh, cytoplasmic pod formation this is the cytoplasmic pod formation here then abundant pale cytoplasm normally a lymphocyte has a thin rim of blue cytoplasm here uh, abundant pale cytoplasm these are virocytes which we this particular finding we find in other types of viral infections also then this i told you it's an nk cell and uh, uh, indented nuclei and abundant cytoplasm we call them atypical lymphocytes so lymphocytes showed them um, apart from the quantitative lead less in number Uh, morphologically also we we could find some uh, changes in them. then the platelets uh, actually morphological changes in platelets were not recorded in any other studies which we have gone through uh, majority of the cases there we could find giant platelets uh, like this the giant platelet is almost the size of the rbc here you can see this is the normal rbc here it isn't and the platelet is also uh, almost to the size of this rbc that is around 7 microns normally platelets are just 2 to 4 microns so these are the normal platelets you can see here right these are just 2 to 4 microns but we were able to see giant platelets in many severely ill cases then some degenerating cells this apoptotic cell where their nucleus is fragmented and uh, some degenerate this is a degenerating lymphocyte which we could see in two or three cases like this so that was about the morphological changes which uh, we observed among these severely ill and mars a few moderately ill covid uh, positive patients then uh, covid suspects among covid suspects when we were doing the routine blood examination some cases we recorded plasmodium vivax malaria also 
actually they were uh, negative for covid uh, on rt pcr uh, and also we uh, recorded one case of acute leukemia in a male child of 12 years he was covid positive mm. and uh, therefore i wanted to present uh, uh, a slide on covid 19 pandemic in malaria endemic areas india is uh, endemic area for malaria we all know that and uh, malaria shares highly recognizable symptoms with covid 19 such as fever difficulty in breathing fatigue and headaches of acute onset uh, thus a malaria case may be misclassified as covid 19 when symptoms alone are used to define a case during emergency so many are whenever our healthcare volunteers are uh, go for home visits and uh, they are doing survey so uh, a fever case uh, can be uh, taken up as covid suspect so we have to be sensitized that malaria and covid 19 co-infection do occur and untreated malaria can cause community infections and uh, there is a need for enhanced sensitization on the potential that uh, these cases should not be misclassified and uh, that malaria covid 19 co-infection do occur okay so the how to overcome this so both is both are dangerous so both can cause community transmission and uh, both are life threatening okay so this can be overcome uh, by performing rapid tests for malaria also as they screen for covid 19 so rapid tests for malaria are more easily available when compared to covid 19 so every fever case whenever we are suspecting the malaria should not be ignored especially because ours is a malaria endemic area so because that's because some patients may be lost if uh, they are declared covid negative while in fact they may be malaria positive and uh, so so we have to reorganize our laboratory services uh, wherever we are testing for covid 19 and uh, we have to uh, do uh, malaria test kit also and this actually reorganization of lab services have used very um, uh, useful approach when uh, tuberculous hiv collaborative activities were performed. so we have to learn from uh, what we have done in the uh, fruitful uh, uh, activities of previous uh, collaborations so such experiences should be utilized especially in a pandemic where everything is new so we have to take the experience from our previous previous studies then to summarize uh, though our data is limited and uh, we have a sample size of 155 cases and out of which only 12 were severely ill and the data is also acquired retrospectively i think the data available was limited because it was just a re just recorded from the archives so these are the limitations how our data really provides important inferences on significant analysis of routine peripheral blood parameters without any extra cost Uh, these routine peripheral parameters really uh, help us in uh, prognosticating uh, which case would be becoming a, a, a severe case so covid 19 will cause abnormalities in routine peripheral blood parameters the decrease in lymphocytes and increase in nlr ratio that is neutrophil lymphocyte ratio are the most obvious abnormalities which are related to the severity of the disease and clinical classification and uh, the lower count and delay in increase in eosinophils can be uh, signs of poor outcome there is an important point which we had we noticed and there is dynamic surveillance of this peripheral blood system uh, especially eosinophils is helpful in predicting uh, severe covid 19 cases so peripheral blood characteristics very cost effective and uh, very helpful in patient surveillance these are some of my references and i thank uh, our professor and head of the department dr sail balagaru our professor dr p ramareddy garu my postgraduate sneharika ramya shruti and my technical staff thank you for patient listening and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you ma'am for your wonderful presentation so there are few questions so due to time constraint we are short listing and then asking a very few questions to you So, what are your comments on false negatives in uh, RT-PCR 
corona tests okay false negative in rt pcr basically first of all i am a pathologist uh, okay. i have no experience in working with rt pcr uh, machines and all uh, we we actually ours is a different uh, category so I, I cannot comment on that particular case i am not a subject expert okay. on that okay so you have any views over the administration of uh, drugs like uh, methyl prednisol uh, as some uh, hospitals are using them any comments on that okay we are actually we have been in uh, ward postings uh, in the patient care of the covid patients also mm -hmm. uh, in, they were using this uh, drug only in severely ill cases right okay. mild to moderate also and not all cases mm -hmm. and that the clinician has to decide we have expert team uh, senior team in covid uh, state hospital vijayawada uh, they continuously monitor like uh, which patient needs a new drug all patients are not put on uniformly on the same drug regime uh, mm -hmm. depending on the need uh, they change so small on the drug trials of uh, some new drugs which we are seeing so everything is going on it's a big hospital dedicated totally to covid patients also okay. we every day uh, three shifts and each shift uh, around 15 to 20 teams will be working uh, starting from professor associate assistant pgs house surgeons staff nurse menos and all each team has a group so a uh, lot of work they are doing uh, very hectic uh, actually <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. And one last question. Uh, what are the, uh, can you tell any reasons for identifying reduced eosinophil counts? Yeah, they say there is some um, redistribution uh, for lymphocytes, but eosinophils from the starting itself, we were observing the eosinophils counts were very low. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was a, um, we, we thought the, uh, actually why this is low but uh, i i cannot explain the re exact reason why the isnophils are low but definitely that okay. uh, reappearance of isnophils uh, was uh, again a sign, ominous sign mm -hmm. so uh, similar cases uh, did you observe with uh, any other viruses like uh, other than covid uh, there were previously dengue virus no, uh, so, i was uh, again uh, involved with the uh, dengue epidemic uh, which we were uh, seeing in 2010 Actually, mm -hmm. the changes which we observed there was uh, only on the lymphoid series that I could okay. see typical cells, transformed lymphocytes, and a lot of focus was on platelets mm -hmm. uh, there. But uh, same like the snow fill role, uh, I didn't uh, get to understand. I didn't okay. get there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for a wonderful presentation from a pathological point of view as well as how COVID is happening and what are the other conditions which are related to COVID, which has high risk, uh, which yeah. you have observed in hand. So thank you very much, ma'am, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. So I think uh, now we'll have a break, right? No, uh, sir is actually available to give it. Okay, okay, then no problem. Yeah. So, uh, I think you may uh, introduce people. Yes. I have, I have his description. So I I can't see him as a presenter. Uh. The, I mean, did you see the BioVet thing? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. You, did you see the BioVet uh, icon there? Yes. Now, now he's active. Yeah. Now he's active. Okay. Yeah. One second. So, uh, now, uh, Dr. Pandurangar Rao will present the topic on COVID-19 vaccine platforms. I request uh, Dr. Devyashree to give a 
brief introduction to the speaker. Um, hello, everyone. So, uh, last but not the least, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Pandranga Rao to fill the morning session. Uh, so, he's a vice president of BioVet uh, Private Limited. It's a sister concern of uh, Bharat Biotech, if I'm not wrong. And uh, this uh, this company is located in uh, Karnataka, uh, especially the especially BioVet is from Bangalore. And uh, to say a few words about uh, Dr. Rao, he has completed his bachelor's in uh, veterinary science and animal husbandry from the College of Veterinary Science, Tirupati, uh, India. And later he went on to do his PhD in biotechnology from Jawaharlal Technological University, Hyderabad. He started his career as a veterinarian in the government of Andhra Pradesh. During this period, he's a recipient of letter of appreciation um, and the best, he also uh, backed the best veter veterinarian award from government of Andhra Pradesh. He's also a recipient of best veterinarian award from Dr. C.K. Rao Trust Hyderabad. Later, he joined as an assistant professor at Sri Venkateshwara Veterinary University to establish biotechnology labs and also to start a master's program in biotechnology. So he was a pioneer in that. So later he joined Ella Foundation as scientist and then he elevated as a head of the institution. During this period, he's recipient of several grants from national and international organizations. He's also a recipient of Grand Challenges Explorer Innovative Research Project from Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he's involved in joint collaborative project of uh, BBSRC, which is the Biotech Council of uh, UK. Uh, so B he's, he's in the joint collaborative project of BBSRC DBT on epidemi epidemiology of vector borne diseases and establishment of repository of viruses. He's involved in development of emergency vaccines for pandemic influenza and Ebola vaccine programs of Bharat Biotech International Limited, Hyderabad. He's an advisor of uh, GAP3, bio, GAP3 Biosafety Committee of Bharat Biotech, and also in the development of vaccine for COVID-19. So uh, you might have heard about the recent vaccine that is uh, that has been approved by the ICMR for trials. So uh, viewers, you can also uh, uh, you can also uh, ask questions on that and uh, get more knowledge on uh, what's the current uh, more knowledge on the current updates on the vac vaccine. So currently, he is working as vice president of the uh, private, private limited, as I said, and he's heading its technical division. He has authored nearly like sixty publications in national and international journals, and also two book chapters. So uh, here is the description. Uh, here I've given the whole description of uh, Dr. Panduranga Rao, and I welcome you, sir, to deliver the talk. Yeah, uh, can you hear me, madam? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you are able to see my presentation also? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes. We can see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting for this webinar. It is a good uh, interaction with all the people and all. And uh, uh, what I want to talk about is, okay, with this COVID-19, uh, it's a, actually an unprecedented uh, uh, pandemic. Maybe mankind first time it is seeing such a pandemic and uh, lockdowns and other things uh, in a short period. So during this one, the when once the WHO has announced uh, the pandemic and all, several companies they started uh, uh, they jumped into this vaccine development. There are probably now 130 or so candidate vaccines that are being developed by different companies and. Uh, yeah, yeah the Indian, some of the Indian companies also started their work and uh, now hopefully we will be getting a, a few of them into the market. And uh, we are looking at actually, yeah, uh, the race is between the virus, the virus spread and the, how fast we are going to bring the vaccine. The race is not between the companies. 
there is no race between the companies no competition between the companies there is several means the uh, what we have uh, the space for more number of companies i am looking at at least a 50 companies should start producing this vaccine not one two companies to cater the uh, requirement of the worldwide this one so what we will do is uh, different platforms the important thing is uh, unlike any other vaccine uh, in a short period different platforms are being uh, targeted by different companies different institutions to develop a suitable vaccine for this and probably at the end of this one there could uh, a, a few new technologies may come out or some of the technologies which we are thinking may go fade out also and let us see what are these technologies that are there uh, and uh, what are the plus minus points and what we can see and all uh, those things we will be discussing uh, i am involved in the i am proud to be involved in this bharat biotech uh, covid vaccine development uh, maybe i can't I means i may be talking more little bit more uh, about bharat biotech if if i am little bit biased please forgive me and uh, i i will try to keep everything uh, balanced but uh, i can't help because i worked with in one particular this one probably a uh, little bit biased may be there but if it is there you just forgive me and uh, let us move to the next uh, basically what i do is Blocking my okay. Uh, are you able to see the slide properly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, what I do is, uh, what is our target for most of the vaccines? When we do, when we develop vaccines, uh, generally a protein or something will be targeted. And uh, what is the general target for the most of the companies? And what is happening is. almost everybody is targeting a single protein at different stages this one see you see this uh, covid uh, virus or the in general a corona virus this corona virus it has a protein outside the this one this is uh, called s protein most of the people are targeting this protein either a full length s or part of that one uh, you you can see this one in the s protein uh you have this uh, head like thing that is what is called s1 whereas this part is called s2 whereas this part is uh, the which is in the membrane transmembrane domain and all so if you see the difference between uh, this covid 19 and the earlier sars corona virus this s1 region is almost common whereas this s sorry s2 region is almost common where this s1 is different in among these uh, corona viruses or the related viruses are related uh, to covid 19 so for most of the people the target is either this s1 or a complete uh, this one so with this uh, i will move to the next slide uh, i am not going to talk about most of the structure and all uh, i will go to the next slide and uh, see Uh, what are the different uh, companies people uh, di different targets people are having if you see this one the most of the the biggest out of that 130 or so more than 50 people are targeting the subunit vaccine or vlp that means the s protein uh, forming as a virus like particle or a subunit and the next target is uh, surprisingly rna rna up to now there is no vaccine coming from rna based vaccines in the market but surprisingly a 30% of the people they are trying rna and it's a new technology and it is an untested technology up to now and uh, uh, i am hopeful uh, this this may change if it works this rna vaccine works it may change whole scenario in the vaccine production and uh, uh, there is one particular company uh, moderna they are already in the clinical trials in us and uh, mm, the data is not out 
we, we cannot comment on the data, whatever the data they have. It is not yet published. And uh, we let us see what, what happens to this one. We need to, we are also crossed our fingers and looking at what, we, what may happen. Then the next target is based upon the adenoviruses. Basically, adenoviruses uh, uh, and among the adenoviruses also the major target is uh, um, using the human adenoviruses. Human adenovirus 5. So we will discuss about that and it is basically a vectored virus. Uh, S gene is cloned into adenovirus genome and uh, the virus will be used as a vector or a vehicle to deliver the, its DNA into the cells, infected cells, and uh, the cells will produce the protein. That's what is the this one here. And the next target is, uh, not surprisingly, DNA vaccine. Uh, up to now, there are some DNA vaccines available for veterinary field, but not for the human vaccines. And uh, yeah, this may decide the fate of DNA vaccines in future, this COVID, uh, this one. And uh, not surprisingly, there are uh, 10 candidates, 10, P 10 companies that are working on inactivated vaccines. Yes, Bharat Biotech is one among them. And uh, uh, there is one, uh, two more Chinese companies there. They are also in clinical trials. And uh, not surprisingly, this another uh, box space, uh, this one. It includes uh, the vaccine used for smallpox. Or in uh, for the better this one, MLV, uh, a modified uh, vaccine uh, Ankara, uh, that based ones and uh, uh, one more vaccine. Uh, interesting this one is uh, based upon the horsepox virus. So this one also we will discuss, especially these adenoviruses and pox viruses. People why they are using uh, that part also we will discuss. And uh, another interesting thing is there are uh, a few companies who are using measles vaccine as the vector. Measles already, you know, it is, there is a very safe vaccine available with almost 90, 95% of the efficacy for measles. So this is one of the target uh, compared to uh, measles virus is also a RNA virus. It is an enveloped virus. If you can put your uh, gene, gene of interest into this one, and it can be expressed on, it can be expressed on the measles virus as well as in the cells, uh, cell membrane also. So there is another vaccine candidate based upon the influenza vaccines. Similar to what I talked about measles, influenza also is an RNA virus. It is a um, enveloped virus and it can accommodate part of uh, uh, some parts of these uh, new genes and all. So basically this pox virus, measles virus and influenza virus, they are, uh, I can put them into a single this one, uh, where a, a replicating virus will be used to uh, express the protein in the cells and we have uh, safe vaccine candidates for this. Whereas in case of adenovirus, uh, the, it is replicate, most of them are replication defective viruses which cannot replicate in the human, but they can produce the uh, protein. Whereas in case of measles and influenza, the protein is outside the virus uh, and that itself will act as a vaccine. And further, the protein is expressed in the cells also. Whereas in case of adeno, it is not the case. This is not expressed in the, it is not part of adenovirus. It will be expressed in the adenovirus infected cells. <laughs> uh, then there are peptide vaccines. Not many people ventured into this one. I thought uh, most of the people will venture into the peptide vaccines, but that didn't happen. But most of the people ventured into subunit vaccines. Then there is another vaccine, vesicular stomatitis virus vaccine. If you remember the last uh, um, Ebola virus outbreak, the one vaccine which worked very well is based upon this uh, vesicular stomatitis virus vaccine. And it is a basically a animal virus infecting cattle and all. And uh, it can infect most of the cells. So this is one of the good candidates. And it has a proven uh, uh, background of 
इट वर्क इन केस ऑफ एटलिस्ट इन केस ऑफ एलाइजा सॉरी ये बोला देन दिस इज अनदर इंटरेस्टिंग पार्ट कोड ऑन डी ऑप्टिमाइजड वैक्सीन इट इज बेसिकली यू टेक यूर करोना वायरस and gen whenever we are expressing some protein in cells say in human cells or in yeast or in uh, e coli generally what we do we optimize the codons that means each amino acid is coded by a, a few different codons uh, ranging from 1 to 6 codons But not that uh, all uh, animals or plants uh, they will use all the codons on similar level some plant some animals they use or some cells they use some particular codon more, more than the other codons that too there are other things involved like uh, uh, two nucleotides next to each other some codons are not uh, uh, good for the expression of the protein some are good for the expression of proteins so this what they are trying to do is they are trying to deoptimize deoptimize the codon this one for humans that means this this virus cannot uh, produce itself replicate properly or produce its proteins in the cells so the replication is deoptimized that means you may get a, an attenuated virus so basically a codon deoptimized virus is an attenuated virus which cannot replicate as a wild type virus so that that can be used as a vaccine so if you take uh, some of the vaccines like measles that is an attenuated vaccine naturally attenuated vaccine uh, or attenuated by passaging in uh, some other cell lines and all so naturally they are little bit deoptimized so they became attenuated that is the same technology or the same concept uh, two three companies are taking and uh, they are trying to deoptimize this codon so that um, uh, an attenuated strain can be developed yeah we need to look at this uh, this one if this works very well this is one of the technology i am looking at uh, may come up later with for other vaccines also and the another interesting this one is one company at least is working on newcastle disease virus basically it is a poultry uh it is a poultry virus a safe vaccine is available live vaccine is available <clears throat> and uh, this virus can accommodate some of the foreign genes so people are trying to use this one and i will talk about this later and definitely there are some advantages with this virus and uh, we'll move to next Um, yeah uh, uh here I'm sorry i think uh, okay here uh, i am limiting my this one to the vaccines being developed by different companies in india so basically the first vaccine that is already in phase 1 by 1 uh, and 2 a combined phase of uh, a clinical phase of 1 and 2 that came from bharat biotech two days back they announced uh, the clinical trials and uh, it is basically a, a regular vaccine uh, a traditional way of working on this one this is a vaccine i am also involved uh, here we need to grow the virus in one of the cell lines we are using vero cell lines and uh, uh, inactivate with a chemical like uh, bpl and bpl inactivated vaccine is uh, now that is what uh, people use for uh, this, this is the similar technology which bharat biotech has different types of vaccines like uh, uh, japanese encephalitis chikungunya zika for uh, most of the pandemics even for influenza whenever we worked on this we our first preference is inactivated but with the uh, covid we were a bit uh, worried because of the um, bio safety issues so what if how, what are the precautions we need to take that uh, 
people working on the uh, large scale vaccine production they should not get infected and all but fortunately what happened is uh, two years back we entered into development of vaccines for uh, ipv means polio virus inactivated polio virus the inactivated polio virus is also a bsl3 virus so to develop that one we created a facility bsl3 facility that is the only uh, facility available in human vaccines in india bsl3 facility for human vaccines only available is only available with bharat biotech uh, so immediately we thought okay probably we can use this facility for uh, uh, developing this vaccine and the facility is now converted for the covid 19 and that's where uh, they started and we are lucky that uh, the facility just uh, ready in the month of uh, january february only so luckily it is ready and uh, we just kick started uh, using this one and uh, uh, by the time we got the virus and other things it is may first we got the virus within two months the way the the clinical trials are on us and because of it is already happened because of the team that is available with Bharat who uh, they are the heroes actually they went in they they <clears throat> worked in the BSL3 facilities with all the PPEs and other things worked day and night and uh, make it possible so that is in the phase one two clinical trials and uh, we are hoping all our preclinical data indicates that uh, uh, we are getting a very good uh, antibody titus, neutralizing antibody titus. We hope uh, uh, it will come into the market soon. And uh, the next vaccine people are, I already discussed about this, put on de-optimized. Two of the, the institutions, Indian companies, they jumped with this one, Serum Institute uh, in collaboration with the Codagenics and Indian Immunologicals in collaboration with the Griffith University of Australia. Uh, later, there is no much information about this. We hope that it is under preclinical pre -clinical trials still, our development stage. And uh, next thing people, the widely targeted uh, vaccine is uh, this adenovector-based vaccines or viral vector-based vaccines. One is uh, based upon the chimp adenovirus. This is developed by Oxford University, UK. Serum Institute is collaborating with them and uh, they are in phase three clinical trials, not in India, outside India. And uh, it is one of the most, uh, uh, in the stage of most advanced stage of clinical trials, that is the final clinical trials phase three. Uh, the important thing with this one, uh, we will discuss about that later, uh, but it is in the phase three clinical trial and uh, this is one of the most promising uh, candidate what we are seeing. And uh, there is another, uh, this one, human adenovirus 5 based vaccine. Bharat Biotech is working on that. And uh, it is in house uh, developed vaccine. It is under uh, now with preclinical uh, uh, animal studies are uh, going on. And uh, today morning I had data. Uh, data looks good. And uh, we are hopeful about this vaccine also. And uh, there is another vaccine we are developing is based upon the influenza vaccine. Uh, this is a replication defective influenza virus uh, developed by University of Wisconsin. And uh, the major advantage what we see with these two vaccines, human adenovirus and influenza, these vaccines can be given intranasally. So we are already in the advanced stage with inactivated vaccine. Uh, this requires intramuscular injections or subcutaneous injections. Whereas human adenovirus and influenza vaccines can be given by intranasal route or maybe oral. So uh, we are also, so that is the reason we are also working, especially vaccination will be easier and probably we may, because they are live vaccines, we may be able to produce more, more doses that are required for this uh, pandemic situation. And already I discussed about vascular, uh, vascular uh, vaccine virus vaccine and uh, Arbindo recently they entered into vaccines Arbindo Pharma they announced that uh, RO vaccine there uh, this one is RO vaccines 
they recently announced that uh, in collaboration with the Profectus, they are working on vesicular stomatitis vaccine and uh, we need to see where it is and uh, no further uh, details about that vaccine. <coughs> then today I have seen in the paper, in the news and all, JDS Cadilla also they came with their uh, vaccine for uh, phase one and two clinical trials. Today they got the, they announced it. Just now I changed my slide. It was in preclinical pre area and now I changed it to page for two. And it is measles based. Measles vaccine already we know a attenuated vaccine is available. That I am looking at as a good platform. But only doubt I have is most of us are measles, uh, most of us are uh, vaccinated by measles vaccine so that we will be having definitely we will be having uh, pre existing immunity. So, this pre existing immunity means already we have antibodies against measles. And how good this vaccine can work, uh, it can replicate in the uh, vaccinated people. Uh, that is one thing we need to see. This pre existing immunity issue will be there with uh, human adenoviruses, uh, adeno 5 also. Whereas, chimp adeno, it may not be an issue because chimpanzee adenovirus antibodies we, will, we may not have, whereas human adenovirus antibodies will have, similar thing can happen with uh, measles also. Uh, whereas the, and uh, let us see, uh, I am also hopeful, but uh, because in adults and all, this can work, but we need to see, uh, we need to see how to, how this will, let us see in a month or two, we have the data about this one. And the next vaccine, again, Bharat Biotech, they are working on a rabies based platform with the Thomas Jefferson University. It is basically an attenuated rabies virus in which we can incorporate the S gene or the spike protein of uh, uh, coronavirus. This already we are in, uh, we are started producing in large scale. It is under preclinical pre trials. And uh, this is one thing we are uh, hoping uh, this, uh, to increase the number of doses. This is one platform we have selected. And it, it will be given as an inactivated vaccine, similar to any other rabies vaccine. Already we know the rabies vaccine is a very safe vaccine to give. And, uh, not less, not more than one percent people will have antibodies against this rabies because not many people are exposed to rabies. So we are thinking this can this can be a vaccine where where if we have a problem with uh, say pre-existing immunity for human adeno or influenza, this is one platform can go far further. That's what uh, we are thinking. Next vaccine, there are protein subunit vaccines. Uh, announced by biological E. Uh, they are using uh, receptor domain of S protein, uh, probably in uh, yeast, but we are not sure. And uh, there is another company who announced spike protein based uh, subunit vaccine, Minvax. They are also new for this uh, anything, but uh, we do not have much information about this. Hopefully they are under preclinical trials. Another vaccine developed by, uh, being developed by Genova, uh, they perform based upon the RNA and uh, similar to, probably it is similar to uh, Moderna vaccine, Moderna vaccine, who are also uh, uh, looking at RNA based vaccines and uh, uh, if it works, it will be, it will be a game changer. Uh, let us hope uh, how it goes and all. And uh, we will go to one by one uh, a little bit in detail. Uh, the one first one uh, we will be discuss discussing will be inactivated vaccines. The advantage, the biggest advantage with inactivated vaccines is the technology is known. The inactivants are known. How long it will take and all it is known. And uh, uh, there is already data available for uh, SARS coronavirus. A similar thing can be replicated here. And uh, uh, the major uh, and the facility infrastructures are available for with some companies. Easy to kickstart that probably is the, uh, that is the major uh, reason 
for us to move to this particular vaccine. But the biggest disadvantage is biosafety and handling. We are producing in large scale in hundreds of liters of this virus, and uh, it is very scary. If something happens, if this, uh, if it is released out, what to do on that? But fortunately, we have a BSL-3 vaccine production vessel where we can handle all this vaccine virus. And uh, uh, almost on a weekly basis, all our people are being tested by RT-PCR, in-house developed RT-PCR testing. And uh, uh, fortunately, our systems are perfect and there is no incident up to now. And we are sure that uh, nothing uh, can happen in future also because we have the very full food system. So, but this is one reason other companies are not venturing into this one because none of these Indian companies are having uh, BSL-3 facilities for human vaccines. Yes, there are three companies who are having uh, BSL-3 facilities for vaccine production, but they are all in veterinary vaccine, this one. The veterinary vaccine companies who are having this uh, BSL-3 facilities are BioVet, Inanimologicals and Brilliant Biopharma, which is both are uh, Inanimologicals and Brilliant are both are uh, located in Hyderabad. Uh, uh, but they didn't venture into this one because they are mostly in uh, veterinary vaccines. And uh, next we will move to Adeno based this one, uh, which uh, Chimp Adeno virus, which Serum Institute is uh, uh, hoping and uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Oxford University. Here, what they did is, this is where uh, the chimpanzee virus, this is the protein, the uh, pentone protein, which is actually modified into, uh, the human adenovirus is modified into this, uh, the expression of this particular protein. Is mod that it is modified to chimpadino so that there is no pre existing immunity this particular virus. So then they incorporated the SARS coronavirus spike protein into this one. So this virus, which is basically can infect chimpanzees, not humans, uh, are uh, humans may not have the pre existing immunity or antibodies against this virus can be used as a vaccine candidate. This virus can infect the humans, but it can infect only for one cycle. It cannot spread from one, one human being to other, or in, uh, truly speaking, it cannot spread from one cell to other cell also. So safety-wise, there is no issue. Uh, the other issues of pre-existing immunity is also not there with this particular virus. And uh, it is supported by Gates Foundation and the PATH and uh, uh, all big, uh, this one. So this vaccine is going to, going forward in a very fast manner. And it is already in pre phase three clinical trials. And Serum Institute is uh, working with them. And the biggest advantage with this vaccine is, uh, because of the support from the Gates Foundation and uh, CP, they supported all the money for this vaccine development and they are uh, very um, they are hopeful or they are very confident about this candidate because same candidate worked for uh, earlier for the SARS coronavirus one also. So what they are thinking is they already started producing the vaccine uh, without waiting for the clinical trials. They already started producing the vaccine. So by the time clinical trials are over, you will have millions of doses of vaccine available at different places. And several companies are recruited into this program. Uh, and the Serum Institute is one of them. There are uh, tens of institutions, ten, tens of companies who start, already started producing this vaccine. And the moment phase three clinical trials are over, the results are out. The vaccine can be uh, uh, given to the market and immediately vaccination can be started. That is the biggest advantage with this vaccine. And uh, I am hoping that this vaccine will save millions of people. And uh, the next, this one already what we discussed about uh, uh, other replication incompetent viral vaccines. Now you see this vaccine, 
infectious virus can enter into the cell and produce its proteins and RNA or DNA and the virus will be released out and this is but what happens here is this particular thing it can be produced only in a particular cell line which can complement this virus this virus is having a defective genome that means a particular piece of the genome is missing in this virus but that is complemented by the particular cell line these cell lines are called complementing cell lines or producer cells so a virus will come out along with the uh, spike protein of the spike protein gene of our uh, interest so this virus when it is infecting the normal cell say a vaccinated person cells what happens is this virus can enter produce all the proteins including the spike glycoprotein but the virus cannot come out because it is defective in a particular genome particular gene so it is it is replication incompetent or replication defective or replication deficient they cannot replicate so they are safe so what we have is in this category we have coroflu coroflu is uh, uh, the vaccine uh, announced by bharat biotech in combination in uh, collaboration with the uh, university of wisconsin they already have a vaccine for flu influenza vaccine this vaccine can replicate only once in the human being and this can be given intranasally also so that is the biggest advantage vaccination is a is easy and the vaccine production technology is already known it is known technology and it can be scaled up easily and uh, uh, this already they have tried in uh, different things and uh, uh, now they are they are in uh, preclinical trials we are testing this vaccine in us uh, in animals and all and uh, if it works out uh, well it can be given uh, intranasally uh, so that is the biggest advantage and we already have the platform to produce this vaccine in large scale so we we are hopeful about this vaccine we are ready to receive this uh, strain here but clinical trials are preclinical trials are uh, happening in us and uh, already we discussed about uh, this one vesicular stomatitis virus based vaccine this is what your uh, it is a rhabdovirus it is a sister of uh, rabies virus it is uh, very much related to it, they both of them them belongs to same family rabies virus and uh, vesicular stomatitis virus and uh, instead of the glycoprotein of this virus we can incorporate any other glycoprotein any other virus glycoprotein this is where people used the glycoprotein of uh, ebola ebola glycoprotein they incorporated here and it worked well very well and it is one of the successful vaccine for ebola and uh, hopefully <clears throat> similarly they used it for the mers corona virus that is also uh, worked uh, this one and uh, lassa virus also they used and now they are proposing it for the covid vaccine and uh, let <clears throat> similar platform actually uh, aro vaccines arvind also is proposing and uh, let us see what is what will happen to this one and i am hopeful this vaccine also can work because uh, <clears throat> the amount of glycoprotein that is being expressed outside is huge and uh, there is no pre existing immunity because it is basically a animal vaccine animal virus so no pre existing immunity only hitch i am seeing here is this animal virus is not there not present in india so what uh, what will be the this one from the ministry of uh, animal husbandry whether they allow an animal virus which is not away, not present in india to be used as a live vaccine in india is a question i have but uh, uh, in a pandemic situation like this we sh- we need not uh, really worry about that and hopefully it will come to uh, uh, phase, uh, clinical trials and uh, 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 it will be released into market let us see and uh, 
This is an interesting concept, RNA vaccines. Up to now, there is no single RNA vaccine available in the market. So, the major problem is if you inject RNA into a human being, into a muscle cell, it can enter into the cell and its proteins can be produced. But uh, the major pro the, the transfer or the, uh, the way, uh, how to put this uh, RNA into the cell is a biggest issue. So people are trying to use nanoparticles, especially lipojomes and all, to encapsulate this RNA into these lipo lipojomes so that they can be engulfed into the cells where this protein can be expressed and the protein uh, immune response can be developed. This is completely new technology. In that also, there are two technologies available, two technologies people are trying. One is a simple RNA, which cannot replicate, non-replicating this one. Whereas this, there is another thing. Uh, another, uh, hello. Uh. Is there any problem? Hello. No, sir. No, sir. No problem. Okay, fine. Okay, there is another uh, uh, this one replicating RNA. Say alpha virus RNA, if you take it, there is a replicase enzyme available. So, this RNA can enter into this one and replicate also. That means small amount of RNA can, if you can make it enter into the cells. It can replicate and it can produce large quantity of proteins and all. Compared to this particular, this particular NRM, this one, these are better vaccine candidates. Uh, and uh, let us see how the important thing here is the vehicle, what they are going to use. How efficient this vehicle is to uh, deliver this RNA into the cells. The technology uh, Moderna and other people, they are not revealing the technology yet. Uh, let us see how it goes. If this works, this RNA vaccine works, it is going to change the whole vaccine field. Especially for viral vaccine field, it is going to change uh, all this one. And uh, probably the big companies need to close their vaccine production units and move to this RNA, this one. And let us see how it goes and up. Uh, Next thing is DNA vaccines. We are hearing about these DNA vaccines since uh, decades. Maybe first time we started working on the DNA vaccines probably in the uh, 90s, early 90s. But none of the vaccines came into the, this one. And similar to RNA vaccines, how we are going to deliver the DNA into the target cells? That is the major issue. And uh, people are using liposomes and other things. Uh, there are DNA guns and uh, other things, but uh, not at uh, the technology which is scalable is not at uh, ready. Or probably uh, COVID is a cattle, catalyst for this one. Maybe there are new technologies people are try, going to try. And uh, this is one technology post COVID. What I am thinking is post COVID, either DNA vaccines will be completely. Uh, out of this one or there will be several companies which are jumping into the DNA vaccines. If one or two vaccines of uh, COVID works, DNA vaccines work, there will be, it will be a, again a game changer. So the important thing now is now we discussed about different types of vaccines that are coming up and uh, uh, how long it is going to take. Are we going to get a vaccine within short period? So let us see, generally for a vaccine, for normal regulatory pathway, that means if I have an idea today, in 2020, January, I have an idea to develop a vaccine, generally how long it will take to put it into the market? Just see, if I start in 2020, maybe my vaccine will be out for the market in 2036. That means a minimum of 10 to 15 years. That's what is generally for any vaccine to come into the market. So in pandemics, if I am looking at this type of uh, timelines, there is no point. There is no point by the time the pandemic will be over. So where we can reduce, that's where most of the companies are working on. Look at this. 
the building of the facilities this is where what is the going to take most of the time okay so what they are doing is they are uh, they are looking for the vaccine candidates which can be uh, which can use in the uh, existing available facilities so this part is gone and uh, uh, academic research is also not there most of the times what what already we, wherever there are leads available simply people are moving to that and immediately kick starting the uh, preclinical this one and even preclinical if you see in general it takes two two and a half years but that is not what we are looking at and uh, phase one two three clinical trials also is going to uh, take long time and another thing is manufacturing already we discussed about uh, chimpanzee virus of uh, uh, oxford university before clinical trials before all these pre clinical trials and clinical trials they started manufacturing here so that is how they are going and let us see what we really want to what happened to different vaccines earlier varicella vaccine 28 years flu mis 28 years papilloma virus 15 years rota 15 years and people are trying to do in 18 months for me 18 months is also long period for me it, it should come within 6 months so where we are what we are trying to do almost no academic research and uh, pre clinicals are limited to 1 1 and a half month and uh, phase 1 2 are combined <laughs> and uh, building facilities are not there already existing buildings they are trying to do and before going for phase 1 clinical trials people are starting people started manufacturing so that it can be reduced not august 21st today the announcement is by august 2020 by august 15th by independence day we want to announce this vaccine but whether we can announce it or not we are not sure but uh, that is the target that is the goal we have so by doing that are we compromising the safety i am not really we are not compromising on the safety i am not seeing that as we are compromising on safety say it is an emergency vaccine yes it will not be fully characterized that means what happens uh, uh, means what is my stability the major problem is why it takes longer time is manufacturing the stability data generally if you see in any vaccine the shelf life or the expiry period is 2 years that means i need to manufacture the vaccine keep it for 2 years or 3 years truly speaking and show that for 3 years whatever the vaccine i produced is uh, uh, efic uh, means the efficiency is uh, sufficient even after 2 years or 3 years of the vaccine manufacture that means i need to wait for 3 3 years here we are not going to do this this is an emergency vaccine the day i may manufacture the day it, re- it goes to hospital it will be used up so i need not wait for 3 months i need not wait for 3 years i can have a vaccine which is stable for only for 3 to 6 months that is enough now so that is where we reduce the time it is not uh, we are not compromising on the safety we are reducing the stability period that will be going on but uh, uh, we are claiming only this vaccine is stable for 3 months or 6 months or something like that so that it is going and all and uh, the adverse events and all are the clinical trials are done and adverse events and all uh, are looked at that and uh, these adverse reactions are there with any vaccine but the adverse reaction say in case of uh, polio uh the polio drops what we use there are chances that one in 1 million kids who are receiving the virus may get polio because of the vaccine that means there is an adverse reaction one in 1 lakh or one in 1 million people need to protecting the uh, kid this vaccine virus is causing disease in them that is the risk we have so what is the benefit because of that risk shall i stop vaccinating the polio vaccinating the kids with polio 
if i am not vaccinating the people three out of every 100 kids will get poliomyelitis so what now you see the risk benefit analysis so for any adverse reaction we need to look at the risk benefit analysis and see whether it uh, whether to go for vaccination or not to go for a vaccination so this risk benefit analysis we will be doing immediately after uh, safety data comes out based upon the safety data and based upon the risk benefit analysis we can go for vaccination without compromising on the safety and uh, for that, WHO also has then some, uh, they announced some path, how to go and all. What is preferred? What is minimum? Critical and minimum. See, a vaccine uh, which can be used for all ages, pregnant, lactating people, that is the preferred vaccine. But I cannot test all these vaccines, uh, whether it is safe in pregnant or not. I may not be able to do in a uh, limited period. We will be, it may take some more time, but if it can work in elderly, if it is safe in elderly, that is enough because elderly people are the most affected people now. If we can save them, or the healthy adults and elderly, if they, if I can target only these people, that is, the vaccine can go to the field. And in the meantime, people can be working on the in pregnant people, in lactating and other things, uh, that can be done uh, in the phased manner. But initially, we can go for the adults and elderly. That is one thing, uh, that is what uh, WHO is also thinking about. And uh, mild transient uh, adverse events. Mild transient adverse events means when a vaccination is given, people may get fever or uh, uh, pain at the site or uh, all those things. But even if I miss mild fever, that's all what is accepted. But even if you get a little bit more this one, the benefits, if the, this is what I am talking about, the cost benefit analysis. If the benefits are more than the risk, yes, we can go ahead with this one. And the efficacy, if the vaccine efficacy say, I would like to have a vaccine which is efficacy, the efficacy is 90% or more than that. That is my wish. But uh, uh, with this vaccine, if 70% efficacy is there, that means out of 100 people, 70 people can be protected. Out of 100 vaccinated people, if 70 can be protected, we can go ahead. And even WHO is talking about, even 50% people can be protected. You can go ahead. That means the this one is lowered. But it is not, uh, uh, we are not lowering the safety or this one, but how the risk analysis, how we can go ahead in a faster manner. And a single dose is preferred, but most probably we, most of the vaccines, we may go for double dose now. Two doses are required because we, we want to get the people immunized and get the antibodies in faster manner. Uh, so, in even the Bar Biotex uh, co vaccine is two dose regimen. Even if, and one single dose also we are trying, but uh, two dose, this one is uh, even if we need to go for two dose, we need to go for that. There is no other op option we have. And uh, route of administration generally in a non parental. Say, already I am talking about intranasal, oral, or something like that. If that comes, nothing like that. Any, we don't need to. <clears throat> How people, I mean, train people for vaccination. You can vaccinate people, millions of the people in shorter period, similar to what we did for uh, uh, oral polio vaccines. But uh, intramuscular or any other route is acceptable if it uh, if it gives a good uh, uh, efficacy and uh, with less uh, safety means issues and all. And uh, where we the other thing is storage. I am not thinking that higher storage temperatures are possible, but especially with the DNA and RNA vaccines, this is possible, but not with other vaccines. Probably we need to live with the two to eight degrees centigrade and uh, multi-dose while presentations are possible. Um, monodose, we need not go, multi-dose presentations are possible. And uh, the most important thing is how rapidly we can scale it up. All these uh, vaccines, how rapidly we can scale it up, only those vaccines can be 
they can uh, be used for uh, large scale uh, vaccinations and uh, other issues what i am looking at is the the important thing is manufacturing facility already we discussed about uh, manufacturing facilities uh, something like a bsl3 facility for inactivated vaccines uh, that is not available for many places so that uh, you can expect uh, this inactivated vaccines in uh, small scale only will be available <clears throat> and the scale up we are developing different technologies now bharat biotech is uh, they developed their in house uh, Mm, scale up technology is something like uh, fixed bed uh, bioreactors and all up to now vaccines are produced in uh, small uh, flasks like thing and uh, they are not sufficient uh, now they are going for the they are man uh, they are uh, they have already ordered uh, several fermenters of thousands of liters capacities and uh, scale up is going to be an issue and uh, how to do the large scale production and all and uh, the another important thing is large scale vaccination whether to go with uh, in act means uh, intramuscular route or something like uh, intranasal or uh, oral comes that, uh, that will be a really big boon for uh, vaccination programs and uh, now several approaches are being developed they are being tested and uh, at the end of this covid probably uh, different delivery mechanisms are being tested first time and different vaccine uh, technologies are tested now something like rna vaccines and the measles uh, based vaccines and other things so some technologies may get established they may change the whole vaccine technology manufacturing technology or some may perish and uh, this will be a, the whole covid vaccine development is a game changer for most of the vaccine manufacturers and uh, let us see uh, we are uh, hoping that there means we are expecting that uh, there will be a lot of changes post covid in uh, whole vaccine manufacturing uh, technologies some companies may close some companies may come up as a big man this one uh, let us uh, see what happens and all and with this uh, uh, i i want to uh, say i want to salute those people who are working uh, with all these uh, vaccines especially Uh, people who are handling this virus in large scale at the risk of their life and uh, risk of their families they uh, i they are the heroes we are just we are outside and uh, we are just giving the policy or uh, how to go ahead and all we are not uh, uh, this one the, the heroes are who are working with the really large scale uh, hundreds of liters of virus is being handled and uh, with the risk at miss it lot of risk of their life and all and uh, they are the heroes i salute them uh, apart from the heroes like already we are talking about uh, healthcare workers police and uh, uh, all the sanitary workers this the risk involved in the vaccine production the people who are working with this uh, virus the risk is many folds because they are work, they are working with the virus in hundreds of liters not that you are touching some place and other things and all so the risk is very high i salute those people and thank you thank you very much thank you for giving me the opportunity thank you sir for your wonderful talk on vaccine development strategies and how vaccines are made and what are the types of vaccines available now and what are the things which are entering the clinical trials so we have few questions uh, we would like you to answer yeah please so can rna i technology be used for developing vaccine although it is a therapy rna i technologies people mm -hmm. tried okay but uh, it did miss uh, similar to rna vaccines already what i was talking about mm -hmm. it is yes. the delivery is an issue mm -hmm. one thing is how fast you can deliver into this one and rna is basically a therapy rather mm -hmm. than a vaccine so um, how fast and how efficiently you can transfer this uh, rna into cells all infected cells so there are millions of infected cells how are you going to deliver to this one so there is there, there is a major problem which uh, people faced 
and that's where uh, you didn't uh, enter into the means real vaccine development uh, programs and all. Uh, I am at present. I am not seeing uh, uh, really it will be a candidate for this one. Uh, now uh, in the 130 or so vaccine platform they develop, this RNA is not a one of them. Uh, you, this all improves once the delivery mechanism improves. So, uh, so as you are saying about the delivery, it should be like orally or IV. So, uh, what do no, you think? No. Not that way. Okay. IV or probably IV or something like that. But mm -hmm. we need to deliver this RNA into the infected cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like so targeted. in general, if I am talking about RNA, I need mm -hmm. to deliver into any cell. Okay. The cell is not an important thing. If you can deliver into say human cells, that is better. Even mm -hmm. muscle cell is also okay. The protein mm -hmm. is produced and that is uh, released out. It, which acts as an antigen. Whereas okay. RNA as a therapy, it need to enter into the cell which is infected by the virus. Mm -hmm. So your uh, this one is very wide. That that's where is the problem. Okay. So there is one more question about uh, will COVID nineteen will attain a state where it can gradually reduce on its own, or did we will find vaccine before that? So what is your opinion on that? Uh, COVID-19, okay, whenever, a virus, okay, let us little bit uh, go to the uh, fitness of a virus, uh, yes. how, how a virus behaves, mm -hmm. if, if I am a virus, okay, mm -hmm. what I will try to do, I will not, means, what I will try to do is, I will try to replicate myself in a host, mm -hmm. okay, I don't want to kill my host, until my host kills me, unless my host kills me. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is a this one between my host and me. So host will try to produce the immune response. And uh, so before host immune response produces its immune response, I would like to come out. The virus would like to come out of the host and find another host. That means, uh, so if I kill the host, if the virus kills the host within short period, say one or two days or three days, what happens? It may not come out of that host. So it also will get killed. That means it is not in the interest of the virus to kill the host in general. Okay. So, like, but if I have a host which where I cannot kill, the virus has a host, another host, where it cannot, it can replicate without killing the host. And you human being is a, uh, just uh, by accidental host. Okay. okay. In case of rabies, what is mm -hmm. happening? Human being is a, a accidental host. So yes. even if it, uh, the host is killed, nothing is going to happen to the virus. The virus is surviving mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So in case of COVID, it is not killing the host uh, in very high numbers. So it is living with the host. Very few people are dying or 1 to 2 percent or 3 percent, the two with comorbidity or the, with the other conditions. Other is conditions the yes. So, uh, it is not behaving like uh, the virus which has some other uh, host so that it can kill all these things. So, mm -hmm. uh, what I see is it will survive along with us and it is going to stay with us. Okay. Uh, and more, faster we can do the vaccination faster uh, it can be controlled we can get the we can attain the uh, this one to two percent people also we can we can save that's all the uh, target now <laughs> thank you sir for answering so how do you see uh, the covid infecting range in age wise like uh, to adults it is more infectious or uh, towards children uh, no, this is not my domain actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I am not a human doctor. Yes, I am a veterinarian. But in general, yes, what we are seeing is uh, uh, more than sixty years is that's where is the major uh, uh, mortality is seen. Mm -hmm. and probably one uh, some other uh, uh, this question may be answered by uh, oh, doctor, who is really a clinician is the better person. But in okay. general. Uh, young adults and other people are uh, 
more uh, resistant or they are not seeing real uh, uh, disease. Mm -hmm. But uh, a clinician is a better person than me. Okay, sir. So in your uh, vaccinology uh, techniques, so so in any way, like, uh, did you use any in silico or computation based study uh, to arrive at a certain, uh, certain vaccine model or something like that? Um, yeah, or it's definitely. Based on, uh, uh, definitely yes. Um, yeah, definitely. Actually, first thing what we will be doing is uh, looking at its structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second thing, important thing will be how to stabilize the structure. Okay. Virus, virus may not have a very stable structure of its protein mm -hmm. because it don't want actually a stable protein. The protein is the say if you take this uh, spike protein, this is used only to for the virus to enter into the cell. So mm -hmm. for that it need a once it enters into the cell, the outer coat should be go go away. That means mm -hmm. it should have uh, some instability. It is true for most of the viruses. They should have mm -hmm. some instability. If I produce very stable virus, a stable structure, its infectivity is gone. Okay. It cannot release its RNA into the cell. So mm -hmm. for a vaccine, definitely I want a very stable structure. So okay. we will be definitely working on this uh, structural uh, analysis to mm -hmm. say in case of a uh, subunit vaccine, I want very okay. stable structure. So in that case, definitely we will be using inactivated mm -hmm. vaccines. Most of the times we will not be doing much, uh, except we will be using some uh, experience, uh, mm -hmm. something like sugars, proteins and all to make it more stable, to make it mm -hmm. more thermostable. Okay. But that is a big science for us mm -hmm. to make yes. them thermostable and all. to optimize. So, the way yeah. so that my vaccine will be stable at uh, even at room temperature my vaccine is stable for three to four years all those things mm -hmm. so that part we will be working so thank you sir uh, for the wonderful explanation and one last final question which is like very common so we have a virus now so what will happen if it mutate will the vaccination the vaccine developer will work on that or how to tackle with these things yeah good question and uh, most of the times we encounter this question. <laughs> as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned, okay, coming to coronaviruses, mm -hmm. in general, RNA viruses are considered more mutating viruses. Okay. Their RNA polymerase is not having, uh, say, um, uh, it, it, uh, when it is copying the RNA, it, uh, Copies the, it makes a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. When it is copying RNA, it makes a lot of mistakes. Those mistakes are mutations. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yes. whereas uh, coronavirus, this is the only RNA virus which is having a mechanism to identify mm -hmm. the mistakes and correct them. Mm -hmm. Similar to most of these uh, DNAs, it has the mechanism to correct it. Okay. okay. That is what we call replication fidelity and other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is having very less mutations compared to any other RNA. So, okay. and I am not seeing uh, uh, these uh, mutations. A strain mm -hmm. will be making a lot of difference, mm -hmm. but we will never know. Okay. And hopefully this will be a single strain which can protect most of the, whatever the mutations we are, we are seeing. Okay. It is un you. unlike, uh, say, influenza mm -hmm. vaccines. Influenza okay. vaccines are uh, uh, known for their mutations, known for their uh, mm -hmm. uh, genetic drift, uh, means, uh, antigenic drift as well as shift, both. Mm -hmm. Here there is no drift. Shift will be there, but uh, I, I am really not seeing that much. And uh, okay. there is not even 1% difference what we are seeing uh, during the last 5-6 months. Mm -hmm. So I am not seeing that. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your wonderful explanation of vaccine technology as well as answering to all our questions patiently. Thank you, sir.
thank you very much uh, thank you thank you for the uh, opportunity given and uh, uh, this is an opportunity for the, to interact with the other people and especially students um, biotech students and all yes vaccine field in india has come to a stage and we are going to lead the world the vaccine companies yes. indian vaccine companies are going to lead the world yeah thank you thank you for the giving the opportunity we can tell like yeah. vaccine engineering yeah thank you sir for the wonderful opportunity uh, wonderful presentation and uh, this was an eye opening presentation as well for many students to think for the field of vaccine engineering so thank you thank you very much sir thank you Uh, so prana can we have a short break say another 20 minutes okay, sorry my mic was off uh, yeah we can have a break now so we'll resume at 3:15 yes it will be better so 3:15 we'll resume and the post presentation and oral presentation will be at 3:15 participants uh, you can leave and join with the same link make sure you join at the right time thank you
Hello, Prana. Yes, yes. You are there. Yeah. Okay. So you got the schedule, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so do you want me to introduce or you will be in the forefront? No, you can evaluate. I'll just tell them. Uh, I can just, I can evaluate it anyway. But, uh, but do you, uh, do you want me to host now or you will call out the names? Maybe I can also alternate in asking questions. It should be okay. We can do it like. The only thing do. is I have to, yeah, yeah, I can do alternative also. Because the only thing is I get, um, sometimes if I unmute un others, or muting others, I also get muted, no? Yeah. Yeah, that is the only, only difficulty. Okay, then maybe we can call out. Yeah. In three, in two minutes, the first. Yes. First, first person is G. Aishwarya. The first presenter will be. Aishwarya. Yeah, she's here. Aishwarya. So we have Aishwarya. I think we both can ask Q and A. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I will be in the background evaluating. Yeah, if you have a question at the time, you can ask. Not a problem. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So I hope every participants are back now. Who are going to present poster or oral? So our first presenter will be G. Aishwarya. Hello, Aishwarya, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, so the instructions for the oral and poster presenters. So for the oral presentation, the time limit, uh, due to the time constraints, we are limiting it to seven minutes of presentation, followed by three minutes of question and answer session. And for poster presentation, there will be five minutes presentation, followed by two minutes of question and answer session. So make sure to finish your talk within the time. So if you exceed, uh, it will be again, the next speaker will not get a chance to complete his full talk. So make sure you are talk is within the time limit of five to seven minutes. Shall we start? So now first I welcome uh, G. Aishwarya to share your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Oh no, not it. No. No. Uh, there will be option. You are presenting from yours, right? Uh, you are G I S. Yeah. I'm giving you the presenter role. You can start sharing actually. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah. A very good afternoon to each and every one of you present here. 
I am Jia Shwarya from Second Biotechnology. Today I will be presenting over the topic screening of phytochemical components of Tenospora cardifolia for their inhibitory activity on SARS-CoV-2 and in silico study. I would like to begin my presentation with a brief introduction. As we all know, coronavirus disease is an infectious disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. As of now, it has affected over 10.6 million people across the globe, which resulted in more than 5,16,000 deaths. The symptoms of this disease include fever, cough, fatigue, etc. Coronaviruses are positive sense RNA viruses with non-segmented genomes and overlapping open reading frame with a size genome structures ranging from 28 to 32 kilobytes. The coronavirus regularly undergo recombination after infecting host cells. The proteases of novel coronavirus has very similar sequence and structure when compared to SARS coronavirus. This main viral protease is responsible for controlling the activity of coronavirus replication complex. So, it is used as an attractive target for therapy. Novel coronavirus infection sometimes results in the overactivation of CD4 affected T cells, leading to excessive production of inflammatory cytokines. This process is called as cytokine storm. This might ultimately result in organ failure. There are several medicinal plants and their extracts with the potential to inhibit the over-inflammatory response of cytokines. One such plant is Tenophora cardifolia. Tenospora is native plant of India and it is commonly referred as Kuduchi, Hatleaf, Munsi, etc. based on the geographical region. It is being used in Ayurvedic formulation as a medicine to treat several diseases. The phytochemical studies of this plant reveal the presence of many components in it, such as Tenospornon, Berberine, etc. These phytochemicals have the potential to inhibit the active site of main protease, thereby the result in the cyto uh, reducing the cytokine storm. Let's move on to the next slide. The objective was of the study was to was phytochemical constituents of tinos tinospora and their respective binding affinity, targeting the active site pocket of main protease of SARS-CoV-2. This was performed by molecular docking studies using Promax 2020.2 version. The methodology involved three steps. The initial step was protein preparation for docking. In this step, the main protease in the complex with inhibitor was selected from PDB and the ligands bound to the protein were removed using Chimera. Then structure-based virtual screening was performed. In the next step, which is second step, it involves lichen preparation virtual screening. In this, 3D STF format of 11 phytochemicals were downloaded from IMP PAT database. Then, energy minimized was performed using Chimera. Hydrogen atoms were added before docking and top two lichen poses were obtained. They were used for further analysis. The final step is molecular dynamic simulations in this step, the complex of main protease and top-ranking phytochemical drug candidate were prepared for molecular dynamic simulations and they were run for 10 nanoseconds using Chromax 2020.2. The table in the slide exhibits the binding energy and ADME properties of the selected five phytochemicals. These five phytochemicals uh, namely tenospornon, xenosponic acid, cardiofoliocyte B, terpatine, and berberine showed the best docking scores, namely minus 7.7, minus 7.5, minus 7.3, minus 6.6, .6, and minus 6.5 kilocalorie per mole respectively. By the table, we can conclude that the best binding energy value was obtained for tenospornon. Moving on to the next slide. In this slide, we can find the images which represent the docking pores and like an interaction of the respective phytochemical with the 3CL main protease. Here, the figure 4 and figure 5 represent the docking pores and like an interaction of turpentine molecule and berberine with main protease. The molecular dynamic simulation analysis 
confirm the stability of tenospornon and 3CL pro complex with random mean square deviation value RMST analysis value of 0.1 nanometer and it is represented by this graph which you can see on the slide results moving on to the results the stable docking ports of tenospornon xanospuric acid cardiofolocyte b terbutine and berberine with main protease showed the best docking scores among which the best binding energy value was obtained for tenospornon docking results suggest that the top 5 phytochemical molecules has the potential protease inhibitors and the computational studies also predict the potential inhibitors that could work at in silico level i would like to conclude based on the virtual screening and molecular docking analysis the phytochemicals which are top 5 phytochemicals uh, of tenospora cardifolia were identified as a possible lead molecules to fight against sars coronavirus 2 I would like to thank Dr. Venkateshwarlu and Dr. Kupanidhi for giving me the opportunity to take part in the uh, article. And this article was accepted. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ashurya, for your presentation. So there are uh, there is a question. This is an anti-inflammatory active plant. So, how can we use this for uh, protease inhibitor? So, uh, this plant contains phytochemicals which are responsible for inhibiting the cytokines, which uh, which uh, uh, trigger the inflammatory action. Okay. So, by so it's not stop against the virus, right? That uh, virus is uh, responsible for uh, cytokine storm, right? So the cytokine yeah. storm can be inhibited by the phytochemicals present in the stenospora. So, so this is more of like an immune suppression, right? Yeah. So, okay. So any more questions? So, Hello. Sorry, Hello. can you type your questions uh, in the chat box? Hello. Participants are requested to type your questions in the chat box. So there is one more question. What is your understanding about TPSA? What is TPSA? I don't know. Okay, no problem. So, uh, so you have screened the compounds, right? So again, which protein you have screened? Uh, it is against the main protease of novel coronavirus. Okay, so you have taken the uh, uh, 3CL main protease. No, no, I mean the structure from PDB or model structure? Yeah. No, uh, from PDB you have uh, the X-ray solved structure or the... Yeah, it was uh, uh, taken from PDB. Okay, PDBs. So, what is uh, how you are thinking we can go further with this uh, study? Any idea? Any future perspective for this work? Yeah, till now only in silico studies were performed, and uh, it was found that they have potential for uh, uh, inhibiting the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So, further uh, studies can be performed to prove the same. Okay. Thank you for answering the questions. Okay. Hello. So now we'll move to the next presenter, Rohini Krishna. Yes, sir, I'm here. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Allow 
Emerald Lombard. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, you are starting to share. Yes, I am. Okay, good. We can't display or share. Sir is saying that we can't display or share content. Make sure that you have allowed permission to share content and try again. Recently, you have taken the presenter role. Okay. If there is an echo. Yeah. You can click the option share content. Sir, uh, I'm on Abraham's computer. Yeah, yeah, same. same. The, I have given the role. No, it's not coming. I, I, I can check without one. Yeah, uh, yeah, you are the presenter now. Yeah. You can mute the uh, YouTube, which is playing in the background. You can just click uh, share content and to share your slides. One second. Okay, share now. Not. No, it's not happening, sir. Well, there is something uh, wrong from your side, actually. Can you rejoin? Yes, I do. Okay. Then shall we move to the next presenter in the meanwhile? Yes, sir. Yes, no problem. The next presenter is Sandeep. Is this Sandeep? Okay, okay. Can you share? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are not able to see your screen, so. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, your content is started to share. Okay, can you see, sir? Uh, not yet. One second. Yeah, now we can see. You can go to presentation mode and you can start. Make sure to finish in yeah, seven yeah. minutes. Yeah, Thank sure. You. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Sandeep Dopalapudi from uh, Chebrolu Hanumaya Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Currently, I'm working as an assistant professor over here and I'm doing my PhD. So today I'm here to discuss about the herbal battle against COVID-19. So this is just a review basis review based article that means how the plants are going to help in this treatment of covid 19 so coming first of all, we know the introduction basic things about this coronavirus which have started in the wuhan city and uh, generally it, it occurs it occurs due to the this novel coronavirus and it mostly causes the symptoms like chest pain cough uh, the body pains or chills sinusitis but the diarrhea conditions and fever, everything we all know this about. We all know about this. 
and mostly the incubation period for this coronavirus is 14 days and it mostly affect the lungs in our body which severely damage our respiratory system which may also lead to death and majorly it can be prevented by avoiding the close contact with animals and frequent washing of uh, hands with soap and uh, not traveling to other places or the new places where the virus was in uh, outbreak and using masks which the government was asking us to follow and also avoiding contact with the other people those who are affected with this coronavirus according to the approaches for the treatment of this coronavirus majorly we are having the five different approaches the first one is drugs and second one is vaccines and third one is antibody therapy and next one plant derived chemicals and herbal remedies and for all these we all know about the first three things that is the drugs which we are which we are using the vaccines which we are trying to develop and the antibody therapy which we are to follow using the plasma treatment or the plasma therapy but apart from that we can also go for the usage of the normal home remedies or the normal plant derived things which we are having or which we are using in our day to day life but these are only useful for the lowest conditions or to remove the symptoms of these things so just it, it relieves us from the symptoms coming to the treatment strategies we can mainly go through these three things one is the usage of repurposed drugs that means the other disease treatment drugs like uh, ebola treatment drugs or hiv treatment drugs or the malaria treatment drugs they can be used over here but they are not the primary source but they can also be used over here then coming to the antibody therapy that means we need to develop the antibodies against this sars cov2 virus and the this they can be developed through this recombinant dna technology or dna technology and they can be introduced into the patient uh, mostly it is related to the biotechnological department and third one is development of the vaccine that is most of the companies which are trying to develop it and these three are the major uh, things which we are having now and wide research is going through this and uh, today in news also we have uh, seen that uh, that bharat biotech is developing some vaccine and uh, along with the indian drugs so it is also going to launch in year by august 15th or something like that and my point is why herbal sources so why we need to go through this so because of these four reasons the primary thing is they are easily available anywhere and second one is they are of economic that is low cost and third one is they are widely accepted because uh, almost all the people you know uh, whether uh, the synthetic ones are placed side by side most of the people they prefer the natural ones okay so it is the mindset of the people and because they also causes some less side effects when compared to the synthetic drugs and how we can uh, start this uh, how we can battle that means by using this herbal medicine we can go through four different approaches the first one is the using of fruits or herbs which we can take through diet that means they improves our immunity system because we know that this covid 19 majorly affects the immune system so by improving our immune system we can uh, prevent this covid 19 infections and second by usage of antiviral masks that means the development of the masks which are coated with the plant derived products okay. and third one is usage of this air disinfectants that means the essential oils uh, uh, which can treat the virus which is present in the air and next one is by using the sanitizing agents so we are using the alcohol based sanitizers instead of that we can also go for the this natural derived uh, sanitizing agents so i am going to discuss about the and first coming to this uh, the past plant derivatives which are active against the coronavirus so pastly i mean uh, not now but before this forms of this coronavirus like sars or mers so some research was also done on that viruses so on those viruses these plants showed effect that is the first the common thing the camellia sinensis we all know it as a tea this tea plants or this extracts from the teas they inhibits the viral rna polymerase and next one is nicotiana tobacco so we all know the common thing tobacco so it also inhibits the viral attachment so attachment to the host cells was inhibited by this and next one is tryptorigium regali so it is also called as thunder god wine and it also inhibits the viral protease enzyme and next one is laurus nobilis which is called as sweet bay and this inhibits the viral replication scrofularia scorodonium 
and this is also called as FIGBOT and this inhibits the viral penetration. That means the entry of virus into the host cell. And next one is Thuja orientalis and it is commonly called as Mod Punky in India. I mean, uh, all of the places you can see this uh, normally we, we see it as a decorative plant in, uh, in our gardens or in our colleges, more or places, but it is having actual antiviral effect. So it inhibits the process of viral replication. And next one is Gala chinensis. It is the nut gall. It inhibits the viral entry. And Stephania tetranda, it is called as fangi. And it also inhibits the viral replication as well as expression process. And coming to the development of a herbal mask, how we can develop a herbal mask? So first we need to take the Indian medicinal plants which are having the uh, properties or any medicinal plants which are having the antiviral properties. They are mixed with the normal cotton plant fibers and through the process of electrospinning, we can produce nanofibers. And these nanofibers can be incorporated into the mask. And this mask, it can be made out of the three layers. And in the inner layer, we shouldn't uh, use this uh, fiber. Only the outer layer and middle layer are composed with this the plant derived things. And with the help of these masks, the mask will filter the air. And if the air contains any virus, the plant materials which are present in the mask, it will kill the virus automatically so that the patient will not have that much. Okay. So it is one of the things. And natural derivatives, we have seen the news also, even at the starting stage of the COVID-19, many countries, including the US, they have first gone for this hydroxychloroquine, HCQ, even our India has supplied it to the foreign countries also. That HCQ or the hydroxychloroquine, it is obtained from the natural plant, Cinchona officinalis, which is commonly called as Jesuit's bark. And it is, it shows this uh, antiviral effect by inhibiting the viral fusion with the host cell. And another plant which also having the most effect is Rheum rhubarbarum, which is called as garden rhubarb, and it also inhibits the viral attachment with the host cell. And the major derivative of this Rheum rhubarbarum is MOD. And next one is Colchicum autumn nail, which is commonly called as autumn crocus. And it not directly treats this COVID-19, but the COVID-19 patients is likely to have other symptoms also. That means most of the patients have suffered with the myopathy. So that myopathy can be treated by using this Colchicum. Being tested now, so that is one is Vithania somnifera, which is commonly called as Ashwagandha, that is the winter cherry. Actually, using this Ashwagandha, our Indian uh, uh, development, uh, Indian Ayush Ministry, they have uh, started a project on this uh, Vithania somnifera. They want to develop a product called as Ayush 64, that is the trade name which they are uh, thinking to give. They mix it with Vithania somnifera with other medicinal plants, and they are trying to develop some drug which is used to treat this COVID-19. And another one is Artemic. So this Artemic is nothing but it is a combination of Artemisia annua, that is the sweet wormwood, which contains the Artemis in it, along with the curcuma longa, we commonly know it as turmeric. It contains this curcumin. So the name was Artemic, which is a combination of Artemisin as well as curcuma longa. Here a micellar formulation was developed, which shows this antiviral as well as antioxidant properties. It also showed uh, some good effect over the COVID-19 patients, but only in mild or moderate conditions. And by taking the diet which boosts the immunity, this is the ginger, uh, garlic, or black cumin seeds, or basil leaves, or vitamin C rich foods. They all commonly known to, to boost the immunity. And essential oils, which can be used as disinfectants or sanitizers, like Laurus nobilis, which contains beta osmine, alpha, and beta pinene. And the commonly used mentha piperita, which contains the menthol, and thymus vulgaris, which contains borneol, carvacrol, and thymol and eucalyptus globulus, which contains alpha pinene and gamma tetanine. So these are, uh, they contains, they are rich in essential oils. So these essential oils can be used in sanitizers as well as uh, the effluous, so which can uh, spray or which can kill viruses. And finally, I want to conclude that these are the herbal strategies which can be treated or which can be used for the treatment or the prevention of exposure of COVID-19 up to some extent. I'm not saying that it, they can 100% cure this COVID-19, but they are one of the alternative strategies. So some people, uh, they believe in herbs. So for those people, uh, they can use this and these are all easily available and they can be easily uh, they can be easily available. So they are used widely. And but, uh, last but not least, I would say a line about the cytokine storm because when these are of levels, they may cause a cytokine storm that is the overactivation of immune system, which could be dangerous. So always, if you are using herbal products, then definitely you should consult a doctor first or a physician who have 
knowledge about these drugs and then you need to move forward and finally i would like to thank nyan university and my college chebrol harme institute of pharmaceutical sciences for giving me this opportunity thank you everyone thank you for your presentation sandeep so yeah thank you. there is one question so in case of cotton or uh, i am not sure what the mean cotton yeah. herbs to make nano tissue does the herbal yeah. herb needs to be exerts in activity in like nano soluble like non soluble state or anything so you are converting uh, no. masks or tissues yeah. right yeah 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 so actually so uh, they yeah actually they will develop uh, one uh, spin spinner types uh, spinner type uh, machine will be there so using mm -hmm. this spinner they will develop the nano fiber particles that means the cotton fibers are mixed with the herbal drugs so okay. they will they will combine with each other and uh, you you won't see any type of salts or uh, it, it will be completely soluble that means if you are just mm -hmm. taking a cloth and you you are just dipping it in the oil then you can uh, you cannot see anything like that. so they, they are also developed like that only okay kai sorry participant kindly mute yourself so what is the best formulation uh, you recommend for this consumption of these herbal plants like uh, you are telling as an extract or should we go for the identifying the compound uh, sir i couldn't understand you Maybe sorry uh, what is the best formulation recommended for uh, consumption of these uh, plants actually okay okay so the best formulation we can we can go through is uh, the suspension or elixirs because they are easily uh, easily taken or uh, uh, you can easily add some sweetening agents to that also because it will be more palatable or it, it is more accept it is more widely accepted by all the age groups so you can uh, go for the suspensions or elixirs which have definitely a sweetening agent okay so how does uh, inhaling herbal extracts through mask can help in preventing uh covid transmission okay okay so actually the, uh, this might be the mistake one so i have not uh, said about the in you can use this mask so the mask contains the herbal extracts and if you are inhaling if when you are inhaling the air the virus can be prevented in the three layers of the mask itself because uh, middle you are using the herbal extracts over there Thank you, Sandeep, for your presentation. Thank you. So we'll move to the next speaker, Rohini Krishna. Um, I'm here. So am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You can start sharing. Yeah. You are able to share? Uh, one second, sir. Yes, your screen is visible. Yeah. Video. You can press Control L to make it full screen. Okay. Control L. Control. L. No, it's not happening here. Okay. So can okay. Okay. no problem. We can start. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, all. So I'm here to make you familiarize with the technique which is called as immuno PCR or immuno capture PCR for the sensitive detection of COVID-19. So, 
Yeah, I don't want to talk much on the introduction part for time being. So uh, this COVID-19 was first identified in the year 2019 in the city of Wuhan and hence it is named as COVID-19. The symptoms vary from mild to moderate uh, and the symptoms and severity of the infection is different in different kinds of people. Uh, the people who are elder or the infants are much higher risk for this COVID-19. These are the incidents given by WHO. It's the graph. Yeah. So getting into my study, not just COVID-19, in any of the disease, the diagnosis and the detection strategies will always have some uncertainties and disadvantages. This uncertainties can be caused because of the particular reason such as if we talk about COVID-19, the uncertainties in the ELISA or RT-PCR or PCR are if it, if it comes to ELISA, we all know that ELISA is mainly based on the detection of antibody in the patient serum. To detect the antibody in the patient serum, the ELISA should need a detectable load of antibodies which can develop only at a particular period of infection. So if you collect the sample or the specimen early before the onset of infection, the detectable load of antigen might not be there. So it will uh, affect the result of the ELISA. Also, we all know that coronavirus is a close related to SARS, hence it is named as SARS-CoV-2. ELISA might show cross-reactivity with the closely related uh, viruses. If you talk about PCR, the disadvantage with RT-PCR and QRT-PCR are uh, one thing is matrix inhibition because of the contaminants that are present in the biological specimen and other disadvantages are poor handling or poor collection of the samples, poor shipping of the samples, whatever. So I want to plan a study uh, on the direction of uh, COVID-19 employing IgY antibodies. Uh, so I want to uh, make you know about the prominence of IgY, why I have chosen IgY for this particular study. IgY is similar to mammalian IgG that is produced by birds. The main advantage lies in the higher yields of IgY. That is single IgA has 40 to 80 mg of antibody that is huge when compared to some other sources. And if you talk about the animal welfare, the, stu the study has all non-invasive protocols for antibody collection or harvesting. So simply you can take egg and harvest your antibodies. Uh, this picture depicts the importance of diagnosis in any disease. Before starting uh, the topic, I want to make a comparison because I'm saying that IPCR can be a better alternative for the detection of COVID-19. For that sake, I want to compare the PCR versus IPCR or immunocaptured PCR. So I've already told that PCR has some disadvantages. So PCR is always a double edged sword, like it has both false negatives and false positives at both the ends. Also, the cross-contamination when people working or the laboratory personnel should work on multiple samples in case of uh, COVID pandemic or some other pandemic. So cross-contamination might be there when one is working with multiple samples. And other thing is that contamination uh, problem uh, will be there, the matrix inhibition because of the contaminants that are there with the sample. So these are the uh, disadvantages of PCR, but how can you cope up with the disadvantages of PCR with immunocapture PCR? So the immunocapture PCR starts with the capturing of antigen that is present in the specimen. So before subjecting, subjecting the sample to the PCR, there is a step washing, a step called washing before going to the PCR. Because of this washing step, you can eliminate the contaminants that are there in the sample. And one more advantage with the immunocapture PCR is, if we have, once we coat the antibody to the PCR tube, and you can store that PCR tube or PCR strips uh, for a period of up to six months under minus 20 without affecting the binding capacity. The, the, the shelf life will be more. So uh, a part of my PhD work is to plan an immunocapture PCR for the differential detection of Staphylococcus aureus. In this study, we have raised IgY antibodies against a surface protein called protein A for the Staphylococcus aureus. And we plan uh, to design an immunocapture PCR and we did it. So the first figure is the schematic representation of how an immunocapture PCR actually looks. If you see the step one, there is an antibody raised against protein A of Staphylococcus aureus, this one. 
So this is the PCR tube that is coated with anti-protein A IgY. That is antibodies raised against protein A of Staphylococcus aureus. Once you put the specimen, the antigen will get will be get captured by the antibody. This is the first dimension of the study. That is ELISA. After that, you are going to put the PCR mixture having the gene specific primers and then go for the amplification. So this is how immunocapture PCR looks. If you look at the sequence of the uh, steps that are followed in the study, this one is the antibody harvest after immunization. So this is the gel, the GSP gel showing purified antibody. Before going into the study, we want to uh, test the reactivity of the antibodies that we have harvested. So this is the blot uh, with standards we have tested. So this is the blot showing reactivity because this, this contains anti-protein A IgY and this is the blot that is treated with NAY IgY, so no reactivity. So once we have confirmed the reactivity, we need to standardize the protocol of immunocapture PCR. For standardization, we have again chosen the standards of Staphylococcus aureus. So after standardizing, we need to measure two important parameters. The, these two important parameters are really important for any of the diagnosis uh, approaches. So these parameters are one is sensitivity, other one is specificity. So this image is the sensitivity uh, containing different uh, uh, dilutions of cells. And this is specificity containing Staphylococcus aureus along with some other microbes. So yeah, this is the end of our study. This is the part of my PhD. Now I want to apply the same strategy uh, but the replacement of bacteria with the virus that is COVID-19. We, we have to choose the surface proteins as our targets because they are easily accessible for binding. So in this study we want to choose nucleocapsid protein and spike protein as our targets. So 6 and 16 tag nucleocapsid and 6 and 16 tag spike constructs will be transformed, cloned and expressed into the E. coli. And then we want to purify the recombinant protein using affinity chromatography with NIMT-Resin because histidine and resin has uh, affinity to bind each other. Now the eluted and purified protein will be used for further immunizations to raise antibodies. The immunization schedule will be followed uh, as it is depicted in this figure. We do one booster dose followed by three subsequent immunizations with an interval of 10 days each. After raising antibodies, we need to plan a IPCR. So the anti-nucleocapsid IgY and anti-spike IgY were coated to a PCR tube and to that tube we, go, we are going to put the patient specimen that is inactivated by heat or phenol. We will allow them to incubate and after incubation we are going to wash it and after washing we are going to put the PCR mixture having real uh, sorry reverse transcript trace and we are going to subject it to one step RT-PCR where the product will get amplified. And that's how we can read the result. So coming to the conclusion, this is how it looks. Yeah. So coming to the conclusion, um, so it can be a better argument because the significance of IPCR is it is highly sensitive. Even it can detect extremely low levels of antigen. That is even one picogram is enough. Being a two-dimensional study, it is highly specific. And one good advantage is that we are going to employ the avian immunoglobulins. So we can completely eliminate the invasive protocols in our study and also we get higher yields of antibody which is not possible with serum or uh, taking serum or some other um, things. So yeah, I want to conclude that this can be a great idea for someone to work on the diagnosis of COVID-19. So yeah. Participants, kindly mute yourself. Thank you, Rohini, for your yeah. presentation. Thank you, sir. So, what? Uh, there are a few questions which I would like to ask. Yeah. So, you have the, you are telling about a protocol which can be used as an alternative for testing, ha. right? Ha ha, sir. So, what is the time frame? Like normally, although there are some false negatives in these existing tests, but uh, how, what about the time for conducting yeah. this test? Yeah. Which was interesting. Yeah, the time frame will be the same as uh, we do for RT-PCR because 
the antifreeze once we raise now we can coat the tubes and store it in a, a minus 20 degrees so the experimental time will be around one and a half to two hours so it, it is same so we need to go for a field application by applying the same strategy so we are in a plan to work on it too to reduce the time frame and uh, it can be useful if we plan for field applications the same strategy so yeah we are in a plan to work for it reduce the time frame so what would be the sample requirement uh, for this and uh, what do you mean by non invasive protocol yeah non invasive protocol why i am mentioning non invasive protocol is uh, if we immunize mice or rabbit or some other mammal for antibody harvest we need lots of blood uh, of the animal so we need to go for invasive protocols like we need to collect blood or something but uh, if it comes to igy can simply take the egg after immunization and this yolk has uh, abundance of antibody with it so yeah this is non invasive when it comes to antibody harvest okay so, so is there any more questions so rohini sir uh, ma'am uh, normally people use uh, mm. rats or rabbits yes uh, Uh, what, so the reason, uh, so how best is uh, egg yolk to rats and rabbits? Yeah, ma'am, uh, I want to tell you that my PhD is uh, with this IgY avian immunoglobulins. I work with Staphylococcus aureus. Some of the organisms like Staphylococcus aureus have this immunoglobulin binding protein, which can be termed as immune disguises. So some of the proteins like SBI and SPA that are present in Staphylococcus aureus have the tendency to bind mammalian immunoglobulins because of structural uh, discrepancies between IgG and IgY. So in such mm -hmm. case, <clears throat> it leads to false positives. Man. So to eliminate the false positive uh, in the diagnosis of organisms like Staphylococcus aureus, we replace this mammalian immunoglobulin with avian immunoglobulin. Because this IgY has additional constant amine CH4, so structurally and functionally also it is different. So that this mm -hmm. SBI and SP interferon proteins can't bind IgY easily. So we can minimize the false positive when it comes to immune disguises. And that is one mm -hmm. good advantage when we screen such organisms. But coming to this COVID-19, so you can uh, plan the same work like uh, you can use the IgY immunoglobulins for any detection. Mm -hmm. so, yes, ma'am. You can. And what was the initial? What was the initial idea of uh, using this uh, Staphylococcus aureus? Uh, sorry if I had not gone to uh, our listen to you in the first place. Okay. Uh, but what was the initial idea? Why you chose this? Initial idea of us. Area? Yeah. Initial idea idea of did uh, or using uh, the differential detection. Use yeah. in this bacteria. Yeah, there are few existing strategies. Also, uh, there are some kits for detection of Staphylococcus aureus, ma'am. It is fine if you want to detect uh, the old organism. That is fine. It works fine because even if the immune disguise protein will bind, it will say that there is a presence of organism. But if you want to go for toxin-specific detection, it is not possible because these will act as interfering proteins. So targeting mm. a single toxin is a little tricky in case of Staphylococcus aureus. So we have mm -hmm. a, a plan to already uh, we have done uh, we have proven that SBI has no affinity to bind IgY uh, in two thousand eighteen, ma'am. So now we want mm -hmm. to work on immuno. It's all already done. I have shown the results to this IPCR thing. Now we mm -hmm. have an idea to work the same approach uh, with respect to COVID nineteen. So we we should see how far it works. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are moving to the next presenter. Yes, sir, I'm Dr. Venkat Ramreddy. Venkat Ramreddy. Yeah. So uh, let me share my. So I am assigning you as a presenter. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we can see your video. Uh, can you share your slides? I clicked uh, sharing. Share content. Yes, share content. Yes, uh, we can see your screen.
Right, okay, so here is my PPT. So, are you able to see my screen? Yes. You can start to set it. Okay. So, good afternoon to everyone. This is Dr. Venkatram Reddy. Uh, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Zoology, Yoga Vyamana University, Kadapa. Today I'm going to present a brief uh, review on uh, COVID-19 virology and some of the findings in the molecular pathogenesis. So, <clears throat> uh, coronavirus outbreak is not new to the humans, right? So, actually it was happened in 2003 uh, the first outbreak was uh, SARS. So where you see the bats was identified as the primary uh, reservoir is coronavirus. And then it got mutated enough to transfer into the secondary host civet. And then finally it uh, got uh, mutated and further infected to humans. When you see the fatality rate there, only 10% is there. Coming to the mass after several years, like in 2012, Again, the bat was the source for this uh, thing and got mutated and entered into the camel and then humans. So here, the fatality rate was uh, higher compared to the SARS. And coming to this current pandemic, SARS-CoV-2, that is COVID-2019, uh, the fatality rate is less, but infectivity rate is uh, very high compared to other two uh, outbreaks. Here, the bats, uh, was thinking that they are uh, these primary sources and but so far there is no evidence suggesting that uh, they are the source for this uh, because uh, in the Wuhan when it was uh, outbreak was seen there is, was no bats was selling in the Wuhan market so that is why there is still no evidence uh, proper evidence saying that uh, it is uh, having things and then coming to the virology most of the speakers already mentioned about these things. Uh, they are basically uh, two types, uh, the serologically and genotypically identified. They are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. So basically human coronaviruses infections are caused by two different coronaviruses that are alpha and beta. So SARS-CoV belongs to the beta coronaviruses. And as you all know that it is a positive sense single standard virus with uh, uh, enveloped uh, viruses. And then coming to the uh, genome-wide analysis, the SARS-CoV virus, uh, the COVID-19 has 79.5% with uh, the first outbreak, SARS-CoV, and 50% sequence similarity with uh, MERS-CoV, suggesting that they, it was the origin from the coronaviruses that causes the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, interestingly, 95%, approximately 95% similarity was identified with the mainly uh, replicase domain, which is the ORF uh, that is uh, similar to SARS-CoV. And as you know that this is a retrovirus, uh, they have the inherent property that causes uh, high mutation rate. And also why BATS was saying that it is a primary because they are matching with uh, 80, a seven or eighty-eight percent with the bad coronavirus. That is why they, it could be the basic reason uh, why it is uh, originated from bats. Was thinking it was believed, and then though the SARS-CoV was very close to bats, but it was very close to SARS-CoV in respect to the receptor binding domain. Receptor binding domain uh, is a domain that is helpful for the binding of this. Uh, 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 virus to the host cells. So these envelope spike proteins, uh, last two days we are listening, these spike proteins are very important, that plays a major role in the binding of the virus to the host cell and also transmit the virus into the things. So this is uh, just a brief uh, structure of this virus. The beauty of this virus is RNA virus, it is having 30 kilo base pair size having five prime cap structure, three prime polyethyl, which is very similar to the uh, eukaryotic mRNA, which is uh, after processing. So 
so that facilitate the immediate translation of replicase polyproteins so you can see here these are the different uh, uh, enzymes that can be synthesized each one is a target for identification of uh, uh, different uh, drugs and then uh, now we are very familiar with the spike proteins they helps in the entry so it is categorized into two parts s1 and s2 domain so the s2 domain binds to the ace receptor so this uh, ace receptor is very known uh, receptor for the sars cov even sars cov 1 and 2 also so most of them are targeting for this uh, uh, spike proteins we are also interested in i will tell you later and then coming to this uh, replication so this uh, after binding viruses uh, access to host cell and released into the cytosol of the host cell and then immediately viral rna is translated by viral polymerases and then following replication the subgenomic rna synthesis uh, the viral structures like spike proteins nucleocapsids membrane envelope proteins are translated and inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum and then these proteins move along the uh, endoplasmic reticulum intermediate uh, compartments and then it's combined with the nucleoproteins and then finally the virus uh, goes inside the golgi complex in a vesicle form and a mature virion will be released uh, like excitos this is a very simple uh, life cycle compared to other uh, viruses so you can understand various uh, targets if you understand the replication cycle so coming to the pathogenesis it is uh, very important to understand the pathology of uh, the uh, disease progression so that you can treat patients properly so <clears throat> the virus once enters through our nose oral routes sometimes goes into the intestine and have some effects there but majority of this it goes to the trachea and then bronchi and bronchioles finally it end up with uh, the sac called alveoli so the alveoli main purpose is exchange of gas there is a capillary surrounding the oxygen goes into the capillaries and carbon dioxide uh, comes into the alveoli so the uh, air exchange takes place is here so mainly there are two types of cells you can see here type 1 pneumocytes type 2 pneumocytes type 1 pneumocytes are simple squamous they are very thin layers so they are mainly involved in the gas exchange and type 2 cells are the uh, cells which have the ace2 receptors which mainly synthesizes and secretes the surfactants the surfactants will mainly helps in the protection of the collapsing the lungs uh, from the surface tension so because uh, the lungs will take the humidified air and then a lot of other things so that uh, it will protect from the things. So, so this, as I mentioned, ACE2 receptors are present in the virus, uh, this uh, receptor, uh, this ACE1, ACE2. So whatever the virus that enters immediately bind to these uh, cells by ACE2 receptors. And then these uh, ACE receptors internalize the virus, as I mentioned, in the life cycle. Once it is infected, outbursts, the cell will be damaged the cell undergoes uh, like a, a, a cell death will happen that is called a lung injury epithelial cell lung injury okay so once this virus uh, released into this uh, from the type 2 cells they are damaged and then cause epithelial cell injury so these cells are not happy once it is damaged in response to that they will also release whole bunch of uh, chemicals called pro inflammatory cytokines that causes the inflammation that is uh, uh, swelling of these things edema pain all these things will happen so once it is happening uh, the exchange of gas uh, mainly uh, having problems and this uh, blood vessels also surrounding to this alveoli uh, release a fluid uh, in response to the cytokine storm and then it enters into the alveoli and have prevents the gas exchange the, like edema water formation and will take place this leads to the ards what you call acute respiratory distress syndrome it is a bad a very bad to the persons so may, um, uh, it may require uh, mechanical ventilations uh, to prevent the uh, hypoxia and then when generally in early stages our immune system is very good and uh, all these things will not happen so try to avoid the uh, this uh, sars cov virus 
and then you don't see any symptoms and they, may, uh, they will recover fastly. But in severe cases, your immune system is down, your immune suppression will take place and you find the majority of the things. And uh, one more thing you see here is, uh, once you see the lot of viruses that is accumulated in the alveoli and then the lot of cytokines which is secreted, further cytokines and viruses released from this alveoli and enters into this, uh, what do you call the capillaries and then it enters into the systemic uh, uh, circulation, it is causes the systemic inflammation. So this results in the septic shock or uh, sepsis because of the immunosuppression. So uh, that leads to the multiple organ failures. So that is why in severe cases, uh, the patients used to die with uh, multiple organ failures. So ultimately, it goes to the brain also sometimes that some cytokines strong happening that leads to the goes to the brain also that is called hypothalamus which maintains the uh, so, but uh, these cytokines bump up the temperature that leads to the fever. Fever is good for some time, but if it is go beyond that, uh, it, it causes a lot of damage to our organs. So, you see the list of the things that lung injury happens, inflammation, acute respiratory. So, hypoxia, hyperoxia is my areas. Currently, I am working on the uh, same model like uh, <clears throat> hyperoxia induced lung injury, how it leads to the ARDS, and then uh, the mechanism of this. Hyaline formation. So, this is hyaline membrane where the dead cells and other fluid will be accumulated in layer of the type 1 cells and also prevent the exchange of oxygen. Fibrosis is ultimately the fibroblast which is uh, present in the sub epithelial cells will secrete a lot of extracellular matrix proteins because of it, it has to repair the uh, lung uh, injured cells. So, it lost the balance and secretes a lot of extracellular membrane that leads to the fibrosis. So, when the fibrosis tissue is, uh, is more, it cannot contract and then the breathing problems will break. So, all these uh, things will ultimately lead to the uh, death of the person. So, once uh, you understand the things uh, that it clearly the clinicians uh, can easily target and uh, uh, treat accordingly what kind of cells are another cells are their ma ma macrophages uh, t cells they are all involved in uh, uh, different things neutrophils uh, morning madam was telling about the uh, hematological changes so they see, they have seen a more number of uh, neutrophils and less number of uh, lymphocytes even though there is a less number of neutro uh, these t cells but they are very activated so they are trying to fight but because of the cytokine storm and other uh, viral bursts, uh, so it leads to the immunosuppression. So that is why no immune cells are more active to combat this disease. So what I explained in that first slide uh, is here. So the generally median time for the symptoms onset is uh, generally about eight days, that is starting to RDS. And then depending on your immune system, some people will recover and and if it is severe cases, it goes into the deep airways and causes the respiratory failure. So the data on pathological changes on COVID-19 patients are very scarce. Only few studies, that is up to the uh, several patients who died, they took the autopsies of the lungs and then studied the things. So that is why still there is no clear-cut evidence that the pathways goes to the death uh, due to the pneumonia or whatever it is. And then these are the, some of the histological findings. Lateral diffuse of allular damage and uh, fibromyoxide exudates. Edema is one of the major things that happens in the uh, lung injury. Hyaline membrane, I explained. Increased thickness, uh, decreased exchange of air, and uh, inflammatory in cells infiltration also happens. And then uh, large uh, multinucleated large nuclei and other uh, pneumocytes you see. X-ray photography so that uh, rapid progression of pneumonia, viral pneumonia. This is a viral pneumonia has been seen. And as I mentioned, T-cell lymphopenia has been observed, but they are very activated, hyperactivated uh, in COVID-19 patients. And then uh, recently they have found that uh, besides having pneumonia and uh, the hypoxia ARDs, some, other, some people uh, was dying due to the uh, coagulation that is hypercoagulable state that was observed in the things. So, blood coagulation in the capillaries surrounding the things and other places also 
it is happening that is why the patients are uh, uh, recently diagnosed uh, the the procoagulant state all these things is due to the process called the complement uh, pathway patient. so this recent binding helps using as a treatment for anticoagulants uh, so that they can prevent uh, coagulation and that prevents the death of the uh, uh, patients and uh, uh, i took this slide from nature uh, paper so they they did a small uh, retrospective study they took the 78 uh, patients autopsies and then they did like hnd staining of the lung tissues and then they studied the epithelial pattern vascular pattern and fibrotic pattern these are the major pathological changes you might see in the uh, patients so here in the epithelial uh, pattern so you see detachment of the type 1 pneumocytes uh, these are the things detaching the from the alveoli and then hyaline membrane formation this is the membrane thickness in the alveolar space interstitial inflammatory response uh, was also observed uh, uh, in the patient's uh, lung tissues and then vascular pattern uh, is also seen hyaline formation thrombi intracapillary so these arrows intracapillary hyaline thrombi and pneumonia uh, also you see here pneumonia a uh, uh, lot of viral particles that is accumulated in the parenchyma tissue and edema edema this this kind of edema also swelling of these the things also observed and fibrotic pattern fibrosis uh, means i mentioned uh, there is an imbalance between the repair and the apoptosis and then alveolar septal elastin also intra alveolar fibro uh, elasticis uh, uh, was observed in the patients so this data suggesting that it uh, mainly type 2 pneumocytes are dying hyaline membrane formation gas exchange is uh, prevented by this formation and then fibrosis also is uh, observed in some patients so this is another study showing that uh, like as i mentioned thrombosis uh, uh, is uh, one of the reasons uh, for the uh, dying of the for patients immediately they found some of the cases a lot of uh, micro thrombi in small pulmonary arteries so this is a uh, diffuse alveolar damage so if you see a lot of uh, air space that is damaged air space micro thrombi in pulmonary arterioles so this data suggesting that both like uh, ARDS and then uh, uh, micro thrombi are responsible for the uh, death in severe cases of the patients so these things i have already mentioned lung injury inflammation ards hyperoxia cytochrome sepsis collapse in the line, and then ultimately leads to death so uh present what i am doing is i have constructed several of the sars cov spike proteins that full length protein ribosome the, the receptor binding protein and short segment and then uh, they are ready i'm planning to express in animal cells and produce these spike proteins uh, and then these spike proteins uh, we use to uh, the uh, horses equines to generate the neutralizing body i have a collaboration with uh, the biotech private limited they are having equine facilities and uh, based on this i submitted one uh, grant to the dsir uh, for this uh, recombinant spike protein production at laboratory scale and also, as I mentioned, I'm working on hyperoxia into the lung injury, uh, which is similar to SARS-CoV pneumonia, but this is a sterile injury, but this is a viral immune. So I'm right now having a CERB grant, and then two reviews has been published. Uh, one is on angiotensin converting enzyme, and one is general view. So the good news is we have a lot of vaccines are coming. Uh, that is one of the vaccines uh, just now Sar was talking. Uh, ICMR has been approved to conduct the clinical trials that is BBV1S2 COVID vaccine. This is an inactivated vaccine. Uh, recently, uh, from 7th onwards, it is going to happen the clinical trial, and they are planning to release with uh, uh, this vaccine August 15th. They are ready to launch because they have produced a lot of uh, vials. And then, uh, with this, I conclude my uh, talk. I acknowledge Sir and Vico Biotech uh, Private Limited. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I am happy to answer uh, the, any questions related to this.
Thank you, sir. Thank I you hope. for the presentation. There is one question. How the interferon yeah. 2 will act on COVID-19? So generally, interferons are uh, antiviral uh, in nature. Okay. So they activate the like uh, NK cells and other uh, T cells. Uh, that way, uh, they are uh, uh, be, uh, inhibiting the things. Okay, sir. I think and there it, are no more questions. There no are no further questions, sir. Thank so you, thank sir. you very much for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some review on this uh, COVID-19. Thank you, sir. So next presenter is Eman. Can you hear me? Yeah. So you can start sharing. Your... I'm not sure where he is. I think the presenter left the meeting. Yeah, he's here. Can you hear, Iman? You can start sharing. Can you hear me, Iman? Hello, Iman Nasir. Yeah. We can see your screen. No, we are not able to hear you. Can you speak something? Hello, Iman Nasir. Can you sharing? Start sharing. Yeah, we can see your slides. Other participants kindly request. I, re I request other participants to keep their microphones on mute and turn off their videos. Sorry, we can't hear you. Hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can hear. Yeah, okay. Is or not? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, firstly, uh, I am Iman Karaja, a PhD student in information technology, Al Quds University in Palestine. Uh, this work which I'm presenting is a part of my PhD studies. Uh, I will present now a paper uh, of my work which is called Machine Learning to Predict Death Recovery for COVID-19 Patients. Uh, in this presentation, I will present uh, this outline. I will talk, uh, I will make an introduction, a technical background, data set and feature selection, 
the model design, performance, results, and discussion, then I will conclude my work. Okay, let's start with an introduction. Uh, as we know, the COVID-19 is a newly discovered coronavirus that had uh, has officially announced as a pandemic by the World Health Organization in the March 2020. It's a new virus in the medical field that had no specific treatment and no vaccine till this moment. In addition, uh, it's, it's, excuse me. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, can you make it uh, in a presenter mode, like presentation slideshow? Uh, okay. Sorry for that. Is it fine? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. In addition, they have not discovered all the symptoms, but only some of them. COVID-19 is spreading very fast, and the over are not able to hospitalize all the patients, which leads to significant increase in the number of the virus death. So the doctors tried to choose the patients who had a highly higher prob probability for surviving. Many people actually think that only old people have the higher probability of death, but there is no always the case. The higher probability of risk depends on the several factors such as symptoms, age, date of symptoms, date of hospitalization, and the confirmation of the COVID-19. In our research, uh, I use the machi machine learning to predict which patients have the higher probability for hospitalization as the higher probability of death. We are building three classification algorithms to predict that, and we will use the evaluation uh, to evaluate the performance through some evaluation metrics. Now I'll talk about the technical background that I use during my research. Let's start with what is the machine learning. Machine learning actually is it's a subset of artificial intelligence that works on developing systems that can be improved through learning experience. It is working by training the mathematical models on the training set. As a result, it gains experience and can predict and take decision with being explicitly programmed. So it can be divided into two types. The first type is supervised, and the second is the, is the non-supervised learning. In supervised uh, is when you are training your model on a specific data set, giving him the input and the expected output. Uh, there are two types in the supervised learning, which is the regression problems and the classification uh, problems. In, in non-supervised learning, which works in the opposite way, the models are not giving a given an expected output, so it can be used in another application such as a clustering. Now, on uh, uh, the first algorithm that I built uh, during this, which is um, multi layer perception, which is a subtype of artificial neural network. Artificial neural network, which is, uh, uh, can be summarized as the ANN, is a supervised machine learning, which is mainly for classification program as a classifier. A neural network mostly used the architecture is composed of three parts and it's called multi-layer percept from the MLP, input hidden and output layer. It operates by some a process that mimics the way of the human brain works. The output layers map the result to the closest class according to the activation function on it. The second algorithm that I built during my work, uh, which is the support vector machine. Support vector machine is another supervised machine learning algorithm that's mainly used to classify uh, uh, for classification, uh, uh, and, and it can be also used for uh, 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 the regression pro uh, problems. Uh, the mechanism of the SVM is by separating the classes from each other using the hyperplans. The classes are represented at the data points at, or an n-dimensional feature vector, and the hyperplans have a geometric shape that occupies n minus one dimension. The first form of the SVM is where the data is linearly separable, where Two parallel hyperplans are used to separate the classes, such as the distance between the hyperplans in the is the maximum to minimize the error during the classification. The third algorithm that I used uh, uh, in my uh, working is the K-nearest neighbor. K-nearest neighbor is also a supervised machine learning algorithm, which is can be used for classification and the regression program problems. It classifies new cases based on the similarity measure, such as distance function. 
choosing the optimal value of k is best done by first inspecting the data. Uh, and also it can be done by the cross validation, which is another way to good k value using the independent data set to validate the value of k. Now I will talk about the data set and the feature selection during my models. Okay, let's just start with the data pre-processing. Pre uh, as we know that the data pre-processing and filtering is the most consuming time stage in, the in any data uh, project uh, uh, of data science projects. We use the data set from Kegel, which is a novel coronavirus 2019 data set. Uh, the data set has over uh, 10K of entries, but contains many, many missing data and uh, non-necessary attributes. Uh, to dealing, uh, 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 as, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, dealing with this data uh, take a very long date, uh, a very long time. Uh, actually, to begin with, we leave the most important attributes in our system, which is uh, which are the age, gender, symptoms, date of set symptoms, date of hospitalization, date confirmation, and the outcome. The outcome is uh, uh, is the dependent variable, as the outcome contains four classes, which are the discharge, the discharge, death, stable, and severe, and the rest of the attributes are the independent variable, are the input. Secondly, uh, we convert uh, uh, we convert all the numeric uh, we convert all the data to the numeric data to be easily handling. Uh, with the missing data in, in uh, different techniques, such as the mean and the median, for example. We used, we, we used to change the gender into one uh, for the male and two for the, uh, uh, one for the female and two for the male, using uh, the imputer function in the scurn in Python, uh, three using, using the PyCharm. We used to fill the missing gender data with the mean uh, of, the avail of the available data, and then we take, uh, we take the ceiling of the result of the result to make sure that it's either one or two. Uh, we also use another imputer um, to fill the missing data and age. Then we uh, uh, um, uh, 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 then for the missing date uh, dates uh, the, uh, the mean or the median method will not be uh, able to work. So we remove the data and unfortunately the data has become and reduced to uh, 1429 row. Then we extracted from this date the difference between uh, between this date using the def f uh, function in Excel. Uh, finally, the symptoms for each patient several symptoms or no symptoms. So for each symptoms we extract it to be one column individually, and the attribute will be one is it true uh, for true symptoms and zero for false symptoms. Uh, so the symptoms that, that we use in our uh, work uh, are five symptoms, which are the fever, malaise, chill, cough, and fatigue. Uh, these are the features that I used uh, during my uh, research. Uh, as we know that the age, the age of the patient, sex, which uh, present one for the female, two for the male, as I mentioned before. Uh, the fever, malaise, chill, uh, cough, and fatigue, and also the headache are uh, uh, are the uh, uh, the symptoms that I used during my research, uh, one for the positive uh, values and zero for negative. Uh, here are the two attributes which I extracted uh, from the, uh, uh, the difference between the days, uh, uh, which are the SIMPS uh, hospital, which are the days between symptoms uh, appearance and the hospital admission. SIMPS confirmation, which are the days between symptoms appearance and the confirmation of the COVID-19. Uh, finally, the outcome, uh, which depends on the attribute, which uh, consists of the uh, four classes, which are the discharge, which represent the uh, patient is recovered, death, which represent that the patient is die, stable, patient is in stable condition, severe, that uh, patient in critical uh, condition. Now I will talk about the uh, model uh, design. Uh, actually, in this work, I used the Python 3 uh, uh, was used to build the three machine learning model and to test them uh, on the data. Pandas library uh, are used uh, to read the data and to filter it, while Scurn were, were be used to be able uh, to build the models and to evaluate the results. The data was split randomly into 17 uh, for uh, data. 
uh, uh, for training data and 34 testing uh, uh, data. Uh, and the accuracy that achieved is above 19% uh, in, in the three models. Uh, now I will talk about the performance, how I measure the performance. Actually, the, uh, the models are evaluated during the evaluation metrics, which consists of the accuracy, recall, the F measure, and the precision. Uh, this metric extracted from the confusion matrix generated from each measure uh, from each model by using the confusion matrix function in the scan. And below are the, uh, the equations for each uh, one of them. As we know, that true positive are the true uh, positive for uh, which are the correctly classified patients. True negative are the true negatives, which are the patient that does not be, uh, belong to a specific class and be classified correctly. Uh, false positive, which are the false positive, which are the data wrongly classified as a positive of the specific class, and false negative are the false negative, which are the patients belong to the specific class, and the classified does not belong to that class. Now I will discuss uh, the rules that I will uh, take from each uh, uh, algorithm. The first algorithm, which was the uh, multi-layered perceptron, uh, the multi-layered perceptron, the MLP performance was very high. Uh, as shown in the confusion and the performance matrix in that figure. Uh, actually, this is the confusion matrix that I got during my programming. And this is the uh, performance matrix that I get during my work. And uh, this was shown uh, a very high, uh, the, uh, 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 a very high uh, uh, accuracy, which uh, achieved by 99%. That this model uh, classified correctly the a 30% of data that I split. The second algorithm, which is the support vector machine, uh, and the SVM performance, which was the highest between the three models, the accuracy was uh, 100%. Uh, actually, um, I, I'm not sure for this uh, uh, for this uh, accuracy, as uh, the data uh, was minimized to less than uh, 1,050 row, uh, which is a not very a very large amount of data. The third algorithm, which I uh, built, which is the neural snapper, and the overall accuracy was uh, 92%, and it was the lowest uh, between three models. Uh, uh, as the overall metrics evaluation, as we see that the overall metrics of yeah, evaluation uh, was uh, presented in this graph, uh, I use uh, the average between precision, recall, and the F major for F uh, for, uh, and the accuracy for all classes. Um, uh, it's clear that the SVM model was uh, the highest uh, between the three models. Uh, as a conclusion, to sum up what I work, uh, here I work, uh, here uh, in my work, I compare between three classification algorithms which are the MLP, the SVM, and the KNN, uh, to classify four uh, classes of COVID-19 patients. The, the performance was very high, and this is actually, I think, due to the lack of uh, amount of data that we used. Uh, the data was very large, but uh, during uh, the processing and filtering, the data become less than uh, 1,050, 1,500 Joe. Uh, uh, this work was able to predict the patient that has the higher risk of death and the critical condition according to several uh, patient data from different countries. Uh, actually, we can uh, uh, consider that uh, this work uh, uh, or the data set which we use is a preliminary, a preliminary, a preliminary work. Uh, as the data uh, as the data set was uh, has uh, uh, a serious prob a problem as there there are many missing data uh, for the future work actually we are planning to search another data set which uh, which can be larger and not and didn't have a missing data uh, to test uh, them on the same models and actually I will try to get the Palestinian COVID-19 patient data set as uh, I'm trying to, uh, to reach it uh, till this moment. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wonderful presentation on machine learning application. Okay. So I have a few questions to ask. Yeah. So the first question I would ask is like, uh, 
did you do any cross validation of your results because i see accuracies are like 100 percentage 99 percentage and 92 so is this uh, model overfitting the data in any case no uh, actually um, uh, uh, there are no uh, uh, overfitting for the data as uh, as uh, 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 all the redundant data are, uh, uh, are removed uh, but uh, the cruise validation for for my work actually uh, i'm trying to get another data uh, and compare between them uh, here are uh, 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 in this work we split the data for 17 for training and 30 for uh, uh, for uh, for testing and these are uh, the testing uh, uh, these are the values for the 30 percent of the data testing okay so how did you handle uh, missing data in your data set uh, as I mentioned in my presentation uh, the missing data for the age and uh, 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 for example for uh, for the age and the sex for example um, uh, I, I, I find the mean uh, for the uh, for the existed value I, uh, then I take the ceiling uh, for them then I uh, fill the missing values with uh, with the mean uh, with the mean uh, values, but actually the dates uh, which uh, which will uh, will uh, will not work in the same way. Actually, I delete them uh, in order to to get uh, uh, a correct results. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what about uh, the ROC curve? Or how did you did you plot any ROC curve to compare these models? So, Me, as you I showed think, yeah. accuracy. Yeah. Sorry, area under the curve. Yeah. I, I I didn't get your actually. Okay. Uh, did you plot any receiver operative characteristic curve analysis? Uh, like you showed your uh, confusion matrix. Yeah. So what about the sensitivity and specificity in comparison with all these three models? So how good are they? Uh, actually, no. Uh, during my work, I went only in the confusion matrix. As uh, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, uh, this is a research, and I, I'm still uh, working on it. Uh, uh, I didn't finish uh, actually. I, I I'm trying to get another data set to make sure that uh, uh, this model will work fine. Uh, then uh, I will continue the work that you are talking about, like such as the sensitivity and so on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Okay, the thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presenter for the session. Deepali is the next presenter. I am here. Okay. Other participants, kindly mute yourself. Deepali, can you? Yeah. We can see your screen. Uh, can you move that window? Yeah. You can start slideshow. We are not able to hear you. Hello? Yeah, now it's it's clear. Can you keep the microphone uh, near to your because your voice is so low. A uh, little more. No. Yeah, now it's fine. It's audible. It's not, it's not, sorry. 
and resulting in a review of the cytokine outburst resulting in septic shock in patients with the cost of So, first a brief introduction about COVID-19. As we all know, it's a highly contagious and infectious disease. I think you can speak a little more louder. Uh, it's not very audible. It is a highly contagious infectious disease caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus that is now named as SARS-CoV-2 virus. The first outbreak was reported in December 19 in Wuhan, China. Currently, more than 200 countries are being affected by this virus and there are more, more than 100 million patients and this has a mortality rate of 5%. But the major limitation with this disease is the lack of prior knowledge. We do not have much knowledge regarding the treatment treatment strategies and how to control the disease. This, is, this has created the havoc around the world. So basically, I just a brief about the structure of coronavirus. It's an enveloped virus with a positive sense, single-stranded RNA. Phylogenetically, it exhibits 79% similarity with the earlier SARS virus and more than and about 50% with the MERS virus. The genomic DNA of the coronavirus sampling varies from 27 to 30 in size and for the present SARS-CoV-2 virus, it is around 29,890 base pair. The genomic RNA is, is capped at the 5 prime end. This makes the virus easier to be translated and transferred inside the cell and the 3 prime end has a poly -A -A. The peplomers or the spike proteins present on the viral surface helps in the attachment of the virus to the host cell. Apart from this, this the virus has several other proteins like membrane protein, envelope protein, uh, and protein. The major, the basic symptoms that can be that, that are observed among the patients are the respiratory distress, pneumonia, or severe lung infection. However, among the patient, among the patients, or uh, among the death cases reported in COVID-19, uh, it was observed that the patients died due to multiple organ dysfunctions, impaired immune response, and overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This uh, overproduction of pro-inflammatory -pro cytokines and multiple organ dysfunction suggests that the involvement of the cytokine outburst that results in septic and septic shock in the patient's condition. Basically, the viral infection overactivates the immune response inside the host body and this results in the cytokine storm. So, basically, in case of COVID-19, not only the viral infection is dangerous, but the cytokine storm produced subsequently is even more dangerous. Now, an overview about regarding what is sepsis and septic shock. Sepsis has been defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction that can caused by the dysregulated immune response to infection. This infection is not uh, restricted to any single kind of bacteria or virus. It can be due to any uh, any micro, microbial infection. And if it remains untreated, then the patient goes, goes into the stage of septic shock. Here, the cytokine outburst occurs so much that it lowers the blood pressure, increases the pulse rate, and ultimately the patient dies due to the shock state. Furthermore, there are several stages of sepsis. First is the Severe immune response syndrome, then adverse to sepsis, then severe sepsis, and ultimately septic shock. So, how this cytokine production occurs, or how it leads to the sepsis? Basically, our immune cells consist of receptors that are capable of finding the pathogen associated molecular markers or damage associated molecular markers, PAMs or DAMs commonly known as PAMs or DAMs. So the, these are recognized by the TLR receptors. So uh, in case of viral infections, TLR 3, 7, 8, 9, and 10, these receptors identify the viral uh, viral RNA or the viral proteins, and they trigger the cascade for the production of cytokines. So this cytokine production in case of COVID-19 is going, uh, going on uncontrollably resulting in the cytokine outburst of and in sepsis. It has been reported that it has been found in patient studies that more than 70% of the patients have developed sepsis due to this viral manifestation. However, before the onset of COVID, the viral sepsis was a fairly 
zero percent, only one percent. Major was due to the bacterial infection, but now the data has changed quite a lot after the uh, after the COVID nineteen. So, so this is basically the role of NF kappa B. Uh, like the toll-like receptors, they activate the NF kappa B production, and this NF kappa B is the main regulator for the immune response and is responsible for the transcription of various cytokines. Here I have just provided a list of, of, of the various cytokines, cytokines that are involved. That are produced by NF kappa B. Major class is the interferons and interleukins. These are greatly produced in case of COVID-19. So next uh, is just a diagram for explaining how cytokines expresses the immune cells. Basically, the macrophages or the lymphatic cells they uh, they are first they first get activated on uh, on encountering any virus particle. And they signal out IL2 and IL12. These subsequently activate the T cells for the difference for the production of T helper cell one and T helper cell two. The T helper cell one, in presence of interleukin one, two, and I can gamma, produces CD8 T, T killer cells. And the T the T helper two, in presence of interleukin four, five, six, along with B cell, produces plasma cells and antibodies. However, in normal cases. This gets inhibited by IL-12. When the infection is over, the, the immune cells produces IL-10 that inhibits the macrophages and lymphatic cells from producing any further IL-1 and IL-12. But this this inhibition doesn't occur in case of uh, severe infection, infectious conditions inside the host. So now, in case of COVID-19, the immune response much is still unknown. Like it's the recent disease and that the research is still going on. So reduction in and natural killer cells and T cells has been observed. Detectable IgM and IgG antibodies are produced uh, seven days post the disease. IgM antibodies remain in the bloodstream for around two weeks, while IgG remain for a longer time. So now COVID and sepsis. Till now we are discussing that only. Like the main in cytokines, hemokines, TNF alphas, interleukin. IF and gammas, these are the major pro inflammatory cytokines that have been found to increase during COVID 19 infection. These cytokines cause the chemotaxis of the immune cells, monocytes, and neutrophils at the site of viral infection for killing the virus and virus containing cells. However, due to cytokine storm, the production is so much that it causes uncontrolled tissue damage. So, here is the onset of how from, like, from COVID 19, how the Septic shock occurs. First, first, the disease begins with the mild illness that results in the pneumonia, then to severe pneumonia, then to ARDS. ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is very crucial. Like basically occurs within the one week after the infection, and it can again be categorized into mild, moderate, and severe condition. So far, among 17 persons, 17 percent. Of the COVID patients are found to develop ARDS, and among those 17 persons, 65 percent have died due to multiple organ failure, organ failure, suggesting the role of sepsis and septic shock. So my conclusion here is like uh, everyone is focusing on the vaccines for curing the COVID-19, like the coronavirus. Uh, everyone is targeting the antiviral therapies, but uh, just targeting the antiviral therapies will not be sufficient. We need to focus much more. On the cytokine storm inhibition and sepsis inhibition, because even if you if the antiviral therapy will stop the viral infection, the onset of the cytokine storm will still worsen the patient condition. That is all. Thank you for your presentation, Deepali. Uh, we'll take some questions if you have any. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear us? So, what do you think uh, we can proceed with the treatment option for this infection and uh, during this cytokine outburst? Can you hear us? Hello? Hello, Deepali. Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, 
can you speak little loud because it's not audible hello yeah can you hear us ha oh, i can hear you so what are your suggestion for the treatment of this septic shock in patients any suggestions Thank you, Dipali. Uh, we will move to the next speaker, Dr. Kavita Chanchal. We can hear. Hello, ma'am. Hello, Dr. Kavita. Can you hear me? Other participants, kindly mute yourself. Excuse me, sir. Actually, next to Dipali, it is my presentation. So it is Kalimani Priyadarshini. No, as per the schedule, uh, we are going actually. So there is number seven. If you can see, it's Kavita Chanchal. Dr. Kavita? Dr. Kavita, can you hear us? Hello, Dr. Kavita, can you hear us? Yeah, but uh, I can see your uh, video, but I can't hear you. Can you unmute? Yeah, you are muted actually. Yeah, now you are unmute, but uh, we are not able to hear you. Or can you remove that earphones maybe? Yeah, now I can hear. Hello? No, uh, there is no voice. You are not audible actually. Can't hear you, ma'am. Can you hear us? I think there is some issue with your microphone. So can you remove the microphone from your laptop and then speak through the directly from the mic of laptop? We can see your video only, but uh, we are unable to hear your voice. One second. Now, can you speak?
sorry we are unable to hear your voice so can you figure out uh, what is the issue then uh, we will move to the next presenter in the meanwhile we are moving to the next next presenter uh, dr s kalaiwani hello sir uh, whether i am audible yes uh, uh, shall i share the presentation now yes yes sure one second uh well my presentation is shared sir uh, it is starting to share okay yeah uh, your presentation is visible okay make sir. sure you finish within the time frame yes sir yes sir uh, can i start now Uh, yes you can start good afternoon one and all so um, before the start uh, uh, we all know that the entire world is facing a pandemic fear and uh, we are looking for very uh, the way, ways and means uh, to overcome uh, this pandemic situation uh, with the advent of science uh. and uh, uh, we are we what is the need of our is the multidisciplinary approach uh. and uh, i'm sure that this workshop is one such kind to share, uh, share various perspectives of the Uh, recent trends in the discovery and uh, diagnosis and therapeutics uh, so far we have seen uh, in this presentation uh, regarding the drug discovery methodologies uh, and also the therapeutic approaches uh, and uh, this uh, my presentation is somewhat uh, different it is mainly based upon the surveillance study uh, uh, mainly the diagnosis technique uh, so it is a water based epidemiological approach in order to detect this uh, sars cov and uh, it is mainly a, a review article and uh, as you all know uh, the pandemic uh, it started uh, in uh, wuhan in the year uh, sorry in the in the year 2019 in december and uh, uh, in uh, 30th january uh, who has uh, considered it as a pandemic one and uh, uh, main mainly this virus uh, it primarily spread between the uh, people uh, by co close contact uh. and uh, what is the disadvantage is that uh, we are still now the vaccines uh, are under the trial and uh, no specific antiviral drugs are uh, because of this the entire world is facing uh, uh, the impact of covid uh, not only in the physical aspect but also the, we, we are facing impact in several uh, spheres like uh, the social impact economic even the psychological impact uh. and uh, if you see here uh, uh, globally according to a uh, uh, data uh, uh, till 30th june uh, Uh, 10 million people were confirmed with this uh, ki kind of uh, covid uh, spread and uh, 5 lakh people have been dead uh, in uh, various countries uh, around 216 countries it has been uh, recorded and uh, in india alone if we see uh, uh, till 30th june uh, the cases of 5 uh, lakhs people were uh, infected and 16000 uh, mortalities were recorded hello okay yeah you can continue yeah um, as we all know uh, many of them they have presented uh, about this uh, the biology of this virus uh, and uh, the structure uh, and uh, the other things uh, so here comes the scientific classification of this virus it belong to the order nidovirale and there are four main uh, subgenus of this uh, virus Uh, and among them uh, the beta coronavirus is the one which is uh, causing uh, the infectivity among the humans and the animals uh, and uh, the size uh, of the the genome size of this virus is uh, around uh, 26 to 32 uh, kilo ba uh, base bases uh. and uh, there are several approaches that has been used uh, to assess the public health and the infection in infectious disease uh, uh, in 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 the global and uh, the, i have pointed here the several techniques uh, Uh, the first one is the centile surveillance uh, i think uh, what is centile surveillance is the uh, report that is received from the general practitioner uh, so uh, what is the disadvantage of this technique is that uh, in case of rare and the uh, novel spread uh, yeah, we cannot immediately find out the thing for example uh, in uh, one itself uh, uh, we have uh, here a story 
that uh, a general practitioner uh, he was uh, reporting the medical council uh, that uh, certain people were with the common symptoms many people are coming out with the disease but that time uh, the uh, the government has neglected the, that one and because of this nowadays now we are facing a pandemic situation so that one you call it as a centile service and uh, we are in this pandemic situation we are facing uh, we are using all the surveillance technique uh, like uh, the clinical uh, based surveillance uh, and uh, the hospital admission data uh, and uh, the prescription rate uh, even in medical shop uh, if we are buying any sort of medicines uh, uh, the government is getting the data of those people uh, and also based upon the mortality and morbidity of the uh, persons and also based on the questionnaires and survey and each of these techniques they have their own potential uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages and one among them is the water based epidemiological technique and uh, it is a recent though it is a recent technique uh, um, uh, not much focus is con uh, considered in, in in a country like india um, excuse me the slide is not changing Okay. One second. And uh, the I have mentioned all the advantages and disadvantages. I don't want to uh, spare more time on uh, this one since uh, I have to give opportunities for others. Uh, uh, my uh, my focus is uh, mainly about this uh, water-based epidemiological uh, technique. And uh, as you know, uh, this water wastewater-based epidemiological technique, uh, it is uh, one such a kind of a uh, novel technique, uh, or else uh, we can uh, call it as a new approach. It is mainly based upon the chemical analysis of the pollutants or the biomarkers uh, in the wastewater. So that we can able to find out the inhabitants, uh, the infectious inhabitants that is present in the uh, wastewater catchment and uh, generally this uh, technique is mainly used to find out uh, uh, it, uh, it is used as a tool to find out two things one is uh, to find out the drug load in a population and another thing is to find out the infectious diseases uh, that exist in a community so this mainly this wastewater based approach is a kind of a uh, community based surveillance not an individual one based surveillance and uh, it is a postulate uh, that by this one we can able to identify the outbreak uh, of the disease in the community level and it can be monitored in the real time situation and uh, this uh, wbe it has the uh, potential to uh, utilize as a monitoring infectious disease uh, uh, tool and uh, the widespread of epidemics as well as the pandemics in the community uh, can be analyzed by analyzing the human met uh, metabolic uh, excretion uh, like a uh, feces or urine the, where uh, in this materials there will be the presence of the biomarkers like uh, for in coronavirus it, uh, it is the protein or the rna the nucleic acid so uh, this water based epidemiology it is an early warning system for the disease outbreak to give a comprehensive health information of the community and uh, if you see here when we compare with that of the other traditional uh, surveillance system which i have mentioned already uh, this WB, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, BE can provide a timely analysis and uh, it can also allow the public services uh, to respond quickly and uh, we can able to adapt health interventions. Uh, we can able to find out whether there's a sp to spread of these diseases or there is a uh, outbreak is very serious or not uh, can be identified. And according to uh, an uh, renowned en uh, environmental virologist, Masaki, uh, uh, he told that uh, the presence of genetic material of novel coronavirus, uh, pro it provides an opportunity to use base foster as a source for the surveillance tools. Uh, and generally by analyzing the wastewater, we can able to find out whether that is an invasion of the pathogens, that is the, uh, the pathogen exits in the community and uh, uh, through molecular uh, epidemiological studies also we can able to find out this one. And then we can also find out whether uh, what the uh, infectious agent has been eradicated in the community. So it is a kind of a monitoring technique, uh, whether uh, this uh, uh, infectious agent is available in the community, whether there's a surge or else declining, can be monitored through this uh, wastewater analysis. 
and uh, here is a picture that depict uh, how this uh, uh, surveillance technique uh, is used. Uh, and mainly if we see uh, that uh, in case of SARS uh, virus, we will be uh, analyzing the biomarkers. And uh, since the infected patients, uh, they will be uh, shedding uh, uh, these viruses in their urine and feces, and it will be entering into the sanitary sewage via the human excretion. And then it will be transported towards the transport uh, towards the sewers. And then uh, it, it uh, serves as a representative sampling of the sewage. And uh, for example, for community, the, ent uh, the uh, particular population is having a severe infectious age. We can able to analyze through the sewage uh, uh, analysis of this one. And uh, it mainly report the community trend or the intercommunity comparison of this uh, COVID-19 uh, spread. And uh, this is a graphical representation uh, how it can be uh, done as a surveillance technique. For example, uh, in case of uh, Chennai and all, we can able to see there is a wide spread of this disease uh, because of uh, uh, what uh, the multi-story building uh, and uh, the compact living of the people because social distancing is very minimal and there is an exposure uh, uh, via the droplet as well as through this uh, uh, pieces also there is a transportation. For example, if you see, the population they contribute towards the sewers with the virus material and it is collected towards a, uh, in a wastewater treatment plant in a municipal community and uh, where we can able to take the sample and we can uh, analyze the sample for the uh, water quality for analyzing the water quality parameter as well as for analyzing the chemical marker as well as the biological markers and uh, that time uh, analyzing these markers we can able to monitor the spread of diseases uh, and we can able to find out whether the particular community is having a widespread of disease or there's a resistance for the uh, disease in the community level so this uh, this uh, serves as a valuable tool to find out whether a particular population or community is having a, is highly infected or else uh, or resistant towards the pathogenic infection and uh, the general uh, protocol for following this uh, uh, technique uh, is that uh, primarily uh, we need to extract the uh, what uh, the material viral material and then it should be detected the biomarker has to be detected and subsequent analysis is also needed and then we have to uh, interpret the biological marker so in case of uh, coronavirus if we see uh, the so uh, the biomarkers are uh, nothing but the human metabolic excretion. Uh, for example, the external or else the internal bodily origin. For example, if we are seizing, it comes uh, the droplet contains the uh, uh, viruses in the external sources, and internal sources is through this uh, uh, what um, the mucus, or else uh, the feces and other things. Uh. So these are the metabolites or endogenously formed chemicals which are uh, which are result uh, of the exposure of the disease and also the proteins and the DNA or the RNA could serve as the biomarker. In case of coronavirus, the key uh, markers that, they, that are used for analysis is the uh, proteins uh, like uh, the S protein, uh, uh, the N protein, ME and also the RNA. And uh, for uh, WB approaches for SARS-CoV virus, the, the main source for the wastewater analysis is that uh, analyzing the feces or urine of an individual or else the, uh, the sewer with containing the, uh, the virus of material. So uh, it, it gives a comprehensive community health information and uh, it set up an efficient method to concentrate and also it is used to detect the coronavirus in the wastewater matrix. So it is not only we can able to find out the presence of the virus, but also this wastewater serves as a uh, source for the cause, uh, the virus uh, and the other things. It's, uh, it's uh, retained in the garbages and the plastic paper that resides in the sewage. And uh, it could serve as a potential uh, infectious agent to cause a secondary infection for the uh, community of people. So there are two things. One is the surveillance, and we can able to also this uh, contain. Uh, if we are not treating the wastewater properly, it could also cause infection to the uh, people. So uh, we can able to evaluate the survival of this disease in a natural condition and uh, at different temperature and uh, different uh, types of water sources. As I told you, in uh, water treatment plant, even though. Uh, there are reports that say that uh, the uh, what race water has been treated uh, for primary or secondary sources also contain uh, uh, the viral materials like the protein as well as the RNA of the 
uh, viruses present uh, in the uh, sewage water. So it can uh, access the efficiency of wastewater and the disinfection uh, uh, is need to be done. Uh, once it is confirmed, we need to disinfect uh, the contaminant so that we can able to uh, uh, what, uh, avoid the spread of the disease. So it, uh, it established as a surveillance system through monitoring the sewage uh, of the potential uh, virus circulation. So this is the advantage of this technique. Excuse me. So uh, what is the thing is that uh, nowadays the scientists around the world, they are uh, peeping into the wastewater for finding out the no novel coronavirus to come up with the uh, surveillance technique. Uh, uh, mainly in the uh, circulate uh, the virus that is circulating in the city or the municipality and uh, the scientists are tracking wastewater of novel coronavirus which serves as an early warning system but actually we have failed in that one uh, we are not considering this approach more extensively nowadays only uh, this technique has been adapted in uh, india i will show you some case studies regarding this one Hello, and Dr. The Dr. yes sir i will finish within two minutes okay uh, so the advantages of this technique is that, as I told you, uh, the viral biomarkers like the protein as well as mainly the, the virus itself uh, uh, which, uh, is present inside in, in the wastewater materials so that each material uh, will have different uh, uh, property. The virus can be retained in different materials for a different duration of time or the temperature. And uh, we can able to capable of uh, finding out the spatial and temporal trend. And uh, real-time uh, information can be up obtained for the whole population. And uh, mainly, there is no need for the ethical consideration. Simply from the sewers, we can collect the water. There is no need to get approval from the uh, people. Because if we are do going for any blood test or mucus test and all, the, uh, the patient the, nowadays, uh, they are not at all uh, uh, confirming that they are having corona. So uh, uh, simply, if you, if you want to find out the community level of uh, uh, infection, the sewers can be taken and uh, there is no need for such kind of ethical consideration. And the disadvantage is that uh, the most important uh, challenge for this one is that consideration of the biomarker and then how far this biomarker is stable in the wastewater. And also there are others uncertainty and uh, time lapse for that. And uh, this technique is, uh, though I told you it is a new technique and it has been identified in Italy in the year 2005 for finding out the survival lines of Corio. And it has been adapted in Finland and uh, Israel also. And uh, it, this is mainly used as a surveillance technique to find out the polio circulation in the population. And also uh, during the SARS-CoV-1, that is uh, the SARS infection, uh, for example, in a multi-story building uh, in Hong Kong, they could be able to find out uh, more than uh, uh, in a 50-story building, uh, 342 uh, cases were confirmed because of this, uh, the transmission of this uh, uh, wastewater aerosols uh, through the uh, bathroom uh, uh, waste products. And uh, uh, it is also used for hepatitis and norovirus and uh, swine flu. And uh, if you see here, as I told you, uh, that uh, uh, what is the one of the advantage of this technique is that uh, uh, the, uh, the European and North American data, they provide that uh, uh, the in persons infected with SARS-CoV, they will excrete, uh, sorry, excrete uh, uh, a million of a viral genome uh, into the wastewater per day. And uh, again, if you see 0.1 to 101.5 millions of viral genomes in wastewater uh, is generated and it could be translated. And uh, the recent data, it reports that uh, the RNA ca can be isolated uh, from the feces uh, uh, until 22 days. Whereas in respiratory uh, airway, we can able to isolate the RNA of the virus only uh, for the, from, uh, for the 50, 18 days. And in serum, it is 16 days. So this is one of the advantages. And then if you see here, uh, this wastewater surveillance, especially in the area, uh, with the scarcity of data, we can able to uh, find out uh, this kind of uh, technique. We can adapt this technique. And uh, this data source, it indicates the virus that is circulating in the population or not. And uh, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, water surveillance technique is not new, as I told. It, it is uh, uh, done in Australia, in Italy, and uh, there are also several reports regarding this one. And in in India, IIT uh, Gandhinagar, they have done uh, the 
uh, the water wastewater analysis and they could able to find out the non infectious corona wastewater uh, uh, virus uh, presence in the wastewater sample uh. and uh, the cb lal institute of Bi uh, biotechnology also they have found out uh, uh, that wastewater contained the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, dino and they have uh, done uh, they have identified this biomarkers with the help of this uh, rt pcr work and uh, as i told you about the biomarkers these are the uh, the genes that they have used as a biomarker the orf uh, genes and the, the protein genes uh, the surface protein the envelope protein uh, and the nucleic acid uh, protein genes have been used as the biomarkers uh, mainly they have done the rt pcr uh, and the real time pcr work um, and uh, to conclude the presentation, uh, though there is no concrete evidence in India for the transmission of this uh, uh, virus to the wastewater system, but it is, an, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a precautionary measure that we need to undertake to find out whether there is a community level infection it happens in the wastewater. And uh, this uh, WBE is a reliable surveillance model uh, and by, thereby we can able to find out the hotspot of the COVID-19 now. And uh, it is mainly used to identify the location of potential viral carrier and provide an effective early warning comprehensively and also in the real time. As I told you, we can able to find out in the real time which community of population is having a, a severe infection, whether this uh, infection has been uh, reduced in the particular population or else there is a secondary surge. All this data can be analyzed by analyzing this wastewater source. And WBB uh, tool, uh, it uses as a tool for surveillance as an alert. And uh, we can able to find out uh, a certain uh, uh, parameters to stabilize and also proper disposal of this uh, uh, waste so that uh, public health related policies has to be maintained uh, in order to prevent the secondary uh, upsurge. And uh, there are also possible that I uh, admit that there are disadvantages that uh, multiple uncertainties also, also there in this. Uh, in this kind of approach. So uh, with this, I conclude. I, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Purnima ma'am for uh, providing this opportunity and also Kripa Nidhi sir and uh, Dr. Abhagram sir for providing me this opportunity. Thank you, one and all. Is there any question? Uh, thank you, Kalaiwani. It was a good presentation. Uh, so, so in a way, like, uh, do you think that the spread will be more through wastewater compared to uh, you know compared to airborne mode uh, yes ma'am actually I, I will give you an example as i told you uh, when there is a sars outbreak it is a kind of respiratory disease uh, and uh, it was proved in hong kong that uh, in a 50 story multi uh, story building around 356 people were infected because of this only uh, there was report it says that uh, uh, through the bathroom or toiletry waste uh, the aerosol it has been spread up and uh, there was infection it has been uh, 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 happened because of this one okay so through su through su sewage water you know so, sorry through sewage water in general you may only you may be able to estimate the viral load for example but the thing is that it is going to be it is not going to be uh, a big application in terms of understanding uh, because it's going to be a mixture of many samples Anyway, yes, yes, so, so mainly uh, this technique is a kind of, uh, kind of a surveillance for a mass community. Uh, for example, if we are taking a Madurai population, the municipal uh, uh, water, wastewater will be collected. Uh, and uh, if their pathogenic load is higher, we can able to find out. Uh, we have to, uh, it is, I, I doesn't mean that this is the only approach. This is one kind of approach by which we can able to find out the mass uh, infection in a community. So that is the thing, Mama. So, but again, as I uh, told you, uh, we can able to find out whether uh, uh, a particular population is highly infected or else uh, uh, that is a, uh, the le 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 based upon the virus load, whether the community is having a resistance or else uh, uh, even by analyzing, we can able to find out whether there is a secondary surge it happens or not. Uh, and it also a potential uh, route uh, for, the, uh, for, uh, for the infection. Yeah. So we need to follow some but I understand. But I understand that the major application of this is to, I uh, to diag uh, is in diagnostics basically. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
uh, otherwise and it's only it's it could be like a second stage of uh, detection maybe because in the first stage people wanted to go for it analyzing in individual samples and then later they wanted to go for a mass detection so this could be like in the secondary level of uh, detection through not wastewater a, not in a secondary level simultaneously parallelly we should also do such kind of technical the municipality people should allot someone and check whether there is a, a presence of the virus load in the wastewater so that but we are able to get some sort of data but is it not but going to be very uh, tedious very uh, you know i would say like it it may not be very easy or uh, comfortable to collect yes, that many samples yes ma'am yes ma'am you know but because actually, is a... what is the thing is uh, mainly we have to focus on the clinical based surveillance only so uh, the individual uh, infection can be uh, diagnosed and can be treated only ba based upon the clinical based surveillance so this is a supporting one parallelly we can do it so that we can able to find out the surveillance of the virus in the community so we do, do not know when uh, this lockdown period will end or when the corona virus uh, infection is going to end so it it could be a, even uh, last last for uh, more than a year so there are several data are up to, uh, or that so, so if we are parallelly doing this kind of thing we can able to analyze whether the population is uh, the viral load is uh, declining in the population or not for that one leave we, we can make use of this technique that's this true uh, that's a that's a great application in a way to uh, to constantly record the statistics yes, so the, uh, that's really a, a great application and uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation again it is very useful and it's quite different from uh, the major lot of presentation so far i've seen uh, thank, you. thank, thank you. you thank you so our next speaker is uh, deep puja and uh, before that uh, we are planning to have a short break for 5 to 10 minutes because of the overload of presentations and we are going to hear many more at least 10 to 15 uh, possible so uh, please uh, we, uh, please take some time and then we can get back get refreshed to hear more presentations and until then deep poja please load your presentation please share your content in the meantime Uh, you may start the presentation um, after ten minutes if that is okay with you. So participants, please come back after ten minutes, uh, and also the presenters to come. Please come back after ten minutes.
नहीं आ रही शायद उन्होंने वहां पे बंद कर रखा होगा इसको बंद कर
Hello, Deep Puja. Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Uh, I, th I think we can start the session. Shall I start? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Dikpuja, Dr. Fellow at Paramedic University in Melbourne. And firstly, I would like to congratulate organizations and organizers for organizing such a wonderful and very informative. Uh, hello, hello, Pooja. Actually, uh, uh, can you be a bit louder? There is some echoing behind. Okay. I am Dr. Dikpuja, Dr. Fellow at Paramedic University in Melbourne. Firstly, I would like to congratulate organizers for organizing such a wonderful and very informative conference. I would also thank them for completing my presentation. My presentation title is Management of Cancer Patients in COVID-19 Pandemic, Risk, Challenges and Practical Approach. My talk will provide information basically on guidelines for the cancer patients during COVID-19. Here is the uh, introduction for coronavirus, I think I should skip these slides because it already discussed a lot. Here is the, uh, some data for the malignancies which is obtained uh, as comorbidities in patients hospitalized with confirmed COVID-19. 8% patients with cancer uh, are confirmed with COVID-19 in Italy from February to March. 72% cancer patients are reported in uh, Wuhan, China in January. 34% patient, uh, cancer patients with COVID-19 are uh, admitted in Wuhan, China during uh, January and February. And 5.6% uh, cancer patients were admitted with confirmed COVID-19 cases in New York City Hospital. These data sh shows that the morbidity, mor mortality rate in cancer patients with uh, cancer cancer patients which are suffering from COVID-19 is double as compared to the normal patients. The risk of COVID-19 in cancer patients. The cancer patients are at higher risk for developing severe COVID-19. The patients who are receiving chemotherapy, who have received chemotherapy within uh, last three months, uh, patients who are receiving extensive radiation therapy, patients who have who underwent bone, bone marrow or stem cell transplantation within six months or they are still treated with immunosuppressant drugs. Uh, some type of hemolytic cancer, uh, the patient which are suffering from some hemolytic cancers are also uh, susceptible to COVID-19 infection because their immune system is damaged. And uh, the patients who are impaired, who have impaired immune system due to the leukocytopenia, uh, low Ig levels and long lasting immunosuppressions are also uh, more uh, susceptible to COVID-19 infection. The, as we know, the cough, fever, and shortness of breathing, these are the uh, common uh, symptoms for COVID-19. If a cancer patient feels that he or she has developed with symptoms of COVID-19, they should stay home and uh, call at the nearest uh, healthcare center and let them know. This will keep them, take care of the patient, but also keep other uh, persons uh, protected from the COVID-19 infections. The patients who develop the uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 symptoms, uh, which are shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, blue lip and face, persistent pressure or pain in the chest, chest inability to arose or new confusion. The cancer, cancer patients which are suffering from COVID-19 can be, uh, may be divided into three categories. Categories. First one is the tier one. This is the higher priority. The patient's condition is life threatening and clinically unstable. These patients should uh, get treatment on immediate basis. The second one is tier second, uh, tier second immediate uh, mid, uh, medium priority. These uh, patients, uh, condition of these patients are non critical and the treatment can be extended to the beyond six weeks. And uh, the tier three, low priority, the patient condition is very stable and the Treatment can be delayed for the uh, longer time. 
the out outpatient uh, the outpatient should be considered on following basis the screening and trials of uh, staff and patients testing of appropriate patients test uh, consider phone trials and telemedicine for routine appointments and only keep urgent patient appointment and following are the patient variables which should be considered consider, considered for the cancer patient for their management uh, which is which are the status of malignancy means the word what is the phase of cancer how necessary immediate transfer treatment is ability to alter the therapy whether they can convert the therapy from iv to oral route or reduce the frequency of therapy cycles or uh, slightly change the therapy and the availability of health care resources eight the recommendations for the uh, oncologist oncologist during the covid 19 for the first for the patient safety the um, medical health care uh, person should pre screen or screen the covid 19 symptoms and exposure history using telephone calls or digital platform then they should develop the screening clinical screen, training for the evaluation and testing of patient with symptoms in dedicated unit with dedicated staff they should use telemedicine visits whenever it is possible you need to exclude the visitor and limit the surgeries and procedures to essential urgent and emergent cases the healthcare providers should consider the alternative dosing schedule to reduce the in person visit change the therapy to oral oncolytic if possible transition the outpatient care to the home care if possible increase the interval level uh, increase the interval between the scans or they can replace the scan with biochemical markers and offer resources for the patient wellness and stress management here are the uh, some uh, guidelines for caregivers for the like the doctors nurses and other health professionals they should use proper health protective uh, personal protective equipment uh, the they should get centralized resources for communication so they can get that uh, rapid guidelines about ppe and workflow changes implement the daily screening tools and temperature check and they should limit the on site staff participating in the rotation on the daily basis they should uh, follow the stay at home and return to work guidelines and they should offer the uh, resources for caregiver uh, caregiver wellness and stress management the uh, here um, following are the extra protection for uh, protection for the cancer patients tell visitor not to call if they have any symptoms of corona to avoid the unnecessary panic meet people in a well, well ventilated room or outdoor when they visit us to wash their hands properly and keep a space distance of at least 2 meter between the patient and visitor make a joint plan with family friends and neighbors to support the patient need patient needs now or if patient become unwell and refill the uh, prescription medic med medications and over the counter medicines and supplies and keep uh, physically active They uh, do not allow more than two visitors at a time. Don't shake hands with visitors and don't isolate the patient from friends and family, because it may uh, cause the depression to the cancer patient. There is the information regarding the COVID-19. What are the misinformation and the facts? Myth is that only older people are affected with the coronavirus. Fact is that. the people who are elderly than the 60 years and having the uh, conditions like diabetes uh, and hypertension they are more vulnerable but young persons can also get infected the second myth is they can be transmitted by the mosquito bite but no such evidence is proven third is the spraying alcohol or chlorine uh, chlorine kills the coronavirus yes this alcohol and chlorine are the disinfectant Spraying these chemicals on the body will not kill the coronavirus. In fact, it will harm the body. Coronavirus can't survive in snow and cold weather. There is no such evidence yet that it can't survive in the cold weather. COVID-19 can transmit in all areas, including hot and humid weather. Eating garlic prevents the coronavirus infection. Yes, it is true that garlic has some anti antimicrobial properties, but there is no such evidence that it will. Uh, prevent the infection of coronavirus 
that oat water bath oat bath prevents the coronavirus infection it is it doesn't prove hand dryers can kill the coronavirus hand dryers are not effective in this case uv lamp can minimize the surface contamination contamination with coronavirus it should not be used to sterilize the skin because it may cause the skin ir uh, irritation thermal scanners can detect the covid 19 thermal scanner can effective are measuring the skin temperature only they are not for screening of covid 19 taking antibiotic can prevent the coronavirus infection antibiotic work only on the bacteria it will not work against viruses it should not be used as a means of prevention or treatment of coronavirus it may cause harmful effect side effect vaccines pneumonia can protect the protect from coronavirus. hello pooja you have a uh, uh, two more minutes uh can you uh, can you rush up a bit yeah i'm about to, about to finish and vaccines against mm -hmm. pneumonia do not provide any protection against the novel coronavirus the conclusion is the cancer patients are more susceptible to coronavirus infection because they are under the immunosuppressive conditions because of their cancer and the treatment they are getting cancer patients needed extra care because they may get infection um, easily oncologists should be more attentive to detect the coronavirus infection at early stages because at the advanced stage there will be higher risk of unfavorable outcome oncologists and other healthcare professional which are involved in the uh, cancer care should uh, have a critical opportunity to communicate the patient the right information regarding the practice modification that you covid 19 out outbreak otherwise it may was panic in, in the cancer patient and their family and the oncologist must ensure the patient that they should spend more time at home and less time out in the community thank you uh, thank you pooja uh, participants do you have any questions okay and uh, so are you are you working uh, uh, working with with respect to oncology stuff and what are you really doing actually yeah actually i am working on the cancer treat cancer and novel drug delivery system for cancer treatment particularly i am working on lung cancer targeting and mm -hmm. brain cancer targeting okay so which means like the uh, spe so do you see uh, incidence of uh, this infection in the in in more in like lung cancer patients than any other cancer types no 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 not in lung cancer it is there may be more chances in uh, blood related cancers because in that case the patient is already immunosuppressive the immunity is already less as compared to other normal person and the cancer patient who are getting chemotherapy or they are taking the treatment for uh, cancer their immuno immune system is Uh, down already. Did yes. Already, so they are yes, more. Their good cells are being killed, and so yeah, that's true. And uh, and just because COVID actually uh, the particular viral strain actually affects the lungs, and uh, you mean to say that there are more more in lung cancer patients, and also in blood cancer patients. Yeah, lung cancer patients they will be affected like, uh, but in blood cancer. in blood cancer that immunity is uh, compromised already compromised yes in lung cancer after treatment it is compromised in blood cancer it is already compromised already compromised yes. i understand yes. they will be higher risk or we can't uh, delay the treatment of cancer patient so that's why i have told no that uh, we can divide the cancer patient into three categories in which can yes yes If they are yes. coming in category one, we need to give treatment. Yeah. More we can do, we can replace, we can uh, shift from intravenous to oral, so the patient can take. But but can you really treat a uh, a cancer patient uh, with uh, who is affected with coronavirus infection? Do they have all these uh, you know cross talking mechanisms already going on in the human body that they may be? they may find it difficult to cope up yeah actually the morbidity mortality rate is double in cancer patients mm -hmm. 
um, like it depend upon one person's individual immunity system and their recovery, how they uh, uh, recover and how they react to their system, like uh, medicine, yep. whatever treatment they are getting for Corona. Okay. Yeah, I am. And uh, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next presenter is going to be um, Prashant, Prashant Kumar. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you please share your content? Yes, sir. And uh, I think the following presenter can be ready. Like the for like the next presenter should be Deekshita Panwar and then Anupam Jyoti. So you can be ready. Hello, Prasha. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Can you share your slides? Yes, sir. I, sh I have shared. Okay. Is it visible? Uh, no, it's not visible yet. Uh, can you click uh, share content and then share the slide or your screen? Yeah, we're sharing now. Yes, it is visible. You can speak a little bit loud and uh, make oh. sure you finish the presentation on time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Prashant Kumar, the Department of Dietitian and DHSC. I am going to present uh, my topic. There is a structure based reprocessing of metabolic and cancer therapy for the prevention of the patient against COVID 19 infection. So, before, before I am starting, I have some, I saw some Hollywood movies which are, uh, which are related to the uh, viral infection and who saw it coming to the uh, viral infection, how it comes to uh, uh, the immune base. So, these are those movies, about 30 movies, in which the dead one contagion is entirely dependent on the uh, coronavirus infection. So, I suggest you all to uh, see this. And, uh, and uh, uh, let's start uh, about that uh, uh, coronavirus infection. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the outbreak says that uh, WHO notifies that uh, it started from the Wuhan city of China on the 31st of December to the uh, 31st December 2019. And uh, China shares this uh, genome sequence of 11 January 2020. And uh, it becomes pandemic on 11 March 2020. So, uh, uh, in, uh, according to WHO, the public has been international concern. It is pandemic on 11 March 2020. And it is believed to have genetic origin and has no genetic similarity to the bad coronavirus. So, the virus shows little genetic diversity, indicating that that vaccine uh, has occurred in. Late 2019. So we, we all know that uh, this uh, coronavirus is not new. Uh, this is old, but this is the new, uh, the uh, the virus which we are facing today is the novel coronavirus. This is the new form of the old coronavirus, which is which is published as the COVID one. So uh, each infection of this epidemiological study estimates that each infection results in 1.4.9 humans in the absence of immunity. In the members of community and no preventive measures uh, are taken. So uh, now, now in, uh, as an introduction, the classification of this virus says that it belongs to the family of uh, coronavirus and genus beta coronavirus. 
and the respiratory system as we know to the retinal respiratory system is the photon are some some basic facts uh, of this covid uh, say that uh, you know on four word about 215 uh, countries are infected and uh, in including india and uh, we see this uh, this are the death rate is 8% and total recovered percentage 90% so recovery rate is good as as in our country also but uh, death rate is also there so so the of recovery of covid 19 genetic material is uh, blood brain mucus lungs organophenes saliva swab and urine and uh, the genomic sequence uh, says that if gp content is हेलो प्रशांत कैन यू बी बिट मोर लाउडर कैन यू बी बिट मोर क्लोजर बिकॉज योर वॉइस इज ब्रेकिंग ओके मैम या या आई थिंक देयर इज सम सॉर्ट ऑफ एकोइंग आल्सो गोइंग ऑन लाइक यू नो और प्रॉब्लम वी फी यस यस एंड यू कैन बी अ बिट मोर लाउडर या so this is the this is the snapshot of uh, this uh, uh, virus structure that is sars cov we can see here the spike proteins on it and uh, the internal helical nucleocapsid protein uh, five cap protein and uh, the envelope proteins and the matrix glycoprotein these are the all internal uh, things in this virus so and uh, this uh, this uh, this slide shows that uh, the infected alveoli cell of the lungs with this virus we can see here that uh, how virus infect and leads to uh, colony in the lungs so in diagnostic in diagnostic no diagnostic tests are currently licensed for covid-19 except under emergency use regulation so uh, 
ये डायग्नोसिस टेस्ट टू थर्टीन मिनट टू थ्री आवर्स टाइम एंड and antigen detection detection test detect viral antigen and could be useful for the diagnosis of acute infection and uh, treatment approaches of this virus uh, there are some virus, uh, there are some drugs uh, which are uh, approachable to this virus are first one is remdesivir then diponavir then uh, chloroquine also given also in the uh, in past uh, few days we uh, we saw that uh, there is a more demand for uh, chloroquine chloroquine also That there is, they, they are saying hydroxychloroquine. The hydroxychloroquine is the derivative. Mainly, it is the chloroquine. So, I am I am re-proposing the drugs. That is, first is imatinib. Imatinib is a small molecule Chinese inhibitor used to treat certain types of cancer. It is the first member of new class of agent that acts by inhibiting particular tyrosine kinase enzyme. It is a non-specifically inhibiting rapidly dividing cell. So, basically, it is a Chinese Chinese inhibitor. It is used in treating uh, treating chronic myelogenous leukemia, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, and number of other malignancies. So this is the clinical structure of the uh, the first drug which I have uh, re-proposed. That is imatinib, and the second one is gemcitabine. Uh, it is also anti-cancer in nature. It is a nucleoside analog used as a chemotherapy. It is uh, marked. Uh, it is marketed as a gem gem drug by the Eli Lilly company, as with fluorocil and other analogs of pyrimidine. The drug replaces one of the building blocks of nucleic acid. In this case, uh, cytidine during the DNA replication, the proposed uh, the process arrests tumor growth and new nucleotide cannot be attached to the faulty nucleotide. So this is uh, basically the uh, uh, this is basically blocking the pyrimidine biosynthesis in the DNA replication. So this is the chemical structure of gemcitabine, another drug. So this, uh, here is a question arose that uh, why I have used imatinib and gemcitabine all, or, uh, only. So first reason for imatinib is high throughput screening studies have reported that KBL kinase inhibitors such as uh, imatinib as inhibitor of coronavirus, SARS and MERS. The SARS COVID virus depend on the KBL two kinase activity to shoot and enter the uh, entire cell. So imatinib inhibits SARS COVID and MERS COVID with very low toxicity in, in the in vivo study. Performed in the mouse model of vaccinia virus infection, so that imatinib was effective in blocking the dissemination of the virus. Uh, th uh, this is done by Philip uh, and Philip uh, Wilson in 2020 and Ashkan and Medi. So, and the second for gemcitabine is an also an anti-cancer chemotherapy with antiviral activity against a broad range of virus as a cytokine analog. Uh, gemcitabine has been reported to have an immunity effect on pyrimidine biosynthesis. So the primary mechanism to explain the antiviral effect of nucleoside analog is based on their direct action on the viral polymer. So this second drug, gemcitabine, uh, inhibits the viral viral poly polymerization. This is done by Shin et al. at 2018. So this is my docking study I have done with the uh, software Schrodinger to Mistro. Uh, so this is the docking pose of the first drug, imatinib. Which shows interaction with the uh, neighboring amino acid at the active site region, and uh, it, 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 it shows a good, good finding. And second one is the docking interaction of gems. Gems it has been with the SARS COV-2 main protein. Uh, it, uh, the active site region is same. Only the structure, uh, uh, this is small in the structure, so it uh, it gives more interaction. This is the docking result of uh, these two drugs, imatinib and gems it has been. The docking exposure of imatinib is minus 10, and for gemcitabine is minus 8.8. Uh, and the glide E model exposure uh, is 96, minus 96.1 kilocalories per mole, and for uh, gemcitabine is minus 64. The glide energy is minus 63.8 kilocalories per mole, and uh, for gemcitabine is minus 64. So these are the. Uh, the you know, hello. We have one more minute to finish your discussion. Yes, sir. You have one more minute uh, to finish your talk. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. These, uh, these, these are the, uh, these are the uh, binding of these two drugs in the active site region of uh, main protease. This is for gemcitabine. And in, in conclusion, I have said, said that the above study of the seems to be promising, and further study in the human circuit are warranted. At our center, we are already started a well-structured randomized virus study on the imatinib in the mild symptomatic SARS COVID two infection. This is the project number which we have granted for the clinical trial of this imatinib. We are in the process of designing another study involving gemcitabine also. So, 
So we would like to give this message to our fellow community that a collaborating multi-centric team effort and a rapid screening of multi drugs might go to the effective strategy during the management of this pandemic. And some and some prevention which are we are taking uh, during uh, nowadays are these. And our prime minister also uh, focused on the uh, that uh, we have to maintain the distance from each other. And these are some uh, lockdown places which we are facing uh, now nowadays. And these are references and acknowledgement. Thank you, Prashant, for your presentation. Yes, sir. So you told about the drugs, right, uh, which are used against cancer, right? Yes, yes, sir. So uh, how do you see the using that drugs for this COVID treatment as uh, what, how, what are the side effects uh, for normal cells, which can be because of those medications? Sir, uh, uh, among the drugs, most common medication, your voice is not clear. Can you speak a bit louder? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, among two drugs, uh, I, uh, our institute uh, approves for clinical trial for imatinib, but uh, this, uh, there, uh, the side effect is very low. There are no side effects for COVID patients because uh, these are already marketed for anti cancer drugs. So they have very low ADV level, that is, absorption, distribution, activation, and metabolism, uh, on which we, uh, we can judge the uh, drug toxicity. Okay. Yeah, but uh, in cancer, uh, say in cancer, it is like uh, it is targeting the overexposed protein in case of yeah. cancer. So in yeah. our case, there is no overexpression, but the normally functioning protein also will bind to the uh, compound which you are suggesting, right? Yeah, but sir, there is a chance. Yes, yeah, sir. But the recent studies suggest that uh, this uh, this imatinib is kinase inhibitor. So the mm -hmm. uh, the clinical we are uh, not. Um, we are only only we are uh, in, in simple study we are finding that they are uh, they are they are very limited uh, they are very limited amount of inhibition is there but uh, in vitro studies is still uh, is still remaining so uh, okay. it, it, it is under process that in vitro studies it is still under process but in vivo in simple study is uh, this one which uh, I presented here okay. Did you perform any molecular dynamics? Yes, sir. MD, I, I am uh, right now. I am going on. Just I am facing some of that software problem. But MD analysis, I am going on. Going on with it. Okay. Uh, what about the uh, interactions? Are uh, did, uh, I mean, how stable or what to say? Uh, comparatively with, with what molecules actually? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, among I think twenty molecules, I have screened. Uh, these mm -hmm. two are the highest score which I got. So, stability wise and uh, uh, that structural analysis reveals that first one, imatinib uh, is more stable than gemcitabine because uh, imatinib has four to five hydrogen bonds and uh, about 20 interval contacts in the active site region. And uh, uh, comparatively, gemcitabine is uh, quite low. So, but but uh, gemcitabine is also uh, more than other other drugs which I have seen. So I have included, I have also included one hard drug also, but that was antibiotic, that was a very big structure. So that software is not taking that because the molecular weight of that was very, very high. So these two drugs I propose in my project also and in my paper also, uh, which is under review for publishing. So these two are approved from AIMS and ICMR in collaboration. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you for answering the questions. Now we are moving to the next speaker, Dikshita. Dikshita will present on microRNA based feasible treatment for COVID 19. Hello, Hello Dikshita. Hello, yes, I can hear you. Now you can share your slide. Yeah.
you can start your presentation yeah we can hear you and uh, see your screen also yeah it is visible you can make it a presentation mode and then start your presentation hello dikshita can you hear us your voice is not very clear we are unable to hear you dikshita yeah, Is this visible to you, my slides? Yes, your slides are visible. Uh, can you make it presentation mode? Yes, slideshow. Yeah. And can you speak a bit, little bit louder and then you can start your presentation. And make sure you finish before the time. Hello, Dikshita. Yeah, your voice was lost in the starting. So these are the content we are going to. This is a brief introduction about microRNA. MicroRNA is a small non-coding RNA which is approximately 22 nucleotide long, and it, in its primary structure, it is a stamped structure. And after further cleaving, and in, in its mature form, it is 20, approximately 22 nucleotide long. It mainly regulates the gene expression by egg on the specific sequence specific messenger RNA. It will either degrade the messenger RNA or translate or translation repression. It also involves in immune response by modulating the function of immune cells. Here is the biogenesis of microRNA. The biogenesis of microRNA starts inside the nucleus. The primary stem root structure of primary microRNA here an endonuclease enzyme, which is dorsa with a protein DGCR8, came and cleaved the primary microRNA into the precursor microRNA. Now, the precursor microRNA came out uh, through the help with the help of exposing high protein outside from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And here, another cleavage also occurred with the help of another endonuclease enzyme, which is Dicer. After the cleavage, a microRNA microRNA duplex forms here. And this microRNA microRNA duplex having an overhang in a strand. Now, uh, another complex, this RNA inducing silencing complex came and bind with this microRNA microRNA duplex. Which the RIS complex is having a slicer enzyme uh, with a protein, the protein known agronet protein, which will bind to the overhang strand, which is having an overhang which will bind tightly with the strand, and the another the enzyme will cleave the double stranded structure, and the one one strand will be leave from here, and one one, one strand will bind it with the RIS complex. So the leave. Uh, hello, Dikshita. Yes, voice is breaking. Uh, do you use a headphone or are you using the internal speaker? Yeah, ma'am, I'm using headphones. Okay, can you can you hold it uh, close to your 
uh, in a mouth so that you can, so it can reach. Uh, hello? Yeah, it can reach people. Or sometimes the problem may be with the background as well. If you had switched on a fan or something. So kindly look into that. Yeah. Yeah, kindly be a bit louder. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Is it okay, ma'am? Can you speak a louder little bit? Is it okay, ma'am, now? Yeah, now it's fine. It's yeah. fine? Yeah, okay, so sorry. Now the RNA strand which is binded with this complex is activated messenger RNA which will gain and bind to the messenger RNA. It will either inhibit translation uh, by blocking the site of ribosome, by blocking the site of ribosome binding and it will either cleave the messenger RNA with the help of enzyme which is in, included in this complex. So this is the mechanism of microRNA for regulation of gene. And now we'll discuss about the microRNA, how microRNA is important in immune response for viral replication. In a study, it has seen that the RNA interference, the inhibition of RNA interference machinery leads to accumulation of primate forming virus specifically and after the research it was found that microRNA 30 shows have the specific sequence for binding with this virus. Similarly, in another study it has seen that several microRNA identified to suppress human immunodeficiency virus HIV. It, uh, an opposite data, it will also regulate the post positively regulate viral application. It suppresses shows reduction of viral infection. As an immune response, another microRNA, which is 6.24 target anti vector during viral infection, leads to cell apoptosis. So, due to the involvement of messenger RNA into the immune response, it leads to new concept of developing a therapy for specific microRNA delivery against the infection. It's a brief debut of COVID, so the coronavirus, which is having a positive strand RNA, which, which is, can be used as a messenger RNA. First identified in Wuhan city of China, it is genetically originated, totally transmitted. Commonly, its symptoms are causing common cold to more severe respiratory syndrome. This is the structure of coronavirus, which is having a spike protein, membrane protein, envelope, single standard RNA. This spike protein helps it to bind with the, the cells. This is the replication mechanism of coronavirus. The spike protein of the virus will bind to a receptor of cell which is enzyme enzyme converting enzyme and inject its genomic RNA inside the cell. The virus, virus uses the host cell replication machinery to synthesize its protein and assemble it to a mature virus particle. Through the process of exocytosis, the virus came out through the cells, and this is the concept: microRNA as a messenger RNA inhibitor for COVID-19. So this, through this, through the help, with the help of this, utilizing microRNA called microRNA regulation process, we can inhibit viral replication by targeting its viral, its genomic RNA. For this, we have to deliver a sequence specific messenger RNA into these cells. For delivering, we can use exosomes. These are the supportive data. In favor of that, we can use this concept. And what is exosomes? Why how we can be used to deliver? Exosomes are the extracellular vesicles having phospholipid bilayer found in biological fluid and it is used in cellular transmission. Exosome as a direct activity is 
exosome widely used for drug removal as a nanovesicle. Exosomes can be engineered to decode specific drug or oligonucleotide. And a study shows that active microRNA delivery successfully 142 for tumor genesis reduction in breast cancer. But there are several limitations for using this concept. These are typical selection of specific microRNA lack like of evidence, less experimental as compared to vaccine, not provide long-term protection as vaccine. But there are some techniques can be utilized to overcome these limitations. Utilization of bioinformatics techniques for specific treatments find a suitable delivery agent with less immunogenicity. To increase the efficiency, more than one microRNA has been utilized. Binding interaction should be strong, further in or in vitro study required for this future. Thank you for your presentation, Dikshita. Yes, so, what do you think about the structure prediction of the uh, microRNAs? Sorry, sir. About the structure prediction of microRNAs, because uh, you are a uh, uh, suggesting that to use as an inhibitor, right? Yes, sir. For so instant how... use, we can use microRNA because vaccines, to develop a vaccine, it takes a longer time. And if so you want have... to define microRNA against uh, RNA of virus, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, what is the mode of administration you would suggest? Sir, it's a uh, exosome based delivery. Exosome derived from the cells. It is less immunogenic and it can be used as a targeted delivery. We can synthesize exosomes, recombinant exosomes, and we can load the microRNA into this. It will target it. It will target delivery to the ACE2 ACE2 receptor cells where the coronavirus are infected. Okay. So with the help thank you for your presentation. Yes. Yeah, with the help of something you want to tell me. Yeah, with the help of exosomes, it can be utilized. Okay. Thank you, Jisicha, for your presentation. The next speaker. Anupam Jyoti. Hello. Anupam Jyoti here, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sharing you to be the presenter. You can share your slide and start the presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. The presentation visible to you, sir? Uh, yes, presentation is visible. Uh, you can go to presentation mode, slideshow. Yeah, yeah. And make sure you finish the talk. I'll finish in time. Yeah, yeah. I will yeah. try to finish the talk in time. No problem, sir. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer of the conference who have given me a chance to present part of some ongoing work, and which is titled as Homology Modeling and Bioinformatics Approach for the Identification of B cell Linear Epitope of SARS Coronavirus Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, envelope protein. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think the slide is freezed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, now, can you see the next slide? Background slide. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, now I got So, coronavirus belong to family coronaviridae are enveloped non segmented single stranded positive sense RNA viruses and infect humans and various animals that is, bats, birds, camels, cats, dogs, and even mice. SARS coronavirus 2 causing respiratory illness is associated with high incidence of infectivity and mortality. So, as of today, that is 3rd July 2020, and as per the data of the WHO, Globally, there have been more than 100 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including 5,12,842 deaths already reported. 
SARS CoV 2 genome encodes various non structural, structural, and accessory proteins. Among the structural proteins, there is a protein that is enveloped protein. This enveloped protein is a small structural protein having nearly 75 to 100 amino acid sequence, amino acids, which play a pivotal role in the host cell recognition, intracellular trafficking, viral assembly, and virus budding. And this data or this report is on the basis of the MERS and SARS CoV 1, which have been uh, or which enveloped protein have been studied earlier. Hence, it could be an important determinant of viral infectivity and pathogenesis. So, to mitigate the SARS CoV 2, deciphering the protein structure and immunological responses by employing bioinformatics tools for the data mining analysis is pivotal. So, hence, the therapeutic strategies to inhibit the host recognition, viral assembly, and budding by targeting E protein could be an attractive paradigm for developing anti SARS CoV 2 drugs. So, with this background, the following methods we have achieved. So, I have used the Viper as a database to which I have retrieved the sequence and then the NCBI, the gene, uh, proteome and genome sequence have been retrieved and alignment have been done with the help, uh, help of Crestal Omega. Then on the basis of protein se sequence, the physiochemical characterization has been done by online tool that is called Param tool. And then in silico BC linear repeater prediction was done by online server that is ABC fed and alignment of the sequence by blast and further structure prediction and validation has been done by a online tool that is fire two and uh, protein structure was seen by pymol and further it's validated it is validated by project and using the uh, and the rampage to see whether the structures are uh, allowed or in disallowed region. So first of all, uh, I have retrieved nearly 100 strains of SARS-CoV-2 from the um, Viper sequence and then uh, from the Viper database and the sequence have been retrieved from the NCBI. So out of 100, I found nearly 45, uh, 46 sequence which were the full length and the remaining sequence have been discarded or we, they have not been used for this study because they were the partial length. So these are the 46 sequences. And then when we did the homology in between the all the sequences, we found nearly 98% sequence similarity we have found using the cluster omega. So this is the result of the sequence similarity. So you can see almost 100% are uh, sequence are similar. However, in one or two sequences, nearly 98% sequence similarity was there. So uh, we can say and the sequence uh, dissimilarity that is point uh, that is one to two percent. The variation in the amino acid sequence that was not significant that we found. And for, uh, from that, I have pick, uh, picked one accession number that is QHZ00381.1 that was on the top one in the Viber database. So I picked that uh, accession number sequence and then I uh, did all the uh, characterization of this protein using in silico method. So, first of all, physiochemical properties. So, for that, uh, the sequence of this particular accession number has been pasted into the uh, uh, parent tool and find the following properties. As you can see, the number of amino acids is 75, molecular weight is 8.38 kg. That is very relatively very smaller protein. And uh, more importantly, the PI value was nearly 8.57, extinction coefficient 6085. Aliphatic index, which is the uh, indicating of the thermal. Uh, stability that was 138.8 that is it seems it is the quite stable and the gravity that is uh, important that shows the hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity so if its value is the positive that is hydrophobic so uh, the protein is hydrophobic so most likely the protein should be present in the transmembrane region that we will see later on and then in stability index so i found the protein is quite stable because if its value is less than 40 it is stable if it is value is more than 40 it is unstable so in our case i found it the stable protein then protein hydropathy plot for that i have used the chitin and dolittle hydropathy plot so what i found uh, if you can see here uh, here is a zero so score above the zero is for the positive value so if you find your amino acid sequence above zero it means protein is hydrophobic and below zero, that is negative, that is sequence is hydrophilic. And this is the amino acid position. So when I pasted the amino acid sequence in this model, then I found this type of the hydropathic plot. So from the amino acid 7, 2, 
fifty seven I found nearly all the amino acids are in the positive range means they are in the hydrophobic. So it means they may be in the transmembrane region. And beyond fifty seven, almost all we are in the negative region. Up to you can say uh, nearly sixty nine to seventy, and above that it rises very slightly. So these are uh, so here it should be hydrophilic, and remaining most of the sequences are in the hydrophobic region. So it, protein is both mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic with majority of the sequences of amino acid in hydrophobic region that is transmembrane lipid bilayer. The next important uh, uh, was to recognize whether this contains B cell linear epitope. If it contains the B cell linear epitope, we can use this protein for the um, uh, you can say this protein for the as an antigen for the vaccine development. So I have used the ABC thread program for fixing the different length of polypeptide for the estimation of epitope. So uh, the cutoff value was set more than 0.51 because when you uh, put your sequence in this program, you can find even the uh, presence of the B cell linear epitope from 0.1 to uh, 1. So we have to set a cutoff. So cutoff was set 0.51. And we have fixed the length 16 mer. So only 16 mer amino acid can be chosen. So when I pasted our sequence, so what I found that the two uh, uh, two sites that is at starting at the 48th position and at the 30th position, the prediction score was 0 0.8. So we uh, we thought that these two positions could be responsible for the antigenic response. Uh, so uh, this has a potential antigenic response, or it contains the B cell linear epitope at these particular amino acid sites. Next important was the molecular modeling of the SARS-CoV-2 protein. Since in the protein data bank till to date, the structure of SARS-CoV-2 envelope protein was not reported. So we thought to of the modeling of this protein and predict its structure. So uh, first of all, we did the tested the sequence in the fire 2 and then we did the plus. So we found Nearly 91% sequence similarity is there with the template sequence that is C5X29B PDB ID. And this PDB ID for the NMR is structure of SARS coronavirus envelope protein ion channel. And uh, uh, it ranked first among the blast result uh, with the confidence of 99.81. That's why C5X29B was chosen as a template structure for prediction of the uh, structure of our input protein. So, and this is the prediction of the secondary structure. So, you can see uh, this basically mainly of the alpha helix. So, it's a helical region. And uh, short stretch of the beta sheet is also there at the end. So, this alpha helix, if you see in the alpha helix, the so green region represents for the alpha helix, which is in the cytosolic or in the extracellular domain. And the, uh, this light brown color region of the alpha helix is basically the transmembrane helix. So, in the next figure, when we uh, uh, predicted the transmembrane helix region, so we found the structure is like this. So at the amino terminal from 1 to 9 amino acid and at the carboxyl terminal from 55 onward 75, these two domains are present in the extracellular region. And two domains, that is S1 and S2, that stands from 10th amino acid to 38 and 34 to 50. Uh, for uh, amino acid respectively, they are in the transmembrane region. And there is a hinge region in the cytosolic region which can which act as a connective region between these two timers. <coughs> and the red color which is showing here and here, so that is the amino acid region as you uh, as I have explained just um, in the B cell linear epitope. One region was the from the 30th position and second one was the 48th position. So from 30 to 16, that is 30 to 46 amino acid region. This was the B cell linear epitope region, and the, then the uh, 48 to 60, uh, 74, the remaining region was, uh, which is highlighted here with the red box, that is for the another B cell linear epitope region. So both the linear epitope region are basically in the cytoplasmic and extracellular domain region. And finally. Uh, uh, we have predicted the structure using the 5x29 as an template so you can see the structure so and when this structure is rich in the alpha helix as you predicted in the secondary structure and this alpha helix when we superimpose this helix with its the template one that is 5x29 so we found that the structure similarity or the deviation with the template structure is very less that is rmsd root mean square deviation so you can see here it is very less that is 0 0.077 so lesser the value of RMSD means better the uh, 
uh, structure similarity between these two proteins means the distance between the atoms of the template as well as um, predicted sequence is very less. So, uh, for, and and on the last, we have predicted that it's Ramachandran plot analysis to see whether the structure is uh, permissible region or not. So, for that, we use the project and uh, and then validated by or analyzed by the rampage um, uh, uh, rampage server. So, we found that. Nearly 85% of the, our protein input sequence are in the most favored region and uh, disallowed region are almost zero and uh, additionally allowed region are nearly 13%. So this analysis revealed the fidelity of our predicted model and this is concurred with the 5x29 which is already the structure known in the PDB. So uh, I am concluding here my presentation. So it was an in silico approach was employed for deciphering the structure of E protein, potential B cell epitope, and possible regions for E protein of the SARS CoV-2. The study provides valuable insight that could be useful for the development of monoclonal antibodies or inhibitor targeting E protein of SARS CoV-2, as well as diagnostic tools, shortly, which warrants empirical validation by rigorous and stringent wet lab experiment. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anupam, for your presentation. So what are the parameters when you are using the tools uh, you followed? Like you use the default parameters. Uh, did you change any parameters? So I I, uh, I have used the default parameters. OK. So uh, when your similarity study, so did you find uh, this protein similar to any of the previously known viruses? Uh, <coughs> I found this with the SARS coronavirus enveloped protein. And apart from that, okay. SARS coronavirus enveloped protein, I did not find any significant similarity. Okay. Yeah. So, what is your uh, future perspective? Like, how we can proceed after this step? Okay. Yeah, since the uh, yeah, we have predicted the structure, so now we have uh, we want to go for the search for the or you can say screen for the chemical inhibitors which are already known to inhibit the enveloped proteins right mm -hmm. to see whether mm -hmm. by docking study whether it can go and block this or binding is good or blocking this enveloped protein or not so in silico study is our future plan for the for the docking okay did you do any energy minimization steps for your predicted structure no okay. uh, up to here we, we did not do any energy minimization steps Okay. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Anupam Jyoti. Thank you, sir. So we'll move to the next session. Sorry, next speaker. Rashmi Ranjan. Yes. Yes, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, you are audible. Oh, yes. Yeah, you can share your PPT. So, is this? visible yes yes it is visible okay thanks. make sure you finish uh, on time yes sir. so good evening to all as i have some different topic uh, from the current situations it was invasomes uh, a drug delivery system so first of all what was invasome it was a liposomal vesicle as a drug carrier used for drug delivery through the skin mostly through the dermal and epidermal route of applications then what was the liposomal vesicle it was an artificial vesicle composed of one or more concentric phospholipid bilayers used specially to deliver microscopic substances to the body cells then about the drug carrier as we know it was a substrate used in the process of drug delivery which serves to improve the selectivity effectiveness and safety of the drug administration 
primarily used to control the release of drug into the systemic circulation. Then I have some comparative studies like some other carriers like liposome, neosome, transferosomes. So on the comparison, as we saw that liposome have the composition of phospholipids and cholesterol, then neosome composed of amphiphiles, some surfactants. Then directly I come to invasomes. What was the benefits of invasome in the in all of this? As we saw that it was composed of phosphatidylcholine, ethanol, topic, permian through tempo, tempofin, which is known as a photo photosensitizer treatment of a carcinoma of the head and neck, which is more useful as we know invasome is useful for its action that is penetrate the stratum conium with compared to liposome and other vesicle carriers. That's why it was more useful than all of this. Then we we'll go through the penetration enhancement mechanism that how first of all it was composed of ethanol, topin and also consisted of molecule. Then the first ethanol increase the lipid fluidity and decrease lipid layer density. As we know that ethanol is able to form the hydrogen bond. So it has the ability to decrease the lipid bilayer density. Then it penetrates through the lipid membrane. Then as tapin breaks the transverse hydrogen bonding leading towards the widening of aqueous region near the head groups. Then these are some limitations also. The major limitations of topical drug delivery, not only in invasome, it was not on invasome. Some the other uh, drugs, the main limitation was it has a low diffusion rate of drug across the stratum conium, which acts as a barrier and its structure as compared to brick wool with the keratin raised lipid lamellae thin layer membrane of plate of tissues. Hence, invasomes were developed as a vesicular carrier to overcome this. As the vesicles are used in the dermal and transdermal drug delivery, as they might act as a drug carrier to deliver entrapped drug molecules into on across the screen. Then some advantages of that. As invasomes are soft, malleable, elastic vesicles of homogeneity, most inilamellar and deformable. It was the enhanced solubility, photostability, and also decreased the skin irritation. It contained ethanol topin, which play the role of penetration enhancer for the penetration of individual lipid component into the stratum conium, subsequently altering the intracellular lipid lamellae. As it has the major advantages that it was help in the delivery of both hydrophilic and lipophilic drugs. Contains non-toxic raw materials in the formulation as it was the non-invasive technique of the drug delivery. Patient compliance as the drug is administered through the semi-solid form like gel or cream. So patient compliance is also be there. It reduces the first pulse metabolism also. Constant drug level self-administration and the restricted patient activity like some disadvantages are there as it was mostly delivered as transdermal patch. So it have the chances of fall or removal of the patch during bath or in contact with sweat or moisture. Some uses like inversions of isoridipine for enhanced transdermal delivery use against hypertension. As we know, isoridipine is a calcium blocker. It extends first plus metabolism, oral viability. Hence, it uses among with invasome for enhanced action. Dapson loaded invasomes also used as a potential treatment of acne, in which invasomes enhance the skin retention capability of Dapson. Then, some method of preparations I took two methods. First one was mechanical dispersion technique. Drug and terpene of the mixer and the mixers also 
of terpene are dissolved in ethanolic phospholipid solution. Then the mixer was bottexed for five minutes and then sonicator for five minutes in order to obtain a clear solution. Then PBS is added to the solution by a syringe on the, the same constant bottexing. Then the bottexing is continued for another additional five minutes. The last step is the extrusion of multi lamellar vesicles through polycarbonate membranes of different pore sizes. The inbosome dispersion are extruded through each polycarbonate membrane, and for several times we can obtain that. Then another method was film hydration technique. By the conventional film method, we also prepared that. First, we have to done the phospholipid with ethanol dissolving in the methanol and chloroform, who is 200 CU. Then the mixture is dried to a thin film by slowly reducing the pressure from 500 to 1 millivore at 50 degrees centigrade using the rotary flux evaporator. Then the film is kept on the vacuum in the, in the same 1 millibar for 2 hours at the room temperature and subsequently flushed with nitrogen. Then the film deposited on the side. It was hydrated for 30 minutes at level for transition with a mixture of phosphate buffer containing ethanol and terpenes or hydrated phosphate buffer. After cooling in to the room temperature, ethanol and single terpene or a terpene mixer are added to obtain the endbosomes. We can take Hello, also Yes, sir. Can you be a bit faster? Uh, you have one more minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then the characterization also we check that the shape was we check uh, through the transmission electron microscope. Then we also check the zeta potential through the zeta sizer. Drug entrapment with the ultra centrifugation technique. Then the drug content, which was the most characteristic things, was performed by the liquid chromatographic method. Then the skin permeation studies by the laser scanning microscopy. We can chase with the help of France diffusion cells along with PBS. Then last, lastly, we have the conclusion. As we saw all this, the formula of invasome, which could be a promising tool for delivering drugs through the skin and can provide better skin permission than liposomes and other vesicles. Invasomes have been tested to encapsulate hydrophilic drugs and hydrophilic drugs both. Hence, they can open up new challenges and opportunities for the development of novel improved therapies. That's all from mine. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi Rajan, for your presentation. One quick question. So, yes, uh, what of or the mode of administration for these invasosomes? So if it will be passing through metabolism, so won't it be degraded or something will happen to it? Sir, as it was dermally and transdermally we taken. Okay. So how it will be like transmitted to other parts, you think, through blood? No, sir, not through blood. It was it. Okay. Uh, as we saw that directly targeted to, towards the receptor, Mm -hmm. It was done like that, but without not touching through the systemic circulations. Okay, so yes, how to directly target only the uh, specific? Uh, you have any uh, specificity towards target? Yes, sir. During the QSS studies, we have the, the proofs like that that it was only directed no. towards the. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for Thanks, answering sir. and for the nice presentation. We'll go Thanks, to the sir. next presenter. I think now we'll move to the poster session. Two poster, we'll finish it and then we'll move on to the oral presentation. So, participants for staying with us, even there is some delay. So, now I'll go with Pratiba.
பிரணவ் ஐ திங்க் சரவணா பெருமனா பெருமாள் no no i am uh, changing just uh, poster session so it can sure, finish sure. it okay hello pratipa can you hear us you can close the uh, i mean minimize the other windows so that we can see and make sure to finish your presentation in 5 minutes so that we will be we'll have time for your questions hello yeah we can hear you hello sir can you yeah yes sir is my screen is visible yes, your screen is visible okay so can you see the content sir yes yes but uh, can you minimize the right side uh, on small window okay sir yeah you can start so good evening everyone i am pratibha m tech student from iit hyderabad so i am going on spike protein so the spike protein the mutations in the spike protein and then because of the mutation what is going to be the effect in its function and uh, drug repurposing uh, on these mutants by in silico analysis so what we know so far is the background knowledge about the virus this uh, sars cov2 a novel corona virus belongs to the beta corona virus family its genome is made up of rna whose size is around 29 to 30 kilo base pairs this is called as a pandemic as we all know because it has spread overseas across the globe and then more than 61 lakh people got affected by this virus as per the who's uh, statement by the 31st may and as we all know it is an airborne disease which spread through the aerosols whose size is around less than uh, less than 3 microns and then here is the structure so far many of them has discussed about it uh, but in brief i would like to say that the structure the proteins are almost four structural proteins and 16 non structural proteins present in this uh, virus uh, here uh, i have mentioned this s represents the spike protein e represents the envelope m represents the membrane and then h represents the heme dikinase and then n is the new and then majorly i would like to discuss about this spike protein because the virus enters into our body through the spike protein it is getting attached to the ace receptors these ace receptors are present on the epithelial layers epithelial cells uh, for example it is present in our lung kidney etc so once when the particle enters into our body it enters through the respiratory tract and reaches the lung alveoli and this ace receptor is present here in more detailed way i will be explaining about this attachment so the spike protein is made up of two domains mainly here it is the n terminal domain and the c terminal domain which is present in the s1 of the spike protein and other is the s2 domain of this spike protein so here the c terminal domain is known as the receptor binding domain and this is the uh, representation of it here you can see in the blue color is the ntd red color is the rdd here it is the s2 and then here you can see that the ace receptor interacting with the receptor binding domain through two major helical loops of this uh, human ace receptor so Uh, this is how when the interaction is going to happen in the ace receptor the host cell releases a protease serine protease called tmprss once it is released the s1 s2 domain where the boundary is present here here the enzyme acts and cleaves the s1 and s2 domain and the structural rearrangement happens in the s2 domain once this rearrangement happens it enters into the cell through the formation of endocytes a vesicle like structure only after this formation it will uh, bind to the lysozyme enzyme and further uh, release and uh, uh, translation and then the packaging of the viruses and replication processes are going to happen which i am not going to detail here because of the time limitation 
so i am jumping into the aim of my study it is to investigate the possibility of the mutation in the spike protein across different countries across the globe and then to study the impact of such mutations in the structure and in function as well finally to uh, find a potential drug candidate called as the re drug repurposing which means or uh, to to screen the already existing fda approved drugs uh, for its ability to go and bind to the pro spike protein and to inhibit its replication to achieve this aim i have set certain objectives so first objective is to collect the sequences of this spike protein from different part of the world and then to do multiple sequence and then to identify if there is any amino acid mutation present and then to model the mutant proteins then to do the docking study of these model proteins with ace2 receptor and then finally to do the virtual screening uh, or the uh, of the drugs so to carry out this study i have certain uh, methods to be followed first is the multiple sequence alignment was done with the help of the met software and the even phylogenetic tree was constructed with the help of uh, with the method called neighbor joining method secondly the pro uh, mutated protein was modeled using a swiss model web server which is a homology modeling software then the structured uh, the modeled protein was evaluated with the help of the ramachandran plot and then with the help of prosa web servers Finally, uh, S protein, which uh, binds to the receptor, was done with the help of the docking uh, tool called HADDOC. This HADDOC needs an input, which which is very specific. We have to mention that what are all the amino acids involved in the interaction. Those details was obtained from the crystallographic studies, which was already present in the PDB format. so it is very specific uh, docking tool we can give input such as what are all the amino acids involved in the ace receptor as well as in this uh, spike protein finally uh, the del g value uh, which means the binding energy was calculated with the help of prodigy web server and then small molecules for virtual screening which are the fd approved drugs were collected from uh, the uh, pub chem source and then this Uh, uh drugs were screened for only the receptor binding domain uh, for its ability to go and bind and the visualization tools which i have used are pymol and uh, the discovery studio pratibha so first is yes sir yeah like you have one more minute uh, you can finish okay sir so the coming to the results part so uh, uh, the mutations which are majorly present are listed here and i would like to signify the three major mutations which are present in high percentages one is d61 d614 g present in 57.5% among the uh, samples which i have taken and then uh, g476 s and b483 a which are present in 7.5% which uh, of the uh, sample which i have taken and this is the phylogenetic tree which i have uh, constructed this green color represents the d614g mutation and uh, interestingly there was an indirect correlation between the death, uh, between the countries which have highest death rate and the mutations this d614g mutation is present in the countries like majorly india and united states and japan so other two mutations are majorly present uh, in the countries of usa and in the brazil so this is what shown here and then i have modeled the protein and then i have uh, aligned it for its uh, deviation in its structure with the wild type the wild type i have uh, considered as wuhan's uh, uh, structure which initially been published so that has been uh, given in the blue color and the red color represents the mutated structure here because of one single amino acid mutation there is a move, uh, there is a rearrangement in the chain and this rearrangement was validated with the help of rmsd mean square root mean, uh, root the mean square values which was calculated with the help of pymol and it is like 0.1 0.09 
Uh, which is the deviation which I was found. And then uh, because of this uh, docking study, the del G value was different. In the wild type, it is only uh, minus 14.1, whereas in the D614G, it is minus 15.2 kilocal per mole. So you can see that uh, the del G value is getting uh, very lesser, which means uh, the ability of the protein to bind to the receptor is getting increased and when it is getting mutated. So virus is not simply undergoing the, any random mutation. It is gaining some kind of function, uh, functional gain, I can say, uh, through this analysis. And then uh, I have uh, went through uh, virtual screening of the drugs. Uh, from uh, 3,000 small molecules which I have screened using the Autodoc or Vena software, I have uh, uh, ended up with the top 30 drugs which can able to bind only with the receptor domain. Among them, I am presenting the th top three drugs which has the ability to bind. And this is I have calculated for uh, the ability of the digitoxin, glycodone, and the zorobicin HCL, uh, its ability to bind with the wild type and the mutant proteins. Here, digitoxin has the maximum minus 9.1 kilocalories per mole. And uh, the major novel part which I have ended up with this study is just we, it is not mandatory to study uh, the repurposing of drugs only with the wild type. It is mandatory to see what are all the major mutations happening in this uh, spike protein and how this uh, repurposing can repurpose the drug can efficiently bind even to the mutant protein as well. So that, uh, that is how I have ended with the top three drugs. This digitoxin is the drug which is used for cardiac problems. Glycodone is one of the type 2 diabetes drug and the zorobicin HCL is an anti-cancer drug. So these are all the top three drugs which I have found. And I would like to thank my head of the department, Dr. Tenmala Chelvi Ma'am, for helping me to do the MD simulation of these results. And thank you. Thank you, Pratipa, for the wonderful presentation. Thank so you. the two quick questions I would like to ask. So why did yes, you sir. consider a neighbor joining method for your construction of tree? So to construct a tree, uh, and there is no much uh, mutation changes, only single amino acid mutations are found. So to uh, align such closely related amino acids, we have to go for the neighbor joining method. Because we are not going to see any uh, relationship among diverse species. Within the species and the, within the same protein, one or two amino acid changes we need to cluster. This is one of the best way to do it. So in your point of view, how does the mutation affect the stability of binding? Because you can see the data which I have shown here. Uh, for the mutant proteins, there is uh, the del G binding energy is getting very minimum, which means uh, more negative the value, more the binding it is. That is how we will say according to the thermodynamics. So that's how this is leading. In that line, correlating it with the affected populations and the death cases with different countries. So all these mutations are based on the reports or protein submitted in a databases, right? Uh, no, sir. These reports which I have uh, done it using the software, I have only gathered the sequences from NCBI viruses and then I have modeled the structures and then I have docked it with the help of software called HADDOC to get to know about the uh, binding energies and I'm yes, correlating but, uh, with the statistics of death rates. Yeah, but uh, from where you collected the mutation uh, that uh, G476 is kind of changing to serine? This is what I have found through my uh, uh, multiple sequence oh, analysis. Yes, phylogeny. Not only phylogeny, I have used Mega7 software to align the amino acids, multiple sequence alignment. Okay. From that, did you perform see, any MD simulation? Uh, sorry, sir. Did you perform any MD simulation? So now only it is going on, sir. The work I have okay. recently completed and my HOD is helping me in doing the MD simulation okay, okay. of all the top okay. uh, your Phylogenetic analysis looks impressive. Which software did you use? Uh, Mega7 software I have used and then I have uh, edited these uh, things using the paint, Microsoft Paint. Okay. 
this the details i have added using the pen okay thank you pratipa for your presentation thank now you we'll move to the final poster presentation dr abhishek sen gupta hello hello sir hello Yes. Uh, hello sir my name is sakshi words and on the behalf of uh, abhishek sir i am presenting the poster i am co author okay. with him yeah okay good uh, so should i uh, present sorry, my sorry one second i will i will make you as a presenter okay okay oh you can so share this okay yes okay. yes fine sir is my screen is visible start, uh, yeah it is starting so make sure you finish within the time limit and so is it visible now sir yeah yeah okay sir so i will start now so good evening my name is sakshi words i am a btech bioinformatics bio student from amity university noida uttar pradesh and today i am here on our research work that is time series database dashboard for predicting and analyzing the covid-19 spread so i am working in this uh, so in this posture we will we were giving a overview about our research work um like what we have done till now and what we are intended to do in future so i will proceed from the background part it will give little bit introduction of coronavirus disease and what impact the disease made on world so yeah to, so coronavirus disease 2019 or covid-19 is highly contagious and pathogenic viral infection that is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 and it was first originated in wuhan city china and as uh, this coronavirus disease is in successor of the sars cov uh, disease which was originated back then between the 2002 and 2003 and at that time this affected 26 country and now uh, his, its success has uh, affected almost all over the country um, i mean to say around 216 uh, country so far affected from this uh, disease so yeah this disease is transmitted through human to human contact and uh, also through the aerosol and uh, through uh, the uh, the old age people and the uh, uh, people that having a medical health condition are more vulnerable to the disease compared to normal healthy persons and because of this such reasons coronavirus has become a public health concern for the world population as it leading to the uh, uh, hospitalization and deaths and also affected the global economy very badly uh, but i would like to mention some positive impact of this covid pandemic uh that i have seen during this pandemic period uh first thing like i our environment is improving day by day during this pandemic period i mean due to some due to the, this lockdown and all our um, environment is just um Uh, improving day by day that that is very good thing and second this pandemic help us to understand the importance of the um sanitization and also the personal hygiene so yeah it make us make us more attentive towards it so now i will uh, say that uh, it would be a, a blessing in disguise on other hand so yeah uh, now i will proceed toward our aim and work of our research so till now we have built build and we have created a da covid-19 dashboard um, which help us to understand the covid-19 spread in most affected uh, countries and we have also uh, listed this countries uh and that are um uh, us india china spain new zealand germany italy south and south korea and we have built this uh, covid-19 dashboard using um using uh, python programming uh, basically we have used a python 3 and now uh, after building this covid-19 dashboard in future our aim is using machine learning based approaches uh, for predicting the spread impact and also for predicting the severity of the cases for co this um, this covid-19 cases is arising in each country uh, so this part like our future work we are working on it so yeah it uh, it is still a uh, work in process right now 
so we also provided some glimpse of our future work so before going to that i will start from the methodology part um our methodology part is divided into two parts so first part is a data collection and data pre-processing uh, so we have collected the data from uh, john hopkins university repository from by from the via github and after uh, collecting the raw time series data um, we have um, retrieved the data of those country what I mentioned before in the aims and work part. Um, after retrieving uh, the data, we make it as a new data file. We pre-process our data um, in in that and because uh, in that part in date part uh the data was not very fine uh, so we just formatted the date time thing in our data and after formatting that uh, uh, our pre-processed data is looks like this i would say the final data looks like this so you, if you can see i zoom it out uh, so yeah this data is looking like this now um this help us to analyze and visualize our data um uh, properly so yeah after that we came to our exploratory data analysis part uh, where we are explore our data uh, in case to understand what the information our data is giving to us so here i have given some example of the uh, our eda what we have performed so in this graph um, it, this graph is showing the evolution of confirmed cases over time uh, in india during the pandemic lockdown which includes uh, all five phases of lockdown and that is the lockdown one two three four and the unlock phase one so uh, in this graph, you can see uh, the X axis is showing the date and the Y axis is showing the number of cases. And this X bar is showing the start point when the lockdown was held in India, that is 24th uh, March 2020. And uh, if you can see, the date is also mentioned. So here in the, the green bar is just representing the end date and the end date is the 29th June 2020. Uh, so during the June, the unlock phase one was going on so yeah this day this trend line is between these uh, five phases so you can see this uh, trend line of number of confirmed cases and uh, if you can see that from april to starting of the may but from the mid may the cases started rising at very high rate so yeah reason behind that we have we have also read some literature data that reason behind is that is number one the number of cases in uh, number of tests in india is increasing day by day so because of that the cases are getting being confirmed like getting being known and second many researchers and scientists said scientists said that yeah uh, that 80 percent of cases are asymptomatic or have very mild covid 19 effects so uh, and rest of the 20 is very uh, severe so because of that 80 percent maybe the person having the asymptomatic um uh, asymptomatic symptoms uh, have no symptoms of covid 19 so because of that he or she is not able to understand this thing and like this only he or she is spreading the disease to other peoples and like this chain is increasing and um, cases also increasing in india now uh, india has been sent uh, had be, has been now in more than la more than a uh, fact lag cases and yeah cases are increasing but on other terms like in mortality rate or in recovery rate india is doing good so i will now be going to analysis part and this is our i would say post analysis part where we have put all the countries in the same graph and we are just analyzing the things how the countries are doing um like what the data is showing to us so yeah we also inserted here um a ranger slider and uh, in this ranger slider what it help us like you can see some specific area in your uh, graph uh, like by scrolling this uh, ranger slider like if you want to see um, like uh, cases number of cases of each country between 8 may to um, 8 june you just scroll your ranger slider a particular month and you will get a deep view of the number of cases uh, in that so yeah it helps to do in better analysis so now i will head it towards our results uh, this is our dashboard we made till now uh, i don't know you have getting the clear image or not i will give uh, i will zoom it a little bit more just a second so here 
you can see our data uh, da dashboard so here this is our dashboard we have built uh, so here you can see the all the uh, countries are there and e this bars this colorful bars having some number on a particular days what are these is these are basically when we uh, when you move your cursor between these dates you will get um like for 26 there is an example on 26 june on may i have just moved my cursor on this on this date you will get the corresponding exact number of cases of uh, each country so yeah like this it makes little bit it dynamic like it is not statistic like static things so yeah we just you can move on um your cursor on every day in of your wish you can just move on and you will get uh, the exact number of cases of that date of the particular month and we also provided a um, drop down list also uh, if you want to compare between two countries or three countries or all the eight country together you can just compare together so yeah this is our dashboard we have made till now and now we will go ahead towards our future work so this is just a second so i will just again zoom it up so this is our future work uh, we are just showing some glimpse of our experiment we're still doing uh, this experiment so just sharing an idea with you guys um so here we are trying to predict the number of the cases in future of a, each countries like here you can see this uh, prediction is made uh, made by a machine learning model and the red one red line and the second line the blue line is showing the actual data so like this we are trying to make some future prediction and yeah uh, we need to make our data more accurate for that doing uh, doing that machine learning stuff so we are just working on it right now so this is not but still we are just uh, experimenting and working on this and second i a uh, second thing in the second bar we are showing we are trying to find a doubling grade or uh, and a doubling time like in how many days uh, the cases are getting doubled in each country so yeah we are working on this also and third thing uh, we are working on the severity of the cases and um, like this still we are working on it and hopefully we will complete this work, other half work of dashboard and just input in our, uh, our dashboard uh, uh, and make a dashboard more informative so yeah hopefully we will complete this work very soon and now i will conclude my part so yeah by building this dashboard uh, we think it will help um, researcher and analyst in all field and especially i would mention the healthcare and government and the global business to understand this spread um, and uh, to understand the spread how is going on each country and uh, and so that they can build up a strong plan to fight with this pandemic in future so yeah uh, now i will end up my talk thank you very much thank you sachi for your wonderful presentation so i'd like to ask a few questions yes sir so there are other dashboards right uh, worldometer is one of the widely used dashboard so what is so specific or unique about this platform okay sir am i audible sir hello yes yes you are clear okay 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 sir so sir as i mentioned before like in a future aim uh, as i had mentioned like we are uh, looking for a doubling rates and uh, also predicting the future cases and one thing we are introducing new and we think we we are doing new that we are uh, what i mentioned is severity of the cases how severe the case is mm -hmm. going in a country like for example we are trying to find like uh, okay in this country the cases are increasing but which cases are increasing like it, like it has been uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic or um, we are trying to find at what uh, are more affected from this disease in this particular country so i think this this is something we are just introducing we are working on it right now uh, we are trying to introduce in this dashboard and i think that's uh, that's will be something new uh, compared to other dashboards so yeah yeah that's nice. yeah, thank you for your answer uh, uh, what is the question which comes to my mind is like how do you get uh, asymptotic data because uh, when you report or when you get a symptom only people go and get admitted so how do you get those data and one more question is uh, is your dashboard dynamic like the data is updated daily yeah, uh, yeah, sir. The first question asymptomatic. Uh, right now, yeah, this is something very tough. Uh, 
uh, to work on. We we mm-hmm. are getting some data. We are trying to find some data because spreading the asymptomatic spreading is very tough uh, to track. So yeah, because some some uh, some cases the government are putting like this is an asymptomatic. We are just retrieving our data and we are working on it. So uh, this is uh, this is a third point in our future work. Like I mentioned, what we are saying before the two things like yeah. we are finding finding the doubling rate first and the second we are prediction and in third third point we will be giving this this severity and we are finding the uh, data first raw data first on this and uh, we are still uh, working on this and um, hopefully we'll get a uh, proper data and we we could able to accurate that data so yeah we are still yeah. working on sakshi this. sakshi yes, do sakshi. you have you do you have plans to uh, to do a predictive analysis of like a community spread or something like that uh right now we have didn't thought about that but yeah we definitely look for it ma'am thank you for the suggestions thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank, thank you sachi for your presentation thank you sir thank you ma'am we'll go to the presentation sessions oral now Sarvana Pirmal. Uh, yes, sir. You can share your s- slides. we can see your slide and yeah, we sir. can hear you also my voice so is sure. yes your voice is audible but uh, it's having little bit noise yeah you can start the slide show and make sure you complete within the time yes uh now my voice is clear sir yes Uh, uh good evening everyone uh, myself sarvana prumal govindan a research scholar in the department of biotechnology from periyar maniamma institute of science and technology tanjavur tamil nadu uh, so today uh, my seminar talk is about uh, strategy for effective antibiotic pharmacotherapy in the evolution of antibiotic resistance uh, uh, as on today the rising infection in the community Uh, due to uh, antibiotic resistance put more people at fatal risk which further leads to the spread of uh, new forms of infection which may left untreated uh, so it is very necessary to compact the uh, uh, com- uh, compact the infection of uh, rice through the antibiotic resistance through several scientific approach at the clinical or biological level so in this session i am going to pinpoint about the uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic approach as a strategy uh, for effective uh, antibiotic pharmacotherapy in the evolution of antibiotic resistance so the contents of my presentation are uh, uh, key facts and current threats about the antibiotic resistance and uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic approach to compact antibiotic resistant uh, summary and conclusion so what is about antibiotic resistance uh, as defined by the world health organization Uh, it is defined as the condition or state when the bacteria change in the response to the use of this medicine but however when you are looking look into the based on the clinical or biological point of view uh, it is defined as the condition or state when the bacteria change its uh, susceptibility nature against the intended antibiotics uh, so uh, in every mind there will be one billion questions what happen if such antibiotic uh, resistance keep on increasing Uh, the one of the most primary consequence is there will be a decline in the uh, beneficial bacteria in the environments here the environments refers to the food sources uh, water resources and human beings and the evolution of uh, duck resistant bacteria persists which further leads to the evolution of n number of untreated infections with fatal risk so in summarize uh, the consequence due to the uh, antibiotic resistance are complicated illness longer hospital stays a necessity of stronger and more expensive drugs sometimes infection uh, left untreated and further it accelerates the morbidity and mortality so next we are going to see about the uh, 
uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic approaches. Uh, before going to the uh, uh, before going to the slide of a uh, principle and methodology involved, uh, I like to have a glance about the necessity and basic definition and silent features for better understanding. Uh, so, in antibiotic pharmacotherapy, the target site exposure is not sufficient to predict the uh, susceptibility nature of the mechanism to the target site concentration. However, uh, uh, however, uh, the susceptibility nature of the microorganism to the target site concentration variable among the different microorganisms and stains and may change over the time in the event of, for example, in the condition of antibiotic resistant development. Uh, so, in the prediction of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic approach, uh, the one of the important parameters is uh, susceptibility breakpoints, otherwise it will called as a critical antibiotic concentration. Uh, these are the valuable parameters in assessing the degree of drug susceptibility and our resistance to an antibiotic pharmacotherapy. Uh, further, the susceptibility of a microorganism to an antibiotic is frequently described by its uh, minimum inhibitory concentration, and it is abbreviated as MAC. And it is an important in vitro parameter which quantifies the growth invasion to a static antibiotic concentration. The further, the breakpoints refers to the antibiotic concentration or exposures that separate the bacterial strains where there, there is a high likelihood of treatment success from those bacteria where the treatment is more likely to fail. Hello. Yeah, yeah, sir, I am able to see that. So I'm stuck up in the slide. That's why I got delayed. Uh, the next slide we are going to see about the definitions. Uh, uh, the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic index is abbreviated as PK-PD index. Uh, it is defined as the quantitative relationship between a measure of drug exposure and the microbiological parameter. Uh, the next one is uh, the minimal inhibitory concentration. Uh, it is the lowest concentration of an antibiotic agent that prevents the visible growth of a microorganism in an in vitro susceptibility testing system. So one of the uh, third important parameter is epidemiologic cutoff value. It is it is nothing but the MIC value that separates the microbial population into those with and without acquired or mutational resistance mechanisms based on the phenotypes. So what is the significance of this uh, approach? It is a powerful tool in optimizing the existing treatment and in the development of efficient new drug candidates through minimizing the failures associated with inappropriate use of antibiotic therapies. And the second uh, significance is, it is a vital in ensuring an antibiotic will be present at sufficient concentration and microbiologically active at a given site of infection, which further facilitating the translation of microbiological activity into clinical situations and ensuring that antibiotics achieve a successful outcome therapy. So overall list, uh, it is showing the increased application of methodology in the drug development and applied pharmacotherapy has been strongly recommended and promoted by these several regulatory agencies with specific emphasis from the USFDA and EMA. Uh, so here, the graphical representation uh, which give you an insight about the PK-PKD index at steady state during the multiple dosing of the antibiotic. Here, the three important parameters are necessarily considered to arrive the uh, PK and PKD approaches. And uh, first up, imp important parameter is minimum inhibitory concentration, uh, the red line. It is abbreviated as MAC. And the second parameter is Cmax. Uh, it is nothing but the uh, peak or higher concentration of drug uh, seen in the uh, uh, site of action. And third parameter is AUC. It is explained as the area under the curve, uh, which represents the total number of the drug exposed uh, absorbed into the body after the drug administration. The principle, uh, uh, depend upon the prominent mechanism of action of antibiotics, uh, uh, the, uh, there are three PKPD indices used for the in vitro, in vivo characterization. Uh, the first parameter is uh, percentage of uh, time greater than MIC. It is defined as the time of exposure of microorganism to plasma concentration exceeding their MIC. Uh, the second parameter is uh, Cmax by uh, MAC. It is defined as the ratio of peak plasma concentration to the minimum inhibitory concentration. And third parameter is uh, area under the curve, AUC by MAC. It is defined as the ratio of area under the plasma concentration curve 
to MAC. So here the, there are the two graphical representation uh, which uh, clarifies about the uh, uh, mechanism of antibiotics and what are the important pharmacodynamic and uh, approaches indices can be interpolated uh, from the graph. So when you look on the first graph, the time dependent antibiotics, uh, where the minimum inhibitory concentration is represented by a dotted line, uh, there is a window represented by a solid line. So within the solid line, when the drug concentration is maintained, so it's showing the appropriate minimum inhibitory concentration. Uh, so when the uh, when the peak gets declined, uh, the minimum inhibitory concentrations comes below the level. So there will be a minimal or moderate effect of the drug. Uh, then the second graph represents the concentration uh, dependent antibiotics. Uh, so where uh, the graph shows that uh, the maximum peak concentration and the total amount of drug absorbed into the body uh, depend upon the uh, post antibiotic effect. So when this graph uh, uh, prolong prolonged towards a certain time point, then the uh, effect of the antibiotic uh, will be prolonged. And uh, the identification of optimal PK-PKD index is usually determined using the dose escalation time kill studies as a single dose. And uh, second study is dose fractionation studies. Uh, in these studies, the uh, single dose is divided into a multiple dose. And uh, in among these two type of studies, the dose fractionation studies are more widely used to arrive the PK-PKD index. Mathematically, the PK-PKD index determination is performed using the Emax model to ex examine the relationship of uh, PK-PKD index. And further, it is statistically uh, uh, assessed, assessed using the variation of uh, coefficient of variation. Um. So the methodology. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Perumal sir. Yeah. yeah. Sorry for interruption. Please conclude fast your topic. Yeah. Yeah. The summary conclusion. Uh, uh, to compact the evolution of and reoccurrence of antibiotic resistance on the scientific sound of knowledge background, a greater understanding of the role of PK and PKD parameters allows for a greater efficacy in the use of current antibiotics. Uh, further reduction in the amount of overall antibiotic use and the reduction in the greater use of narrow spectrum agents and ensuring the compliance with the therapy may also reduce the development of resistance. Further to conclude, developing safe and effective doses regimen is a significant challenge in the antibiotic development, which can be achieved by the integration of PK and PKD information in the preclinical experimental models. Hence, the accurate and predictive animal infective PK-PKD models are an extremely powerful tool which can streamline the drug development process and optimize the therapeutic dose to harvest the evaluation and reoccurrence of uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, further, by addressed by the, in the morning session by Greenath G. Pillai, uh, the, the PK and PKD approach found to be an evolving approach. It is having the widest application in the, all the field uh, uh, innovation especially in the field of immunology in the viral therapy. Uh, thanking you for your patience. Thank you, Sir Anuparamal, for your presentation. Yes, sir. So one quick question to you. So how can we, uh, uh, bacteria normally naturally evolve towards antibiotic stress, right? Yes, sir. So what is your suggestion for that, to use less antibiotics or to develop so new it, antibiotics? It's not like less as well. It will be optimized, optimal use of antibiotics. Okay. Uh, that's my answer. Sir. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll move to the next presentation by Radhika. My audible, sir? Yes. You can share your slide. Yes. Mike, why did you Hello, Radhika. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can share your screen. Just, just a second. Is my screen visible, sir? Yeah, it is starting to share. Yes, uh, yes, 
screen is visible. So make sure you uh, limit your presentation to the scheduled time as well as uh, if possible, skip the introduction part, which is repeated in the conference. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes, like one to two minutes. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Radhika Nadi. This is for the department. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, can you minimize the other windows uh, which are on the screen, which is blocking your slides, actually? You can just push them uh, towards the right side or towards the end. Sorry, sir, I cannot do that. I cannot push it. My uh, okay, no issues. You can start. Oh, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, some of the drugs that are being investigated for the treatment of COVID. Uh, I'll talk a bit about basics and then I'll go to the details. Uh, so, COVID-19 pandemic is caused by SARS-CoV-2, as uh, we all know. It is a novel coronavirus which was first reported in the Wuhan city of China. It has a zoonotic origin and the primary target of the virus is human respiratory system. Uh, so, previously also, uh, coronaviruses caused uh, epidemics. One was by SARS-CoV in China in 2002 and uh, one was MERS-CoV in the Middle East uh, in 2012. Uh, these two viruses are also believed to be of uh, zoonotic origin. SARS-CoV-2 shows 80% uh, genetic similarity with SARS-CoV and 50% uh, with mers uh, So the symptoms include fever, dry cough, dyspnea, bilateral ground glass of the on chest, CT scans, gastro distance symptoms like malaria, and uh, rhinorrhea, sneezing, sore throat. And these symptoms can appear after approximately, uh, on an average, uh, after 5.2 days of incubation. Uh, so, as we all know, the structure of coronavirus is a spherical shape with a diameter of around 25 nanometers. It's an enveloped virus containing a non segmented positive since RNA genome vertically. The nuclear capsid is of helical symmetry and there are four main structural proteins spike uh, protein, membrane protein, and other protein. Uh, so, the spike protein recognizes ACE2 receptor and the host cell and uh, gains entry into the cytoplasm. Their uh, RNA genome has uh, hello, Radhika. Your voice is quite feeble. Uh, can you be a bit louder? Uh, okay, ma'am, sure. Yeah, thank you. Their uh, RNA genome acts as mRNA and uh, makes structural and non structural proteins and uh, replicates its genome using host machinery. Uh, so, uh, coming to therapeutics. As it is a novel coronavirus, there is no specific antiviral drug uh, for now. Uh, the better option is uh, repurposing of existing broad spectrum antiviral drugs. Uh, so, recently, uh, some of the drugs have gained popularity, like remdesivir, fabipiravir, and uh, dexamethasone, uh, because of the results they have shown in the initial investigations. Uh, so, remdesivir is uh, given intravenously, and it is a prodrug of uh, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, upon administration, it gets converted into its active form. So it competes with uh, ATP for incorporation into growing RNA gene and interferes with RNA polymerase function. Uh, Augustine et al. 2018 showed that uh, remdesivir and its active form dose dependently inhibited MHP, SARS CoV, and MERS CoV. Uh, remdesivir was found to be more potent. Uh, viruses lacking exonuclease proofreading activity were found to be more susceptible to remdesivir. And uh, mutations at uh, two places in uh, RNA polymerase uh, showed six-fold resistance to the drug. But these mutations uh, uh, also showed that the pathogenic ability of the virus was decreased. Uh, Gilead Sciences, which is a US-based company, uh, is conducting few uh, clinical trials. One was an open-label program where they analyzed 53 COVID-19 patients. It was a 10 days course. The dosage was 200 mg for the first day and 100 mg for the rest of the nine days. Out of 53, 34 patients required uh, invasive ventilation at baseline. Uh, out of 34 patients, 68 patients showed improvement with 18% mortality. Seven patients required non invasive oxygen support at baseline. Out of those, 71 patients showed improvement with 5% mortality. Uh, 12 patients required uh, low oxygen flow or they were fine with ambient air. So, 100% 100 100 patients showed improvement with 0% mortality. 
Uh, so as you can see, uh, patients who required non-invasive oxygen support uh, were, were affected, were improved uh, a lot when compared to uh, patients who required uh, invasive oxygen support. Uh, so, 60% showed uh, uh, adverse events in follow-up, mostly in patients with invasive ventilation. The most common adverse events were increased hepatic enzymes, diarrhea, rash, reading impairment, and hypertension. 23% had serious adverse uh, events like multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, septic shock, acute kidney injury, and hypertension in patients with invasive ventilation. Uh, patients with uh, non-invasive oxygen support showed more clinical improvement. And further, they are conducting uh, randomized placebo controlled trials that will uh, help us to determine the efficacy of this drug. And the next drug is Favipiravir. It is also a prodrug and a purine analog. The mechanism of Remdesivir and Favipiravir are uh, comparable. Uh, it was used against uh, influenza virus. It's, uh, it's used against influenza virus. Uh, in between, it was tested for Ebola virus, and now it is being uh, uh, investigated for COVID. Uh, so in China, uh, they conducted a prospective randomized controlled uh, open-label multi-center trial uh, where they had two groups, Favipiravir group and Arbidol group. Uh, as you can see, the recovery rate at day 7 was better for Favipiravir group. You can compare. The improvement was uh, there, but it was not significant as it was reported. But uh, Favipiravir led to shorter latencies to relief for both the pyrexia and cuff. Uh, the most uh, frequent adverse event uh, observed was increase in serum uric acid levels. Then there's a uh, Russian direct investment fund and Kembra clinical trial uh, where they compared Favipiravir with standard therapy group. Uh, it was uh, observed that body temperature of 68% patients returned normal on third day in uh, Favipiravir group, where in standard therapy it returned normal on sixth day. Complete uh, <coughs> Complete elimination of virus took four days in Favipiravir group. And in uh, uh, standard therapy group, it took uh, nine days. So there's improvement uh, in Favipiravir group. And they conducted a final stage of the clinical trial, and the drug was reported to be safe with no new adverse events. Uh, the drug was cut down, has cut down the duration of illness from nine days uh, with standard therapy to four days with Favipiravir uh, and uh, standard. Then there's uh, Glenmark Pharmaceuticals in India uh, that is conducting uh, clinical trials with a brand name Fabiflu. Uh, they are using a dosage of 3600 uh, 3, mg uh, on the first day and uh, 1600 mg uh, from second day onwards. Uh, patients were reported to have recovered in one or two weeks. Uh, the next drug is dexamethasone. It is a glucocorticoid agonist, which is used for its anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive properties. It uh, inhibits leukocyte infiltration at the site of inflammation and interferes with the function of mediators of inflammatory response. Uh, it suppresses humoral immune responses and reduces edema or scar tissue. There's a, a clinical trial in, in UK called Recovery. Uh, which is a phase 2 3 randomized controlled clinical trial. It showed dexamethasone as a life saving drug. Uh, the course was for uh, 10 days. Uh, they showed that the mortality was reduced by about one third uh, for the patients on ventilator, and the mortality was uh, reduced uh, by one third for the patients requiring only oxygen. Uh, dexamethasone works on uh, critically ill patients and not uh, for patients with minor disease. Uh, so the conclusion is uh, this disease is uh, rapidly spreading and it is very novel. We don't have drugs right now. So uh, we cannot even wait for the clinical trials to be completed. Uh, so we have to use this, uh, consider these drugs as the uh, results are very promising. Uh, but more randomized and controlled clinical trials are required in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Radhika. Uh, yes, so, sir. what is your suggestion for India? Uh, which truck we can proceed or we should try with? Uh, as the yes, ethnicity uh, differs uh, between countries. Yes. Uh, right now, uh, there are few drugs that we are using. These are also uh, used. 
Uh, mm -hmm. There's hydrochloroquine also that we are using, but uh, the clinical trials outside India for hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, is stopped. But uh, we are using, and also these drugs, Remdesivir uh, in India is being manufactured by Sipra and Hydro now, and uh, also uh, Fabiflu. It is also uh, being uh, produced in uh, India. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, Radhika. We'll move to the next speaker, Estella. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. We can see your screen too. Perfect. Good evening, I'm Estella Cabeza. I'm going to talk to you about building a database for COVID-19. I'm a research technician at the Department of Bioengineering and Aerospace Engineering in University of Carlos III de Madrid in Spain. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit the department, which parts we are treating and which kind of projects we are working with. Also, I'm going to explain to you where we got our data a little bit of what we want to do and the methodologies and softwares we're using to develop our tools. So we are a, speci a specific group named Biomedical Imaging and Instrumentation Group. The head of the group are three professors from the university. And we have several research lines. One of them is medical image processing, and it's the part that I'm going to be focusing in this talk. We also have a project about tuberculosis. This tuberculosis project has led us to use a kind of software, which I'm going also to talk about. We also work on image-guided surgery and radiation therapy. You can find in the bottom of the slide the website of the university group. So uh, we got a lot of data from HM Hospitales, which is a group from Spain, which gathers information along different states of Spain. And it has published data from anonymized electronic medical records that collect different interactions in COVID-19 between treatment processes, detailed information on diagnosis, treatments, admissions, and of course, laboratory results. It is built up with two, uh, more than 2,000 patients classified with COVID positive or pending, but it also contains a lot of images um, with relevant medical and clinical data, meaning that we have like a complete data set and reliable X-ray behavior of SARS-CoV-2. We are also collaborating with Delft Imaging. Delft Imaging is specialized in tuberculosis screening and dedicated to improve people's quality of life by means of its diagnostic, imaging services, e-health software, and related services. They have granted us access to their software of CAT for COVID, which stands for Computer Aided Detection for COVID. If you would like to have more information about them, I have also made a reference of them at the bottom of the slide. So what do we want to do with all this information we have gathered? We want to build an interactive and user-friendly database because, of course, besides the images, we have a lot of Excel files and CVS files containing information. We also want to take advantage of our second outbreak to know what's going to be happening in the future and hoping to expect it. And, of course, provide, provide aid to health centers without radiologists, because as mentioned, this um, data set we have access to has real, a lot of X-ray that are reliable, and not all of the health centers have specialists 
that will look through it. Also, to get a full understanding, I guess the same as all the projects that I have heard until now, on the disease and its future effect, and finally, but not least, apply artificial intelligence to reduce the workload. In this point, I mean as uh, image classification on positive for COVID or negative, and to see the area that appears in the X-ray that it's affected by this disease. So, how are we going? How are we doing it? For the data analysis, we are using R Studio. It's really handy, actually, because you can really see a load of um, data at the same time and it doesn't stop the program or anything. Uh, with that, we have provided a kind of um, data clinic as missing, getting rid of missing values and discharging unnecessary information. From that, we have chosen like five patients that are in our standards or that are um, accepted as the features we're looking at. And from that, we have taken their images, their X-rays, and processed it with the CAT for COVID software. For this image processing, we can obtain the percentage of affected log area from the pulmonary area. And in a future, we want to keep on working with patient classification as mentioned. So I have posted here a little demo on how the app with RStudio works. Oh, I'm sorry, I think it's tickling a bit, but can you see it clearly or is it also moving a bit? Yes, we can see the columns. Okay, so in here you can find the anonymized patient, the modality of the image, also the area, where the image is taken and the study date and also like a lot of information from the DICOM image. As mentioned, many patients to go through. And this next part is where we want to pay more attention because um, we find the ID of the patient, the study instance, and in here we find how many studies are being done to this specific patient, how many different studies. For example, for patient one, we see that there's only one study. For patient seven, we have several ones, and we keep on going. So uh, when we have seen how the anonymized patient data we have and which kind of data, we are taking these images and passing it through the software of um, Sirona Cat for COVID. They have developed three software products focusing on the analysis of thoracic CT scans, chest X-rays, and retinal images. So the software, what it does is it segmentates the pulmonary lobes and it provides a detection. It gives out the severity score, so the severity of the infection, the severity score per lobe and the percentage affected per each lobe as well. This software comes from the CAT4 tuberculosis and it also relates with the imaging company as mentioned before and you have down here the website if you want to refer for more information. Here is a little demo of what the software provides as output and the segmentation. This is beneficial because it gives us more statistical values and provides us a different approach, which is not only demographic, but also like image related information. And 
um, we want to provide also a little of a comparison between different software that provide this kind of segmentation values, as of course, uh, building a convolutional neural network for a COVID classification from these kind of images and segmentations. This was a brief um, explanation of what we are working at the moment. It's not finished, we are working on it. And I don't know if I went too fast, if you have any question or any further explanation. Thank you for the wonderful presentation as well as the demonstration of tools uh, which you are uh, developing. Thank you. And I would like to ask one question, like uh, you have collected electronic milk, medical health care records, right? So yes. it is mostly of unstructured data. So how did you clean it or what are the processes you went to make it uh, feasible for you to build a tool over it? Uh, well, I have treated it with our studio, just like mm -hmm. looking for, for example, deleting missing data or values that are misleading information. For example, if you are looking for a future as a date, but you find mm -hmm. that there are, um, I don't know, laboratory results over there, this is misleading yeah. data that you want to get rid of. So what is the future perspective uh, for the work you want to continue? Like you want to build any models over the data? Mostly on image processing, mm. because yeah. it's what okay. the group is focusing on. But of course, as mm -hmm. I mentioned, you cannot just take the first image you get and build something over it. You need to make sure that it makes a kind of sense, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you can get more results out of it. So, uh, what do you think would be the uh, required sample size to construct an effective model with good accuracy with image with classification? Images or data? Yeah, images, images. Well, as more images you have, you will always get better models yeah. because you can train it and get a validation set. Uh, but what is the requirement, a uh, basic requirement? Uh, who have that uh, have a decent accuracy like any number uh, you can like 10000 images i wouldn't give an exact number of okay images. yeah yeah i think yeah, it's we kind understand. Of risky to just go for one <laughs> number <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true but it's really interesting you know uh, the mo that you are uh, that that you've collected from a very unstructured data into uh, making a tool. You are trying to make meaning out of uh, data which is not very like which is not shared and which is very confidential actually. Yeah, well, um, actually, I think and personally, mm -hmm. it's a personal opinion that electronic health records are mm -hmm. kind of unstructured usually. Yeah. Yes. So that there's not Thank a you. standard module that you will fill up mm -hmm. with all these data. Mm -hmm. Or would it be like, would these tools be used in the future in, in different hospitals? You know, you do you, once you make it into a big working model. Well, mm, I wouldn't say yes to that because it is still like really raw and we are not mm -hmm. like officially, officially a project with that so we are still seeing what it could be this is yeah, very customized to your own uh hospital yeah, yeah the place where you work excuse me this is very this is customized to your to your own hospital or the place where you work exactly this is uh, like university work from the department mm -hmm. yeah. oh i see Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Thank presentation. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now we'll move to the next speaker. Dr. Lisina. Yes, sir. Shall I share my screen, sir? Yes, you can share now. My screen is visible, sir. Yes, your screen is visible. Uh, 
okay yeah, so good evening everyone i am lisina and today i am here to present a topic on covid 19 and title of my presentation is in silico screening of dexamethasone against orf 3a protein of covid 19 a drug repurposing study against co coronavirus so coronavirus disease 2019 is an infectious disease caused by severe acute respiratory corona virus 2 syndrome it was first identified in wuhan china in december 2019 resulting in a continuing pandemic neither any unique corona virus drug treatment is available people with covid-19 should be provided with supportive care to help relieve symptoms there is currently no vaccine available to treat uh, one such disease next coming to introduction uh, drug discovery is still a field of research and development that discovers drugs with very little cost and time the concept of drug repurposing is the identification of therapeutically potent molecules from the library of previously existing molecules dexamethasone is a type of corticosteroid medication that is a steroid hormone produced in the adrenal cortex it is used in the treatment of many conditions including rheumatic problems a number of skin infections severe allergic reaction etc in this study dexamethasone which is already being used to treat many diseases is investigated through a docking study the docking study was carried out using autodoc software coronavirus disease 2019 was confirmed in 125048 people worldwide as of march 12 2020 with a mortality rate of approximately 3.7% compared to the mortality rate of less than 1% due to influenza there is an urgent need to develop powerful anti covid 19 agents to avoid and stop viral infections repurposing recognized small molecules seem to be very effective way to produce potent drugs to combat coronavirus in this short period of time among other key proteins the function of accessory protein in the replication and regulation of coronavirus infectivity in host is of enormous importance the key accessory protein in the genome of sars cov2 is orf 3a which modulates the host response to the virus infection and thus plays a vital role in pathogenesis in this study we have applied computer aided drug designing approach for docking dexamethasone an approved drug for other diseases with orf 3a protein of covid-19 molecular docking studies as well as admt profile that is absorption distribution metabolism excretion profile analysis were performed to identify novel and potential covid-19 inhibitors metils methods uh, studies were performed using um, autodoc tools from the tot, uh, protein database that is from rcsb i have collected the 3d dimension three dimensional structure of sars cov2 or of 3a having pdb id 6 xdc and the protein and ligand structure had to be prepared before beginning to dock ligand receptor docking performed by using autodoc and the gls method that is lamarckian genetic algorithm was used to perform the molecular docking the number of docking runs was set to 10 after docking all the structures generated were assigned to clusters based on the tolerance of one angstrom and the hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interaction between dock potent agents and a macromolecules were analyzed using autodoc tools the best docking result can be considered to be the confirmation with the lowest energy and lowest rmst lowest rmst is always the better and the online server pre admt was used to measure the pharmacokinetic and toxicological property, properties pre admt is having uh, three parts like drug likeness prediction adme prediction and toxicity prediction uh, coming to results and discussion so docking and molecular interaction studies of covid-19 with dexamethasone in this study dexamethasone is taken as ligand here you can see the 2d chemical diagram of ligand dexamethasone got docked on the 3d model of orf 3a protein of covid-19 with a negative docking energy as shown in this table here you can see the ligand dexamethasone and is having binding energy minus 4.97 kilocalories per mole and is having interacting sites like lysine 75 asparagine 144 and aspartic acid 140 having bond length 2.1 2.1 1.8 2.4 respectively and uh, here you can see four hydrogen bonds formed between receptor and ligand 
the Ripinski rule states that the most drug-like molecules have log p less than or equal to 5. That is octanol water partition coefficient. And the molecular weight less than or equal to 500. The number of hydrogen bond acceptors less, less than or equal to 10. And the number of hydrogen bond donors less than or equal to 5. The drug likeness and bioavailability of the ligands are inspected using PDADMAT. The ligand molecules have been found to satisfy the role of phi, indicating that this molecule can be used as potent inhibitor. So, in this table, we can see the predicted property and its value. Role of phi is suitable. And uh, blood brain barrier permeability having the value 0 0.13, and plasma protein uh, binding, that is, the ability of chemical compound to attach proteins in blood, having value 71.75, SK log D, that is, distribution coefficient, having the value 1.89, and SK log P, that is, lipophilicity, having the value 1.89. According to the uh, ADMAT predictions, compound dexamethasone penetrates into the brain, has good human intestinal absorption and reasonable binding to plasma proteins. The partition and distribution coefficient speaks uh, for a good bioavailability. The compound also fulfills Lipinski rule of 5, which favors uh, it as a drug candidate. So, I can conclude that in this analysis, we found that the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus protein ORF3A interacts with the dexamethasone. The results of docking indicate that dexamethasone got docked to the 3D model of COVID-19 ORF3A protein with a negative dock energy value and minimum inhibitory concentration. That is the concentration needed to inhibit the growth of virus uh, and also satisfy ADME parameters. The molecular interaction studies have also shown that COVID-19 ORF3A protein has more than one active site residue for dexamethasone. Given the increasing threat posed by COVID-19 and with no validated antiviral agent available for immediate relief, the current in silico research offers structural insights into COVID-19 ORF3A protein and also its molecular interaction with existing approved drugs such as dexamethasone. Dexamethasone may be co-crystallized with the ORF3A protein and the in vitro binding mode and energy with the protein could be studied. So that's it. With this, I am ending, my, uh, ending up with my presentation. Thank you everyone. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you Dr. Lisina for your presentation. Thank so you, the sir. dextamethasone is used for, uh, currently is used for treatment in any of the other uh, Yeah, diseases. it is used to, for yeah, it is used for other diseases like rheumatic arthritis and some other inflammation, etc. So, it is specific to any target uh, in human or because uh, we can dock any ligand with any protein and get a score. So, how yes, do you yes. Do this? We can take any other ligand also. Okay. With... No, no. I meant to say like uh, you have chosen particularly this ligand. So, any specific reason for that? No specific. It is used for critical patients. We can use this okay. drug. Uh, okay. okay. Pranav, actually, uh, WHO recognized that uh, in UK at the moment they have mm -hmm. also treated dexamethasone to patients and they have seen good results. Okay. At the moment, so uh, mm -hmm. I think it is proving to have some effect. Okay. Because uh, uh, from docking, we get a uh, much uh, higher binding affinity with other compounds compared to this one it is around minus four so that's why i was asking a question like uh, how comparatively it can be stable so you can further study the stability yes uh, sir i can further study yeah molecular dynamic study i can perform mm -hmm. yes sir so as you mentioned the experimental focus like yes yes, yes yes in vitro study also i can perform So, is there any known side effects to this this drug? No, it's ADME studies uh, prove that it's no no having any side effects. Okay. It's not having any. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lisina, for the wonderful yeah. presentation. Of Thank you. Treatment. Thank you. Yeah. So, do we have the next speaker? Only? I mean, he's going to be the last speaker, I guess. Oh, we have... Uh, I think he hasn't joined. Probably we can inform the team to join tomorrow. Uh, 
பிரணவ் ஹலோ sorry can you hear me yeah yeah yes yes i think uh, the speaker's phone is switched off and uh, he's not available i guess in the webex as well okay so we would inform the team to alert him to join tomorrow yes sure so i think uh, this is the end of day 2 and i thank all the participants and speakers who have stayed till now and who have given a wonderful presentation and i request dr divyashree to conclude the session uh everyone and thank you for participating today and it was a great experience for us as well to listen to uh, so many talks and uh, and you may see in the chat box that i have given the login details for tomorrow you know some some of you may not have but please uh you may use the webex login details that is mentioned here for tomorrow and those who wish to join the youtube you may also use the youtube live link that has also been pasted here in the chat box so uh, we we are looking forward to uh, seeing more people tomorrow and we are going to have more exciting talks uh, in the morning we are going to have like nearly 6 uh, 6 uh, to 7 presentations uh in the morning and we are going to have more poster sessions in the afternoon uh and we will be closing the session tomorrow by uh 4 o'clock and we're going to have the valedictory session at that time and simultaneously we will also release the feedback form link uh to receive all the responses uh so Uh, i think we've also submitted the feedback form link or we've pasted the feedback form link in the chat box kindly uh, copy it and you can send your feedbacks tomorrow from 4 pm onwards so those who attended all the sessions we assume some sort of genuinity from you guys uh at all those sessions uh, since today usse baap hai va so so kindly uh, uh, kindly uh, fill in feedback forms tomorrow and uh, those who attended all the sessions would definitely receive the certificate of participation and presenters will receive a certificate of presentation and uh, yeah you you have surprises for tomorrow because we would be announcing uh, the the poster award and the oral presenter award so stay tuned for tomorrow thank you very much and uh, Uh, sir venkateshwar ulu sir hello hello madam divya madam do you want to say something you may also say a few words to close today's session yeah madam yes sir please say a few words to and we can wind up the session for today yeah yeah divya madam uh, today second day international e conference <clears throat> is successfully completed by the excellent and energetic cooperation uh, from divya madam and uh, pranavatan sir so we are uh, we are expressing we deeply express our uh, sincere thanks the divya madam and pranav sir so without your support Thank we may you, not sir. complete today's session so today is a very lengthy session so total of uh, six speakers and uh, 22 presentations from uh, participants have successfully completed i think all participants uh, are benefited so many our speakers have said their uh, views uh, on different aspects of research related to the covid so today's talk started with uh, girinath pillai sir and uh, roger sir Oliang and Dr. Raman Kumari, Madam, and Pandu Rangarao. So we express thanks to all speakers. Also, they have delivered a good content. So it uh, absolutely useful for all students and faculty and other some scientific community. Thank you. So for the tomorrow session is also follows as per time. So tomorrow also there are six six speakers. So please be on time. Uh, Diva Madam from LLB School will share the 
have feedback links please follow up the, thank you uh, hello all and tomorrow the sessions will start at 9 am so this is to note and you join the meeting at 9 or maybe 5 minutes before 9 that's perfectly fine so stay tuned and see you all tomorrow so now we'll close the session thank, thank you diva madam thank you diva madam uh, thank, thank you everyone sir. for joining us stay safe and don't forget to come tomorrow thank you pranav, pranav. thank you everyone Shall we end?